settlement. Having failed to convince our highest court that the Republic of Rwanda is currently safe for asylum seekers and refugees, the executive seeks to overturn the recent Supreme Court factual determination, ousting the jurisdiction of domestic courts to reconsider those facts in the light of further developments, including the Rwanda Treaty on which the government relies. My Lords, the government further purports to take powers to ignore interim orders of the European Court of Human Rights. Thus, it threatens both the domestic rule of law, especially the separation of powers, and the international rules-based order. I remind noble lords not just of the Supreme Court decision of the 15th of November last year, but subsequent reports of your Lordship's International Agreements Committee endorsed by an overwhelming vote in your Lordship's House, the Constitution Committee, including three former Conservative Ministers and a former Number 10 Chief of Staff, and now the Majority Report of the Joint Committee on Human Rights. My Lords, I will assume that some members of those committees will speak, so I will leave them fully to outline the clear results of their deliberations. Nonetheless, as your Lordships overwhelmingly decided to give this bill a second reading, <coughs> I have approached the task of amendment in the spirit of constitutional compromise, seeking to amend the bill in line with the government's desired policy of offshoring asylum decisions, whilst also seeking to comply with both the Supreme Court decision and the unequivocal advice of your Lordship's international agreements and constitution committees. This, my Lords, notwithstanding my own personal objection to transporting human beings for processing, which will no doubt be subject to further political and legal scrutiny in the months and years ahead. For present purposes, I take the government at its word, even if that word has been put rather belligerently both to the Supreme Court and to your Lordship's House. I will assume that the government does not want to put the executive of the United Kingdom on a collision course with our Supreme Court or our international legal obligations. So amendments in this group seek to offer a way through the stalemate for people of good will from all sides of your Lordship's house. Yeah. Amendments 1, 2, 5 and 34 in my name are supported by the most reverend primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the noble lady Baroness Hale of Richmond, and by the noble Viscount Hailsham. I have also signed the noble Viscount Hailsham's amendments three and seven. Lord German has amendments 11 and 12. Your Lordship's Constitution Committee warned of a number of concerning trends in the present government's approach to our constitution and our courts. It seeks, for example, to disapply the Human Rights Act for particular unpopular groups, rather than repeal it wholesale for everyone. However, my Lords, I observe another new fashion in adding a lengthy introduction <laughs> to a relatively <coughs> short bill that deems facts changed making its purposes so clear that the courts should be wary of interpreting the legislation as they might otherwise do. However, since the arrival of this bill in your Lordship's House, the Prime Minister has stated, by a press conference, but he has stated, 
that his Rwanda bill was designed to assuage the concerns of the Supreme Court. So, amendments one and two add a secondary but essential purpose to the primary purpose of preventing and deterring what the government sees as unlawful migration. This purpose is to ensure compliance with the domestic and international rule of law by providing that no one will be removed to Rwanda unless two conditions are met. The first condition is that there is advice from the UNHCR that Rwanda is now safe. For example, as a result of the successful implementation of promised reforms and safeguards to the asylum system there. The second condition, my Lords, is that this advice has been laid before both Houses of Parliament. Now, some may bulk at what they regard as a foreign body having any role whatsoever in the assessment of facts on the ground in Rwanda. However, as the Joint Committee on Human Rights noted, our Supreme Court's concerns about the lack of safety there were in no small part in the light of unequivocal expert evidence from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, with its special expertise and role under the Refugee Convention. If the Executive is now asking Parliament to become complicit in overturning findings of fact by our Supreme Court, this made explicit by the Noble Viscount Hailsham's Amendments 3 and 4, it should at the very least, my Lords, allow Parliament to hear advice from the expert body that the Supreme Court found so authoritative before allowing facts to be deemed as having changed. Accordingly, my Lords, Amendment 5 replaces the edict that Rwanda is safe with the belief that it may become so because it should be our unanimous aspiration that the whole world becomes a safer place for persecuted and displaced people. Further, my Lords, as even an independent expert body should never usurp the fact-finding jurisdiction of our courts, especially in dangerous and fast-changing times, Amendment 34 makes clear <laughs> that even clear and positive advice from the UNHCR would create only a rebuttable presumption that Rwanda is safe, in keeping with earlier legislation as observed by the Constitution Committee of Your Lordship's House. It would not hobble our courts with an absolute conclusion. Yet, my Lords, if the Government is really so confident that the Rwanda Treaty, unlike the Refugee Convention so long before it, will be implemented so as convincingly to render that country safe. The Government has nothing to fear from either these amendments or our courts. I beg to move. Yeah. 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 Amendment proposed. <laughs> In Clause 1, page 1, line 2, after the, insert the word, first. The question is that this amendment be agreed to. I must uh, begin by apologising for the fact that I was abroad uh, at the time of second reading uh, and was therefore uh, not in, in my place at that time. My Lords, much was made at second reading of the notion that the Bill in some way contravenes our constitutional principles, is an affront to the separation of powers, and infringes on the power of the judiciary. I think those allegations are thoroughly misconceived, but they are highly relevant to this amendment. The plain fact is that we are a parliamentary democracy. That means that parliament is sovereign. And the reason why so many of us cherish that overarching principle is that we attach high importance 
to something called accountability. <coughs> accountability, my lords, was not a word which featured very large in your lordship's debate on second reading. The courts are accountable to no one. They proudly proclaim that fact. Many of the bodies to which Parliament has in recent years outsourced some of its responsibilities have little, if any, accountability. But <clears throat> Parliament itself, or at least the other place, the House of Commons, in which I was privileged to serve for 27 years, is truly accountable. It is answerable to the British people at regular intervals and its members can be summarily dismissed. There are those who seem uncomfortable with our system. And it is indeed true that there has been something of a whittling away at it in recent years. The courts have extended their power and Parliament itself has contributed to it by the outsourcing to which I've referred. I often think it's a pity that those who praise these developments fail to come up with some suggested alternatives to parliamentary democracy, but there it is. These amendments, if passed, <clears throat> would mark a new jump in this process. I would like to ask those who support it to address the question of accountability. To whom is the United Nations Commissioner for High Refugees accountable? Perhaps they might say to the General Assembly of the United Nations, to whom is that body accountable? Neither the High Commissioner nor the General Assembly have any responsibility for securing our borders. They have no responsibility for the safety of those who make the perilous channel crossing. They have no duty to take into account the resentment felt by so many against the sheer unfairness of illegal immigration and the way in which it gives preference not to the most deserving, but merely to those who can afford to pay the people's workers. <laughs> Our elected government and this parliament do bear those responsibilities and the House of Commons is directly accountable to the electorate for the way in which those responsibilities are discharged. These amendments would prevent our government and parliament from discharging those responsibilities. They seek to outsource those responsibilities to an unelected body with no accountability. The acceptance of these amendments would constitute nothing less than an abdication of the responsibilities of government. Uh, I note, uh, without surprise, of course I give rise to that. I'm most grateful to the noble and learned lord. I, I don't understand the argument he's making. As I understand the amendment in the name of the noble and learned baroness Trivati, the responsibility laid on the UN High Commissioner for Refugees would be to advise the Secretary of State. I don't see how that makes him accountable. It would remain the Secretary of State, surely, who was accountable to this Parliament for the decisions he decided to take in the light of the advice he received. Well, I fear not. The uh, easiest uh, way of uh, replying to the noble lord <laughs> is to read from the member's explanatory statement of the amendment. This is what they say. The amendments require positive UNHCR advice on the safety of Rwanda to be laid before Parliament before claims for asylum in the UK may be processed in Rwanda. So if there is no positive advice from the UNHCR, those claims cannot be processed in Rwanda. I hope that aids the noble lord's understanding of what I'm saying. I'm grateful again to the noble lord. Uh, I was referring to the text of the amendment. Well, I think it's perfectly reasonable if one looks at the, one wants to know what the intention of the amendment is, to look at the uh, member's ex explanatory statement of that amendment. That is indeed the purpose of the explanatory statement. <coughs> uh, Lords, I note with interest, but not with surprise, that none of these amendments are signed 
by any member of the opposition front bench. I'm not surprised because no party which aspires to government could support the abdication of the responsibilities of government which these amendments would achieve. Uh, before I sit down, I just want to say one word about uh, Amendment 7, which is in the name of my noble friend, Viscount Hailsham, and, uh, and others. Amendment 7 asserts that the decision of the Supreme Court was a finding of fact. But the decision of the Supreme Court was not a finding of fact. It was a finding of opinion. The Supreme Court's opinion that the removal of asylum seekers to Rwanda would expose them to the risk of reform. It is an opinion on which men of good faith and true can disagree. Indeed, it is an opinion on which distinguished judges disagree. The divisional court, one of whose members, one of whose two members was a Lord Justice of Appeal, came to the conclusion that uh, what the government was proposing to do was entirely lawful. The Court of Appeal, by a majority, disagreed. But the then <coughs> Lord Chief Justice dissented. So, in my view, when the Supreme Court reaches a conclusion on a matter of opinion, it is entirely legitimate and entirely proper constitutionally for Parliament, democratically accountable to the, House, uh, to, to, to the people, as the House of Commons is, and the Supreme Court is not, entirely proper for Parliament to substitute its own opinion. That is what this bill does, and that is why I support it. My Lord, I, I rise to speak very briefly in support of Baroness Chakrabarti. Um, I, I just want to put on record for this House uh, that the Bar Council has a real concern about the apparent incompatibility between the <coughs> European Convention of, uh, for Human Rights and this bill. Uh, the Supreme Court, as we know, made a decision, in my view, on the basis of facts that Rwanda is not a safe country and they put an, a, a whole series of points to support that view. This bill has not in any way countered any of the points made by the Supreme Court in their judgment and the Bar Council is concerned about that. The Bar Council is also concerned that the government is uh, standing down the judges uh, from their role uh, as uh, overseeing the uh, work of the government in operating this bill. And the uh, Bar Council see this as, as a, a clear infringement uh, of the fundamental principles of the rule of law. Um, it, it seemed to me that uh, in disapplying, in this context, the Refugee Co Convention on Human... Isn't it right that uh, clause four of the bill provides exclusively that uh, members of the judiciary will have the opportunity to consider challenges brought of an individual nature in relation to particular claims? My Lords, that, that may be so, but I think the point I made stands, and I think perhaps I've said enough to point out that the Bar Council has very real concerns about this bill. Uh, it is... Please. My Lords, um, I, I will speak mainly to Amendments 11 and 12 in the name of my uh, noble friend, Lord German. Um, I can't stop myself saying that it really goes against the grain to do anything which suggests that Liberal Democrats regard the bill as requiring only some tweaking for it to be acceptable. But I'd like first to make a, a general comment about Clause 1. Um, for many years, governments, plural, have opposed amendments setting out the general purpose of a bill on the basis of a clause having no effect and being rather confusing. And I used to find that understandable, though I signed some such amendments. They've tended to be 
narratives describing hopes rather than expectations or anything firmer than that. Um, the noble Baroness um, Chakrabarti um, says, has commented on the changing fashion, um, them being there to make the courts wary of, um, of the direction in which they might like to go. But I think that this problem applies to Clause 1. And I would note that there is a notable omission uh, from the exposition of the government's policy, and that is tackling people smuggling, abhorrent in itself, not only because of the smuggler's role in bringing <coughs> asylum seekers to the uh, UK. Um, the Illegal Migration Act has a similar introductory clause, but specifically it says in uh, section, I should say, in section um, 1 3, accordingly and so far as it's possible to do so, provision made by or by virtue of this Act must be read and given effect so as to achieve the purpose mentioned in subsection <coughs> 1. So I believe it's important to be clear about the effect of clause 1, the legal effect, that is. If it is intended that the clause is to be relied on, then I think it needs to be sharpened up. For instance, terminology such as the system for processing claims is to be improved, an objective of the treaty, which is a pretty low bar. But my, my central point is that we need to be very clear about the legal effect and status of this clause, because there'll be little point in amending the clause at report unless the amendment has an effect, either as a standalone or by subsequent reference, such as the Act not coming into force unless a provision in Clause 1 is met. Um, this may seem a rather technical point, but looking ahead, I don't want to be tripped up on it. Amendment um, 12, and I'm aware it's an amendment to the clause whose effect I've been querying, is therefore a probing um, amendment, um, and it's an amendment to the definition of a safe country. It includes in um, 15B little 2 um, a determination um, of being treated in accordance with that country's, i.e. Rwanda's, obligations under international law. And the amendment would change that to being in accordance with the UK's obligations under international law. The treaty is predicated on uh, Rwanda um, being under the same obligations and as observant of them as is the UK. So that the transfer to Rwanda, as I understand it, means really only a change of venue. Dr. Google didn't really help me yesterday in finding what conventions Rwanda has signed up to and importantly ratified and um, observed. Um, but since the, um, we are proceeding on this on the basis that everything that we would do in this country would, will apply under the new regime. I'd be interested in the minister's um, comments. Amendment uh, 11 is related to this, Clause 15A, which also defines safe country for the purposes of the, of the, um, the bill. Um, it, um, it, it includes um, or refers to the UK's obligations that are relevant to the treatment in that country of persons who are removed there. Surely, my lords, it's all um, obligations relevant to treatment of persons removed there, um, not just in that country. So both um, amendments go to the issue of safety, and that is the bill's compatibility with the UK's human rights obligations, and it's the UK's ob uh, human rights obligations that are crucial as part of this whole uh, regime. Uh, it is a hard act to follow so many lawyers here, and I hope that my 
compassion and conviction uh, might help me where I'm missing uh, in legal expertise myself. My Lords, I support the amendments to Clause 1 in the name of the noble Baroness Lady Chakrabarti, which introduce an additional purpose of compliance with the rule of law and the role of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. I apologise I was unable to join the, uh, the Lord, your Lordships for second reading as I was overseas. I have read the Hansard record of the debate, during which many noble Lords raised what I see as the fundamental issue at stake with this bill and the Rwanda scheme more broadly, how it is squared with the rule of law, with the international agreements and obligations which are the bedrock and defence of our freedom and prosperity. My Lords, I come to this with a conviction that our best chance of solving the global challenges we face, illegal migration among them, is not through unilateral action, but through international cooperation and by standing up to the rule of law. Other noble lords have explained how these amendments would help ensure that refugees really are safe and that the importance of this as a matter of humanity as well as of law. I su suggest that recognising the role of UN for UNHCR is also important from an international perspective and as a route towards a lasting solution the government seek. It is right to want to reduce people smuggling. But if this bill is to have a positive impact, it will only be as a part of a wider approach. The preamble of the 1951 Refugee Conve Convention is surely correct when it states that a satisfactory solution to the problem of supporting refugees in a fair and humane manner without placing an undue burden on any state cannot be achieved without international cooperation and notes that the effective coordination of measures taken to deal with this problem will depend upon the cooperation of states with the High Commissioner. As I have argued in your Lordship House before, a lack of respect for international law and the weakness of international institutions lies behind the larger number of people forcibly displaced around the world. While not the only cause, wars of aggression indiscriminate or deliberate targeting of civilians, war crimes and crimes against humanity drive displacement. We will not reduce the number of displaced persons globally while wars and atrocities continue unchecked and while international law is applied unevenly. At a time when we and the wider West are struggling to maintain any credibility when it comes to the rule of law and international cooperation, Recognising in law a place for UNHCR is determining the safety of the Rwanda scheme would be a small step towards demonstrating our ongoing commitment to international institutions and agreements which are critical to global security. My Lords, it has become a bit of a trope to say that the Refugee Convention and UNHCR itself are outdated and unable to rise to the magnitude of the task at hand. In supporting a role for UNHCR in this legislation, I would challenge that view. It is worth put putting the scale of the refugee situation in some context. As a recent book, How Migration Really Works, by Professor Hein de Haas, one of the world's leading experts on migration, sets out very clearly current refugee numbers are not, in fact, exceptional or unprecedented. There are 30 million refugees globally, but this is 0.3% of the global population, only marginally above the proportion of refugees in 1992. The vast majority of displaced either stay in their country of origin or their immediate region. It is a small minority who come to Europe and to the United Kingdom. This is a challenge that we should be able to rise to. The refugee crisis is one of the protection and political will, not only sheer numbers. My Lords, this bill is all about signalling. The government hoped to signal that they are tough on illegal <coughs> migration and to deter small boat crossings. But we are at risk of signalling that we are uninterested in the rule of law and in our international agreements and cooperation. That would be a very serious mistake, whether for our ability to cooperate over refugees or on our other global issues and international rules-based order. Right.
My Lords, I rise to support Amendment 1, tabled by Noble Baroness Chakrabarti, Baroness Hale of Richmond and the Most Reverend Primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Amendments 2, 5 and 34, tabled by the same, <coughs> to which is also added the name of the Viscount Hailsham. I also wish to offer supportive comments on Amendment 7 to Clause 1 in the Bill, tabled by the Noble Lord Viscount Hailsham, the Noble Baroness Baroness Chakrabarti, and the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Manchester. The Lord Archbishop of Canterbury is present, but is unable to attend the entirety of this debate. The Lord Bishop of Manchester is unable to be with us this afternoon. My Lords, it will be a very slight augmentation to the wisdom of this House to know that we on this, these benches do not favour the outsourcing of asylum claims to other countries or territories. This is rather different to what the Noble Lord, Lord Howard, was saying about the outsourcing of power. We do recognise, however, that the courts have deemed this lawful in certain circumstances and that we have a bill from the other place that is designed to deal with a particular designation which the Supreme Court deemed to fall outside our own obligations under the law. I accept, my Lords, that the recent treaty between His Majesty's Government and the Republic of Rwanda makes legally binding and with additional enhancements the Memorandum of Understanding between the two governments of 2022. For example, the undertaking that under the new asylum procedure there is a commitment that no person relocated under the treaty to Rwanda will be sent to any country other than the UK if the UK so requests. However, as the House knows, the International Agreements Committee of this House does not recommend ratification until further evidence is available. Nonetheless, my Lords, there remain very significant concerns about the contents of the Bill as it currently stands, not least using legislation to make a declaration of fact in order to correct a court which has heard evidence. It is clear, my Lords, that the Government has gone to a great deal of effort in order to provide evidence to persuade critics of the feasibility of removal to Rwanda as a safety and properly functioning process, while at the same time trying to satisfy its policy aim and critics of a different stamp, that the limited capacity of this scheme will be a deterrent to those who make long and dangerous journeys in order to cross the Channel. The purpose of these amendments is, I believe, to match the Bill more closely to the requirements of the Supreme Court judgment and thus both more just and less open to challenge. My Lords, for the sake of the people whose lives will be affected by yet more upheaval, who as it stands will not even have the opportunity to have their claim heard in this country, we cannot afford to get this wrong. Courts and tribunals must be able to make a judgment about the safety of Rwanda based on a consideration of the facts. We are not primarily discussing the suitability of Rwanda, we are discussing its safety for people who, by definition, have highly complex lives and circumstances. The treaty introduces safeguards and checks, so it should, but these are not yet in force. I share the view, my Lords, that more is needed. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees an agency with which the government has worked with in a highly effective way over many years, should provide that positive judgment of safety. Until then, the government is taking an unreasonable risk by sending anyone to Rwanda. These amendments, my Lord, offer practical steps which strike <laughs> a kind of balance we are wise to pursue in this revising chamber. They do not wreck the bill, nor remove the objective of deterrence from it, though we can debate in due course the degree of inhibition it brings into the process. Rather, these amendments, my Lords, provide an adequate mechanism for addressing concerns about the UK's compliance with international law and appropriately given the name of this bill, 
the safety of Rwanda as a destination for the processing for asylum claims intended originally for the UK. These amendments, my Lords, are important for the preservation of judicial oversight and for the maintenance of the separation of powers, which is a fundamental component of our Constitution. It is for Parliament to make laws. It is for the judiciary to judge cases, including the lawfulness of government decisions, and to make findings grounded on the basis of evidence. Amendment 7, my Lord, seeks to make it plain that the bill before us replaces the Supreme Court's finding of fact. My Lords, a bill cannot change the actual situation on the ground in another country. It can only mandate that evidence to the contrary. That is disregarded. We have a duty of care in international law towards asylum seekers who arrive in this country. Legislating, my lords, that Rwanda is a safe country does not necessarily make it so for the potentially vulnerable people who might be sent there. This amendment seeks to make it plain that the bill before us today replaces the Supreme Court's finding of fact. The bill's primary purpose is to disregard the UK's own Supreme Court's finding that Rwanda is not a safe country for asylum seekers. A bill cannot change the actual situation on the ground in another country. It can only mandate that evidence to the country is disregarded. We have a duty of care towards asylum seekers who arrive in this country. Legislating that Rwanda is a safe country does not necessarily make it so for the potentially vulnerable people there. Let us be clear, my lords, what it is we are doing. The Law Society have said unequivocally that it is inappropriate for the government to undermine the judiciary in this way and that the bill threatens the balance of powers in the United Kingdom. This amendment would put onto the face of the bill that a judicial finding of fact is being replaced. I hope, my Lords, that we give these amendments a fair wind. My support to the amendments in the name of the noble Baroness, Baroness Chakrabarti, the most reverend primate, and the most noble lady, Baroness Hale. Uh, and in doing so, uh, to express some slight uh, puzzlement that the government seems to have difficulty in accepting these amendments. The government tells us again and again uh, that nothing in this bill is contrary to our international obligations. Okay, well then, just accept these amendments and make that even clearer than it was before. One may have one's doubts as to the reason why the government is not going to accept these amendments, because basically its position is that of the Red Queen in Alice. It's so because I say it's so. Now, I would like to address one or two of the points made by the noble and learned Lord, Lord Howard, because they were extremely far-reaching and, I would say, uh, very, very damaging and disruptive mm -hmm. of our ability to support a rules-based international order. Mm -hmm. Because he seemed to not take into account that it was this sovereign parliament that ratified our membership of the United Nations in 1945. And that Charter of the United Nations contains the Charter for the General Assembly. And the General Assembly appoints the High Commissioner for Refugees. So I don't think his argument about lack of accountability stands up. But also, if you think about it, uh, in uh, contradicting any role for the High Commission for Refugees to give advice to us about whether or not Rwanda is a safe place is an extraordinarily far-reaching and damaging claim to make. Because if they... It's not, as I said in answer to the Lord Lord Fair, it's not simply a question of seeking advice from the United Nations High Commissioner. The amendments clearly state that unless positive advice is obtained, no one can be removed to Rwanda. So the decision will no longer be the decision of the Secretary of State 
it will be the decision of the United Nations Commissioner for Refugees. That is the point. It's not just advice. It's advice which would be binding, according to these amendments, on the government. I thank the noble lord for that point, uh, which interrupted me before I got to the answer to his question. Um, but um, uh, that, that is fine. Uh, what I had been going to say was that the doctrine, according to the noble lord, lord and learned lord, Lord Howard, is that every member that has signed the Refugee Convention, well over 150, I think, uh, and ratified it, including our sovereign parliament, has the right to reinterpret the convention as it wishes. Now, you only have to, for one minute, stop and think what that implies to realize that it implies complete chaos and the law of the jungle. If all 150 members of the United Nations Refugee Convention, 150 plus, are able to stand up and say, well, actually, this is what I think the convention means, and I don't care a damn what the uh, the, the, the High Commissioner for Refugees says, then we are living in chaos. And it's to avoid that that these amendments are being put forward. And I do strongly support mm -hmm. the arguments of the noble lady Baroness Hellich, who seemed to me to express extremely eloquently the reason why this country has a real interest in paying attention to these matters. Yes. For, for giving way, I, I, I thought it might help the committee for me, uh, before this, this uh, debate with the noble Lord, Lord Howard, rumbles on, um, to clarify that he is quite right, that this amendment, as, current, as currently drafted, requires positive advice from the UNHCR, <coughs> not just advice, positive or negative. Now, the reason for that, in the current iteration of the amendment, is that the Prime Minister expressly said that this bill is designed to um, assuage the concerns of the Supreme Court, and they were based predominantly on the negative advice from the UNHCR um, about the situation in Rwanda. Such was the nature of the evidence of UNHCR and the uh, credence that the Sup our Supreme Court gave to that evidence. However, however, uh, the noble uh, Lord um, Lord Howard of Limpney, or indeed the government, are welcome, if that, is too, if that formulation is too rich for their blood, they are welcome to amend the amendment or offer their own, which uh, requires only advice, positive or negative, uh, by the UNHCR before, par before either the Secretary of State or indeed Parliament can look again at whether Rwan Rwanda has changed subsequent to the treaty and is now or in the future a safe place for asylum seekers and refugees? I, I would, don't wish to pursue that course at all. I'm not one of the proposers of this amendment. I'm merely supporting it. But the arguments that I'm adducing are arguments that relate to the state that this country would be in if it issues forth into the world and says it has an absolute right to interpret a United Nations Convention which it ratified many years ago and which, is, which it has supported uh, through thick and thin ever since and now wishes to contradict. And that is a serious matter and I do not believe myself that the noble old Lord Howe's arguments ought to carry weight because I think the implications of them for our position in the world and our support for a rules-based international order would be extremely damaging. My Lords, I want simply to say a few words in support of Amendment 3 and 7, which are in my name, and also so, to so, um, express some more general support for the position adopted by the noble Baroness, Baroness Chakrabarti. As regards Amendment 3, it is simply untrue to state that it is the judgment of Parliament that Rwanda is a safe country. That may be the opinion of the House of Commons, though of course I was a, a whip in the House of Commons for many years and I know the forces that are put in place to assure the opinion of the House of Commons, the elective dictatorship of which my father spoke. <laughs> But what is absolutely certain is that it is not the opinion of this House. 
And we know that to be a fact because of the vote that took place um, on the 22nd of January in this House. In my opinion, we should not put onto the face of a bill a statement which is manifestly untrue. And hence why I have put down amendments which state the truth. And the truth is that the safety of Rwanda is the opinion of the government. That is the truth. And why on earth should we not enact that simple truth rather than commit what in other circumstances would be described as a lie? As regards Amendment 7, we should state in clear terms what we are doing. We are, in fact, using a statutory and untrue pronouncement to reverse a recent finding by the Supreme Court. My learned friend, Lord Hard, for whom I have the greatest respect, we were colleagues for very many years, he was in the House of Commons for 27 years, I beat him, I was there for 30 years, but he was a lot more distinguished than I was. But to try and say of the House of, Law, uh, of the Supreme Court that they didn't make a finding of fact is to turn a situation on its head. They expressed an opinion as to fact, as, to, as juries do in criminal cases. And an opinion as to fact is a finding of fact. Now, I'd like, if I might, um, to uh, take a little broader view. I happen to share the view, and I suspect it's pretty general in this House, that both legal and illegal migration is far too high and should be reduced. I share the very correct intention of the government that we need to deter illegal migration. My objection is not to the purpose, but to the means which is being advocated, which is, in my view, wrong in principle and will not succeed. However, it is clear to me, as it is clear to the Baroness Chakrabarti, that the government decides to push ahead and will doubtless, in ping-pong, reverse our amendments. But in the spirit of compromise, as did the uh, Baroness, I would like to make some positive suggestions. Leaving aside the issue of principle, I'm concerned that the government is seeking to enact, without any proper assessment, its judgment as to whether Rwanda is safe. And that means not just whether the treaty is put into place within Rwanda, but also whether the provisions of the treaty over a period of time are implemented. And also, not just that, but also whether for other reasons we can say that Rwanda is safe. That we are entitled to do. And be clear about it, that is not a one-off assessment. That has to be a continuing assessment, because things can change. And the other thing we need to be absolutely clear about is whether the policy objective is working. We are told that the purpose of the bill is to reduce uh, illegal migration across the channel. That is a, a judgment. I don't happen to think it will work. But one thing is certain, is that we don't know whether it will work now. But in the course of time, we may be able to form a view as to that. So my concern is that the bill provides no mechanism for a continuing assessment, both as to the safety of Rwanda and as to the success of the policy. And I believe that Parliament is entitled to demand a continuous and authoritative assessment. Now, we could argue whether it should be uh, based on the European um, body or whether, as Amendment 81 suggests, uh, the Joint Committee of Human Rights, or, as I've in the past suggested, a special um, Joint Committee, Select Committee appointed for the purpose. But there is a way forward, which is this. 
This bill does not come into operation without both Houses of Parliament by an affirmative resolution triggering it. And they can only trigger it once a report has been received from whatever assessment monitoring board we put into place. And that is not enough, because, as I say, what we need is continuing assessment. So what I contemplate is something like this, that the initial trigger should be, say, for two years. It could then be renewed by another statutory uh, uh, process, affirmative resolution, on the basis of a further report, renewed for two years. And then again, if the Secretary of State thinks he'll get away with it. But that way, we will have a continuing process of assessment. And that will give this House and Parliament in general something on which it could honourably proceed. And I would like to think that my noble friends on the front bench will show a certain degree of flexibility. Because if they don't, it may be quite difficult to persuade their critics to be flexible. I, I briefly want to follow my noble friend Lord Helsham in his remarks, and had he been the <coughs> presider in a three-man court or three-person <coughs> court, I would have been very happy to say that I've heard his speech and have nothing else to add. But since we're here, you have the disadvantage, <laughs> you have the disadvantage of hearing what I have to say. Um, like my noble friend Lord Howard of Lim and my noble friend uh, Lady Hellish, I'm, I regret I was not here at second reading, and I apologise, but I've read the Hansard of the debate. Uh, I'm always reluctant to disagree with my learned friend, uh, my noble friend Lord Howard, but I think he took too narrow an approach uh, to the questions before us. And I use um, clause uh, one, two, little b, which is the subject which my noble friend Lord Helsham attacks. Uh, as a hanger on, on, on which to make a few remarks. Um, I think, if I understood him correctly, my noble friend Lord Howard said that um, Parliament can essentially do what it likes. And of course, he's perfectly right. Uh, Parliament can be uh, as foolish as it likes. Uh, Parliament can pass a law saying that all dogs are cats, but it doesn't make all dogs cats. Parliament can pass a law saying that uh, Rwanda is a safe country, but it doesn't make it a safe country. Uh, and this is where I agree with my learned friend, Lord Helsham. It's for the government, it's for the executive to advance its policy, whether it's a good policy or a bad policy, but it's, it's for the government to say it is our political opinion or it is our policy that Rwanda is a safe country to which to return, or to which to send uh, a, a failed asylum seekers. If the government then wishes to have its view tested by Parliament, well, again, it can go ahead and do it. So what the government is proposing as a matter of policy is not a constitutional outrage, <coughs> but the way in which they are writing it down in uh, Clause 1, Subclause 2 little b is, if I may respectfully say so, just plain silly. And I think it is worse to be silly than it is to be guilty of a constitutional outrage. And this is not a constitutional outrage. It's just plain silly. And ridicule, if I may say so, is a more powerful weapon than the constitutional and legal arguments of any number of lawyers. It would, of course, as the noble lady, Lady Chakrabarti, advances in one of her amendments, it would, of course, be helpful to have uh, a UNCR opinion in favour of the safety or otherwise of Rwanda. But I have a feeling that exporting government policy to the UNCR is not a good idea. It would be <laughs> helpful to have that opinion, but it's not essential. And the government must stand on its own feet, bring its policy to Parliament, 
have it tested, and it will either survive or not, uh, as the case may be, on the merits of the facts. But the assessment of whether Rwanda is a safe country is an assessment that must be for the government to be considered by and to be agreed with by Parliament, but <coughs> we as a bicameral uh, parliamentary body, I suggest, are not equipped to reach those sorts of conclusions. We can agree with, we can disagree with, with the government, but we are not equipped, it seems to me, in a presidium uh, to reach a conclusion about whether, as a matter of fact, the Republic of Rwanda is a safe country. My Lord, I don't uh, wish to uh, undermine or under, uh, underplay, or shall I say, underestimate uh, the hugely difficult political problem that the government faces with illegal immigration and the making of uh, unsound asylum applications nor do I wish to undermine their genuine and very proper uh, decision and policy to stop the boats. But if we are to stop the boats, if we are to reduce the amount of illegal immigration and the amount of bogus asylum applications, may I suggest that the government would go a long way if it had the confidence of its own convictions and allowed a clause one, two, little b, to say that the act gives effect to the politically expedient policy of the government, that the Republic of Rwanda is safe, rather than trying to shift the responsibility for that opinion upon Parliament. Parliament may come to agree with it, but the initial policy is one for government, and to that extent, I wholly agree with my noble friend, Lord Helsham. Well, <coughs> thank the noble Lord. I am another supporter of Amendment 3. Clause 1 is an example, as it seems to me, of the current vogue for starting bills not with operative provisions, uh, but with preambular statements of the obvious, a custom which is always irritating, uh, but normally harmless. There is, however, harm, I suggest, and not just silliness, in Clause 1 2 b with its rather grand invocation of the judgment of Parliament that the Republic of Rwanda is a safe country, a judgment apparently for all time uh, that there is no provision to revisit or to change. That invocation, I suggest, is both unnecessary and contrary to principle. It's unnecessary because there are other ways for Rwanda to be declared or deemed safe, the Secretary of State could be entrusted with the decision. Or if it is really necessary for Parliament to take it, there could at least be a power in the Secretary of State to amend it in the light of changed conditions, as was the case in Section 75 of the Illegal Migration Act, uh, 2023. It's contrary to principle because it requires us to come to a judgment on a fact-specific life-and-death matter on which we are frankly ill-equipped to adjudicate. Of course, this is not the first time such a thing has happened. It was tried in the Asylum and Immigration Act 2004, when the countries of the European Economic Area, all of course signatories to the ECHR, were deemed irrebuttably to be safe. That experiment, a requirement of European Union law, was not a successful one. Its unwieldiness was demonstrated in the case of Nasiri. The Judicial Committee of the House of Lords dismissed a challenge to the safety of Greece uh, but through, I believe, the noble and learned Lord Hoffman, who I am delighted uh, to see in his place, indicated that the courts might have to issue a declaration of incompatibility in the event that the deeming provision was contradicted by the evidence. The issue was sensibly addressed in the Nationality and Borders Act 2022 by transforming the irrebuttable presumption into a rebuttable one. No such good sense is on display in Clause 1 b a much more contentious provision because of its very different context. It asks us to state definitively that Rwanda is safe when all the evidence points the other way. In particular, the verdict of our own Supreme Court, which identified uh, defects that it did not <coughs> consider um, solvable in the short term, and the judgment of our own International Agreements Committee, uh, which we uh, endorsed uh, by a healthy majority 
when we voted on it uh, on the 22nd of January. Of course we can do anything we want, but this does not mean it's sensible to do so. As the Joint Committee on Human Rights uh, put it in its report of this morning, the courts remain the most appropriate branch of the state to resolve contested issues of fact. And a unanimous Constitution Committee, on which I serve, went a little further last week, describing this clause <laughs> as constitutionally inappropriate and invoking both the rule of law and the separation of powers. I emphasise the practical point that this uh, clause puts Parliament on a quite unnecessary collision course with the courts, uh, both domestic and international. Uh, Amendment 3 would not solve all the Bill's problems. Uh, it would not even stop Clause 1 from being pointless, uh, but it would at least render it harmless, and that is why I support it. <laughs> My Lords, like uh, other noble Lords, I was unable to be present last week for the second reading, but I cannot allow this bill to pass through the House without making my very deep concern about it public and evident. And so I'm speaking first on this group of amendments because they go to the heart of my concern. I've been a member of Parliament for a very long time on and off, and I've been a member of the Conservative Party for some 66 years I, when I counted it up. And I do have to say that I find it quite extraordinary that the party of Margaret Thatcher should be introducing a bill of this kind. Like some other noble lords, I have a very clear memory of the great battle that uh, Margaret Thatcher fought with the European Union, the community in those days, over the British budget contribution. And it was from time to time suggested uh, in those days that she should cut the cattle and put the Continentals in their place and cut off the British contribution. And that would, of course, have been a very dramatic uh, thing to do and would have been very popular in some circles. But she didn't countenance that uh, idea because she believed that it would be contrary to the law. And there were those who warned that it might indeed even um, run into trouble in the British courts. Now, how different that is from this bill, how different that is from the way in which we are now being asked to behave towards the Supreme Court and towards the European Convention on Human Rights. And this is no esoteric matter that only concerns um, the subject under discussion uh, and is only uh, of interest to, to lawyers. We in this country boast frequently uh, that Britain is such a marvelous place to do business because of our great respect for the rule of law uh, and that we are a great place to do business because the government, unlike some governments in the world, can be relied upon not to take arbitrary and unreasonable acts. Now, I think it's very difficult to sustain that argument in the light of, uh, of the bill now, now before us, and I don't know whether those who are envisaging doing business in this country will draw that conclusion or not, but it does seem to me that we are going against a fundamental interest, not just in terms of, 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 of this issue, but in terms of our wider reputation. What we're being asked to do really represents the sort of behavior, my lords, that the world associates with despots and autocracies, not with an established democracy, not with the mother of parliaments, it is a bill we should not even be asked to confront, let alone pass. I, I'm uh, privileged to follow what the noble Lord, Lord Tugendhat has said, and I strongly agree with what uh, he has said. I would just like to focus on two particular things in relation to what the government is asking us to do. But before that, could I apologise for not being here at the second reading? I, too was abroad, and can I declare an interest that I'm a member of the Constitution Committee of this House, which published a report that expressed very considerable concerns unanimously 
about this bill. I have two particular concerns about this bill. We as a nation, for the last 70 years, have accepted that we will not deport asylum seekers to a place where they may face death, torture or inhuman treatment. And if asylum seekers feel that that is a risk, they can seek protection from the courts. And the courts may well give an applicant short shrift if they don't think there's anything in it. But that protection we have stood by for 70 years and incorporated into our domestic law in the Human Rights Act 1998. This bill envisages the possibility, indeed, those who have looked at it independently, the more likely than not result that people will be sent to Rwanda where they will be at very substantial risk of then being befouled, which means sent back to a place where they could be tortured or killed. The answer that the government gives is, oh, we've entered into an agreement with Rwanda that says they won't send anybody who comes from here to anywhere except the UK if they go to Rwanda. To which the answer is that given by the International Treaties Committee, which says the reason there was a risk of refoulement, being sent to a place where you could be tortured or killed, was because Rwanda did not even have the most basic system of properly assessing asylum claims, and it was because they didn't have that system that the risk of refoulement occurred. The idea, as this bill envisages, that it comes into force the moment the new treaty comes into force will provide the protection is absolute nonsense. And everybody appreciates that, except, as far, I can, as far as I can see, the Right Honourable Mr James Cleverley, who is the Secretary of State for Home Affairs. It's just a non-starter, factually, if you look at the conclusions that the Supreme Court introduced. Now, this government says, and I'm sure uh, the noble Lord, Lord Sharp, will confirm that he stands by on behalf of the government, the commitment that we've made for the last 70 years that asylum seekers will not be exported to a place where they might be refooled. If that is the true position of the government, how on earth can they be allowing this? I should also point out that the International Treaties uh, Committee of this House said quite separately from the fact that you need to reform completely the asylum system in uh, uh, Rwanda, you've also got to enter into a number of other detailed provisions before it can be seen whether or not that provision in the new agreement prevents refoulement. And those agreements have not yet been entered into with Rwanda, and there's no requirement for them to be entered into before it becomes law. So, so my first big objection to this bill is that it goes against commitments we have made as a nation and stand by for the last 70 years. And if we are looking for solutions to the problems of immigration in the world, the idea of turning our back on all these international agreements we've made seems a very, very bad start indeed. My second big objection to this bill is that it fundamentally crosses over the separation of powers. Uh, the noble Lord, Lord Howard of Limp, who I greatly admire, who was a member of our Constitution Committee, said, oh, don't worry, we're just doing what we're just taking the opinion of the former Lord Chief Justice, who was the dissenting voice in the Court of Appeal. No, that is not what the government says they are doing. What the government says that they are doing is, well, we've taken account of what uh, the Supreme Court judgment is. We respect that judgment. We're not going with the former Lord Chief Justice's judgment. We're dealing with the points that have been made. And by the way, dealing with them, we're not letting anybody question us about that, which is absolutely not the role of this House or the courts. What this bill leads to 
is Parliament delivering the noble Lord Garnier describes it as silly. It is so much more profound than silly. I quite agree with you. The beginning of this bill is very silly in the way that it reads. It's a sort of a sort of cack-handed attempt to deliver a sort of judgment like a court would read. But it's not silly, it's dangerous. Think of three examples. First of all, this, whereby Parliament can say, even though we see Rwanda refouling people that we are sending, and they are sending Afghans and Syrians uh, and Iraqis back to death or torture, we do nothing. We say that's okay because we made our judgment it was a safe country. That is one example. Take another example. Suppose the Prime Minister has a friend or a crony in the House of Commons who's convicted in a court of corruption of some sort. And then the Prime Minister presents a bill to Parliament saying it is the judgment of Parliament that Snook's MP actually wasn't able to present this new evidence to the criminal court that convicted him. So it is the judgment of Parliament that Snook's MP is innocent, because that is the route that this particular bill takes Parliament down. Take a third example, the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission decides that it won't investigate some particular problem of, say, not complying with expenses views. And then the courts say, in relation to that decision, the Electoral Commission was over-influenced by party political considerations. For example, the governing party was very unkeen for there to be a proper investigation of some expenses fraud in an election. And, the, and, and on a judicial review, the Electoral Commission's refusal to investigate was set aside on the basis that there was no basis not to investigate. Once again, relying on this precedent, the government of the day, assume it's got a big majority, produces a bill that says it is the judgment of Parliament that the courts have got that opinion, as the noble Lord, Lord Howard of Limp, introducing a whole new concept in the law, says is the position. This is what the danger of this bill is. I'm not sure I support all of the noble, my noble friend Baroness Chakrabarti Solutions, in particular a reference to the United Nations Commissioner on Refugees as the right source. But my goodness me, if you start letting Parliament make those sort of judgments, you open a door that it will be incredibly difficult to close. And in this House, we should surely give effect to this. Just one final point. Lord Murray of the, 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 the noble Lord, Lord Murray of Lidworth said, oh, no, don't worry, it's all Section 4. It is not Section 4. Section 4 only allows appeals to be made by people who are saying something different from the country is not safe generally. It is only if there is something specific about them. So if, for example, I am a voluble member of the Rwandan opposition and I am then sent to Rwanda, where I may get uh, tortured or killed, then I've got a ground. But if I'm saying I'm from Syria or Afghanistan and they're refouling regularly, I have no basis for appealing. So stand by our commitments to asylum seekers is my first point. And my second point is do not listen to this siren song that this is not a fundamental change in our constitution. It is, and it will be the foundation of very bad things to come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, um, I was at second reading. I don't know if that makes me less interesting to listen to than the noble Lord, Lord, Lord Faulkner <laughs> and, and all the rest. Um, I have heard some of these remarks before, of course, um, but it's always a pleasure to hear them again, if I, <laughs> if I agree with them. Um, I am going to say something quite similar to what you've just heard from the noble and learned Lord Lord Faulkner, but I will say it less competently, obviously, because I don't have legal training, but what I do have is common sense. I'm not suggesting they're mutually exclusive, obviously, <laughs> but I would say they are two completely different things. And I'm arguing that this is an absurd bill. 
It is nasty. It's inhumane. And I don't want any part of it. And Greens have made it clear, along with our friends on this occasion, the Lib Dems, that we would stop it if we possibly could. So in line with that, I do support um, Amendment 3 in the name of the noble Viscount Lord Hailsham and, uh, and the noble Lady, Lady Chakrabarti. And uh, I think uh, it was referred to that, uh, that the silly wasn't an appropriate, it's frankly silly drafting. Clause 1 to B, that this Act gives effect to the, the judgment of Parliament, that the Republic of Rwanda is a safe country. Acts of Parliament are not vehicles for Parliament to express its opinion about issues, so this clause ought to be removed on that basis alone, or else we start legislating opinions instead of laws. But Parliament is not of the opinion that Rwanda is a safe country. We haven't been presented with any evidence to prove that, and we've got no process to make such determinations. The best we have is a debate on amendments in this way, which we may pass and return to the Commons, or to the other end, or whatever we call it. The, um, the other end will, of course, the Government will, of course, uh, disagree with any amendments that we pass. They will almost certainly strip them out, and uh, we will uh, be back here debating again, wasting long hours in trying to make this government see sense. This is bad lawmaking and a silly precedent. Isn't a motion rather than legislation the correct vehicle for each house to formulate their judgment and express their view on an issue independent of one another? What future opinions will be voiced in legislation? What views will be forced on your Lordship's house by the elected house, no matter how wrong or how wicked? This deals with just one small part of this awful, awful bill, but it is illustrative of the constitutional and moral nonsense that runs throughout. This bill cannot be amended. It must be stopped. And in answer to the noble and learned Lord Howard, um, what we're trying to do with these amendments is to stop the government forcing us to lie. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> A pleasure to follow the noble Baroness Lady Jones. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as a cross-bench <coughs> member of the Joint Committee on Human Rights, which was referred to by the noble Baroness Lady Chakravarti during her remarks, and indeed she referred to the 50-page report that was finally agreed by a majority in the committee. It's a majority, not unanimous, report on February the 7th, and as others have said, it was published today and is available in the printed paper office. I'll say, if I may, in my remarks, something about what it has to say about safety. Uh, but first, before doing that, I'd like to agree particularly with the tone of many of the contributions that have been made so far on this group of amendments. My noble friend Lord Hanney, as always, put his finger on our international obligations, not least amongst which is the 1951 Convention on Refugees. Now, it may well be, but this isn't written in stone, that there should be attempts to try and change and reform this in the climate of today's demands. I'll happily give way. The Noble Lord at Walton for giving way, and he has just referred to international agreements. Would he agree with me, therefore, that this bill contravenes international agreements, like the UNCHR, but also the ECHR, and I am reminded of the fact that the provisions of this bill extend to Northern Ireland, and hence this provision and this bill undermines the very basis of the Good Friday Agreement. Well, I'm very grateful to the Noble Baroness. I wasn't in intending to touch on Northern Ireland, but the Noble Baroness Barry Ritchie of Downpatrick is right that this does touch on the Windsor Agreement and on our obligations to Northern Ireland which are separate from those of the rest of the United Kingdom. And I would commend that section of the report, not my opinions, but the report uh, does touch on that question. But she also asked about our other obligations. There are many obligations that we have, not just in the Refugee Convention, but the ECHR she's just referred to. And yes, we have obligations there too. And of course, the government on this bill, as on the Illegal Migration Bill, declined to give it a compatibility statement because the government itself cannot say that it will be compatible, although ministers I know take a contrary view that there is uncertainty around that, but if there's uncertainty, then one must be very careful where we tread. I was very struck, though, on the issue of 
our uh, international reputation by the statement that was made by the former Pakistan Prime Minister, uh, and which is referred to in the JCHR report, who justified what he was intending and has done in sending back 430,000 Afghan refugees to Pakistan. He said it was modelled on what we were seeking to do here in the British Parliament. So even though we know that that's casuistry, it's extreme, nevertheless, we can see where this argument can lead and the way in which it can be used. So yes, our international reputation, as the noble Lord, Lord Hanny said, he is right to say that it can very easily <coughs> suffer. The right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Southwark, was, I thought, also got to the heart of this when he said that legislating that Rwanda is safe doesn't make it so. And the noble and learned Lord, Lord Faulkner of Horizon touched on that same point. Just saying that an apple is a pear doesn't make it such. Saying that a dog is a cat doesn't make it such. It may be your opinion, but it isn't true. And that is surely what we have a duty to try and do in this place. My Lords, process procedure governance. During our debates on the Illegal Migration Bill and on the treaty, I complained that we had not been treated properly as a select committee in the way that you would expect select committees to be treated. So Ella Braverman, the then Home Secretary, declined to appear before the Select Committee. We didn't see James Cleverly in the context of this bill. We did, however, see the Lord Chancellor, Alex Chalk, and I pay tribute to him and the way in which he delivered his evidence and took the questions that we put to him. But as the noble and learned Lord has just said to it, it is the duty of the Home Secretary of the day to explain what the intentions of their legislation is. And if there is anxiety about something like as, as important as compatibility statements for them to explain why they feel unable to give it. The, my noble and learned friend, Lord Anderson of, of Ipswich, rightly said that we are ill-equipped to make these kinds of decisions in Parliament. Uh, I haven't, didn't serve as long as the noble Lord, Lord Howard, although we did have the distinction of contesting the same parliamentary seat in the heart of Liverpool on separate occasions, or indeed as long as the noble Lord, Lord Hailsham. But I rather agree with what the noble Lord, Lord Tugendhat said to the House a few moments ago about the way in which legislation was and has traditionally been dealt with, both in another place and here. Uh, I cannot remember select committees being treated by secretaries of state in the way that I've just described, and thinking all the way back to the 1981 Nationality Bill, on which I spoke many times, there were opportunities to hear the arguments, to discuss the implications and to make appropriate amendments. I have not felt that about this legislation or that which preceded it. I think it's been pushed through in a pell-mell way, bringing to mind the thought that if you enact legislation um, in a hurry, then you will end up repenting at some leisure. My Lords, let me take you for a moment, if I may, to page 15 of the report, because this comes right down to the role of the UNHCR and safety. As of January 2024, as recently, therefore, as last month, UNHCR had not observed changes in the practice of asylum adjudication that would overcome the concerns set out in its 2022 analysis and in the detailed evidence presented to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court not the House of Commons, not the House of Lords, relied on UNHCR when it came to a decision about questions of fact. Let me quote again from the report. UNHCR notes the detailed legally binding commitments now set out in the treaty, which if enacted in law and fully implemented in practice, would address certain key deficiencies in the Rwandan asylum system identified by the Supreme Court that would, however, require sustained long-term efforts, the results of which may only be assessed over time. Well, clearly, we haven't had the time to make those assessments. And again, we are being urged to rush pell-mell. Two witnesses, and I won't detain the House much longer, Professor Tom Hickman, KC, said this to the committee. Parliament is effectively being asked to exercise a judicial function to assess evidence, to look in detailed facts, and effectively to distinguish the Supreme Court's judgment to say that things have moved on and it's not binding on Parliament. I don't mean in a non-legal way, in making its judgment. In my view, he said, that is an inappropriate exercise for Parliament to conduct. It is a judicial function. This was a view echoed by Professor Sarah Singer. I'll just read from paragraph 57, one sentence. To contradict the Supreme Court in this way is perhaps not showing the respect to the court 
that should be owed as a constitutional principle. And my Lords, in the summary on page 35, I will conclude with this. We have considered the Government's evidence that Rwanda is now safe but have also heard from witnesses and bodies, including the UNHCR, that Rwanda remains unsafe, or at least that there's not enough evidence available at this point to be sure of its safety. Overall, we cannot be clear that the position reached on Rwanda's safety by the country's most senior court is no longer correct. In any event, the courts remain the most appropriate branch of the state to resolve contested issues of fact, so the question of Rwanda's safety should best be determined, not by legislation, but allowing the courts to consider the new treaty and the latest developments on the ground. My Lords, for all those reasons, I believe Lady Chakrabarti has done the House a great favour in bringing these um, committee stage amendments to the House. She's already shown her willingness to think further about whether they might be applied in other ways. That's what committee stage is surely all about. And I think that the tone that's been struck in the course of this debate is one which behoves members of your Lordship's House, to think very deeply, and I would commend this report to the House. Lord, can I welcome the point made by Lord Altman about the tone of this debate, and particularly the speech of the Baroness Chakrabarti, which I thought I warmly welcomed her desire, obvious desire to find some way forward in this difficult area, which we certainly need to do. But there is, I'm afraid to say, <laughs> a rock in the way, or a difficulty in the way, which is of her um, uh, amendment, which is this, that it makes a classic mistake, which is to take two separate organisations with different objectives and obligations and place one with a veto over the other. <laughs> Here, the UNHCR has a veto in practice, it's my reading of the words here, a veto in practice over what the UK government can do. This is the difficulty. And therefore, she used the word stalemate. I think her proposals would also lead to a stalemate while the UNHCR went on forever, uh, we know not when, saying, to say whether or not Rwanda was safe. And there would be probably debate and hostility and no eventual consensus as to whether it was safe. Surely, a more sensible way forward would be to take existing, the existing circumstances and existing practice and for both sides to engage, engage properly and responsibly, responsibly with the other. We do have obligations to the UNHCR. We are obliged under the Refugee Convention to engage with the UNHCR, and so we should. We're, in, uh, we're obliged to take account of the social and humanitarian consequences for refugees, and so we should. But equally, the UNHCR should take, on a, take into account the real responsibilities of governments to defend their borders in a sensible way in which their own democracies would expect. Now, if we can get those two working together, something sensible may emerge from it. And it already has done in Australia. I wish that we, we would all, always be quite so insular. For 10 years now, Australia has been operating a, 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 an outsourcing policy of the kind to which the UK aspires. And it started off in precisely the same way with precisely the advocates on each side, which we did. And in the end, the, the Australian government invited in the UNHCR at three different levels, at the prime ministerial level, at the ministerial level, and at the ordinary regional level of civil servants and so forth, and they came to agreement of how it should work. And not only that, but there was leave, the UNHCR, as a consequence of its willingness to get involved, had leverage, and it got out of the Australian government more legal routes for genuine asylum seekers. And the same should happen here. Our legal routes for asylum seekers are at present wholly unsatisfactory because they're confined to a small number of countries and most countries in the world are excluded. My view of a proper immigration policy has always been that it should be a settled cap which we put 
publicly to the people every year in Parliament how many should we bring in within that cap the, the, the priority should be to genuine asylum seekers and only thereafter to economic migrants or people joining their families here. That is the right way to approach a, 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 uh, an immigration policy, a total immigration policy, of which this is, on, this is only a small, numerically only a very small part. Therefore, I think that if we follow the Australian example, which has been now operating successfully and is supported by both parties, the current Labour Party in Australia had just reduced the cap on the number of immigrants allowed into the country because it's dissatisfied with the numbers going to Australia, which is a vast country after all. We have a similar problem, even more acute here. So if we follow that example of governments working within the existing acknowledged framework of our obligations to the international community, surely we can make some progress. If we, if we hang on to that, too many bells and whistles of the kind which the House seems to want to, I'm afraid we will fail and not make the progress which is available to us here. My Lords, this has been a very long debate and I shall therefore be extremely brief. Um, the uh, <coughs> Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Southwark, spoke very powerfully, as indeed have many extremely well-qualified lawyers, so I'm not going to talk about the law. Um, but what I would say is that I found myself very much in agreement with Lord Howard of Limpney. I thought he was putting a, a very important points, and I hope that they will be reflected later in our debates. All I would say, I think, is that we also need to take account of what one might call the real world. Uh, and I'm glad to see that the uh, front bench of the opposition are being very cautious at this point. Uh, perhaps that's one of their reasons. Um, the reality is that the government have lost control of our borders. Uh, and even the backlog of asylum seekers is enough to fill the largest stadium in the UK. And there's deep public anger, I regret to say, but there is. And we have to take that into account, and I'm sure the Commons will take it into account, when we take this forward. It seems to me, therefore, in, that it's for the government to take action to bring all this under control and for us to give some advice as to how that could best be done. But let's not lose sight of that. This is a very difficult, a very widely resented situation, and we need to be careful ourselves. I um, uh, wish to um, speak uh, to this clause and these group of amendments. <clears throat> and in so doing, I um, <clears throat> apologise to the House that I couldn't be here for second reading. Even though I was on the estate, I'd got a very bad chest infection and was coughing and spluttering, which I didn't think would add to the debate that was had. So I did listen to the debate in my office and have subsequently read, uh, read the, um, read the um, uh, Hansard um, uh, and also was here and very much so proud to support uh, and vote for my noble friend Lord German's amendment, fatal amendment to the bill. I also... Um, draw the House to my um, interest in the register on this issue. I will try not to do a second reading, but keep my, um, uh, uh, keep my comments uh, to this particular clause and the amendments. And I think these amendments are quite important based on what I would call this candy floss um, clause, because it is a bit like a candy floss. The government are trying to make it big, uh, enticing and sweet, but the moment you touch it, it starts to disintegrate, because you realise... It is built on, on nothing. Um, and um, <coughs> one three says that the government of the Republic of Rwanda, as in accordance with the Rwanda Treaty, and these are the important comments, agreed to fulfil the following oblig uh, obligations. Agreed to fulfil. They haven't, my Lord, yet done that, uh, and they haven't uh, given a, an indication of how they will do that. And therefore, I think it's very important before any person is sent to Rwanda, that those obligations are fulfilled. And there needs to be some form of independent assessment of how that is done. Now, normally, in the normal course of the rule of law, that would be the courts of this land. So uh, what the noble, lady, uh, what the noble lady, lady Chattabharti is trying to do is put at least some form of independent assessment People may argue whether it is independent, but the, uh, um, the UNHRC and um, its uh, role 
in the um, um, uh, legal um, understanding of refugees and safe countries, I think, is well understood. Uh, I do have a slight problem with the noble lady in the fact that it's um, just one set of evidence, and clearly courts would normally look at um, a, a wider range of uh, evidence. But, in, but it is important, I think, that in the Amendment 34, there is a rebuttable, a rebuttable presumption, and that, I assume, would at some point give um, some leeway and doorway to the courts to be able to test uh, that, um, that. And the uh, legality of the decision made by the executive can be reviewed by the independent judiciary. It would be interesting to see if that is the, um, th that, that is the aim of the Noble Ladies uh, Amendment. And I particularly would ask the Minister, the Noble Lord, the Minister, when responding to these amendments, to pick up what my noble friend, uh, Lady Hamway, has said with regards to the incompatibility at times between uh, Rwanda and the laws of this land and the obligations and treaties that have been signed. And particularly how refugees' claims would be um, assessed in Rwanda and where there is incompatibility between the laws or obligations of Rwanda and the UK, exactly how those uh, contradictions will be dealt with. Um, uh, I think a majority of those who have spoken have apologised for not being here at second <laughs> reading. <laughs> I'm worried. I think I ought to apologise for having been here at Jack <laughs> and having spoken then and having spoken a week earlier on the treaty. So I've done the apples and pears and I've done the rule of law and I've done the international reputation. And I don't want to bore the House anymore. So let me just say that I, I think the aim shared by the noble learned Lord Garnier and the noble learned Lord Anderson of making the bill, uh, if pointless, harmless, or harmless though still pointless, <laughs> make, yeah, clause one. I think it's, that's impossible. I think we are dealing with a bill which it is very hard to uh, make acceptable. On the Baroness Takravati's uh, amendments. Of course, I, I uh, understand what uh, she uh, is hoping to do, and I, I, I share that. I, I do think we need to take account of the fact that we have voted in this House on the report of the International Agreements Committee that Rwanda is not yet safe, and we've done that uh, not in an off-the-cuff way. We've done that on the basis of a, a reasoned report which was written on the basis of a stack of evidence uh, submitted to the International Greens Committee, of which I'm a member. The uh, a House voted that it wasn't safe. Therefore, the noble Lord, Lord Hailsham, is completely correct. How can we possibly now stand on our heads and say it is the the judgment of Parliament that Rwanda is safe, as if we could do that anyway, as if we cannot legislate fact apples, pears, cats, dogs. I, uh, I, I do think we need to have uh, a, some sort of triggering, some sort of commencement mechanism, which means that the bill uh, doesn't, no, or the Act rather, doesn't come into force until Rwanda can be seen to be safe. And the International Greens Committee set out the 10 areas in which changes were required. I am uneasy about conferring the role on the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, although I think that the government have now accepted that his role one of his roles is supervising and monitoring the operation of the Refugee Convention. I'm not sure that it's right to ask UNHCR to undertake this task. We are only one of the, uh, of the signatories of the Convention. So is Rwanda. And as he said in the memorandum 
that he submitted in, in relation to the treaty, UNHCR continues to engage bilaterally with the government of Rwanda on specific incidents of concern and will continue to offer technical advice and support to the government of Rwanda to strengthen its asylum system and the protection of all refugees as part of its mandated responsibilities. Now, for us to ask it to act as advisors to us might, to UNHCR, I don't know, might seem to be uh, a, a, a difficult. Uh, I note that UNHCR did not want to give evidence to the International Agreements Committee. It seems to me that the UNHCR may well feel this is something you have to sort out for yourselves. Don't, don't drag me in. But we do need to have someone. Uh, they, in later groupings, we can consider uh, the proposals for uh, uh, an independent um, uh, 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 reviewer or the proposal in the name of, of Global Law Lord Hope for uh, using the monitoring committee in the uh, set up in the treaty, using it for that purpose. I'm not sure about that. I'm, I'm on the independent review of myself, but that's, these are for later groupings. For now, I just want to utter a word of caution about um, uh, whether this uh, is really appropriate and whether we wouldn't be talking about a a forced marriage here. The government certainly don't want to involve UNHCR. I'm not 100% sure that UNHCR <laughs> wants to get involved uh, either. The important um, amendments in this group for me are five and six, the ones that say uh, that uh, the, uh, instead of uh, uh, having the bill say that Rwanda is safe, the bill would say that Rwanda will become safe when uh, the conditions, for example, those listed by the International Greens Committee for safety, they are met. So it would it change the tense from is to will be uh, forward looking. And that's where uh, I feel most strongly about the amendments in this group. Uh, my Lords, in uh, speaking, can I first draw attention to my interests? I'm supported by the RAMP group. Uh, RAM project. Um, there are, we've strayed very widely, obviously, across the whole of Clause 1 in this, uh, in this uh, uh, debate. And of course, what we are here to do is to discuss the specific um, amendments which are before us. But I think I should just start by the, uh, the assertion, of course, that this Parliament finds Rwanda safe. I, I did look up the companion to see what the role is of resolutions of this House. And it is the resolution of this House which is the determination of this House. And the determination of this House at this moment, currently, is that Rwanda is not safe. So that is the view of which the Government is trying to make us change our minds. So we need to bear that in mind first of all. The second uh, broader aspiration and uh, broader point that has been drawn out, and largely by the Lord Horan, was of course the issue of uh, offshoring versus uh, um, uh, offloading. We had this debate at second reading, uh, and, I, and I think that what Lord Horan was talking about was offshoring, where you make the determination about whether people are right to come here, and then they come here. But this is not offshoring, this is offloading, where the government hands over the responsibility to another country in order to be able to accept them, and, they, uh, and there is no way back. Uh, and it's a permanent situation. I think, he means, uh, I think he means outsourcing, and it is precisely what the Australians do. Indeed. Oh, no. <laughs> what the Australians did was that they, uh, they checked whether people were ready to come to Australia. Oh, but the government of Nauru over Solomon Island. Yes, they did not. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. The facts are, are otherwise. It, it, it was. Uh, it, they were. They, but the essential thing is, the point is, that they were giving. The, they were doing this work, and I, I 
whatever the, the, the noble lord thinks of the situation. It's not what I think, uh, but we can check the facts. But they were doing it in order that people could be admitted to Australia. That was, that was the point. It was doing it somewhere else in order that they could come to Australia. So trying to clear that knowledge and understanding, which we did do in second reading, on these amendments in particular, I think the first thing is that, it, that, that what we can say is that in introducing scrutiny on the safety of Rwanda is a necessary and essential point, given the resolution and determination of this House. So if the Government wants to proceed and get this House to change its mind, then what it has to do is to give us and find us, a, we have to find a route for ourselves which allows us to do so. Uh, and um, it, it, it acknowledges that we don't have uh, here in this House credible evidence in order to make a finding of safety, and whether or not we should do so is, a, is another matter which we will examine in Group 2 to follow. But it's right that evidence should be broadly based, that, the, that whoever makes that decision, that we should not be just looking one corner for evidence, but we should look, be looking at the evidence of NGOs, the civil society, working groups who were on the ground in Rwanda, in order to find out exactly whether the a decision is the correct one. And so, for us, I don't think we would limit the advice to the advice to that of the United Nations, HCR, even if they were prepared to do so. Uh, and we, but we do take advice that they do give us. I just want to mention the issue which the noble Lord Howard, noble Lord Howard said at the outset. He said that outsourcing um, a positive recommendation on an asylum case to the UNHCR would be unacceptable that we don't actually give this decision to another body. Yet at the same time, right now, as we speak, at the Home Office and its report of January the 12th showed this quite clearly, that the only remaining global resettlement scheme is the UK resettlement scheme, and that relies exclusively on a positive reference from the UNHCR. So the UK does not seek to influence the, the, the cases that the UNHCR refer. The, in fact, the fact is that they have actually passed that responsibility to the UNHCR already to do so. So it is clear that we need a much broader, I think, understanding of what is the, new, the information and advice that we need. Um, and the, the uh, Amendment 34 before us, of course, does create a rebuttable presumption, and I think that is absolutely essential that this is not going to be seen as a rock which can never be moved if the situation were to change one way or the other, from safe to unsafe in the future. And it is right, of course, that court jurisdiction is restored, recognising the rule of law and the separation of powers. More of that to come. On our amendments 11 and 12, in my name and that of Baroness Hamway, it is right that I think that the decisions that are taken on refugees who have applied or who are seeking asylum with us, who are being sent to Rwanda for having their cases heard, should be subject to the rules which we would impose and we impose ourselves, the laws and rules that we have in front of us. So what Amendments 11 and 12 do say is we recognise the UK's laws and responsibilities in this matter, and we want Rwanda to, to utilise those because of the standards which we accept, we want to see those, we want to see those standards being accepted in, uh, in Rwanda. So uh, in conclusion, I think there are Th this, uh, these amendments give us some basis for thought. I think they give us some basis for some major proposals in the future. But at the present moment, I think that they are signposts rather than uh, um, um, a milestone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my Lord, it's a uh, great privilege to uh, wind up this group uh, of amendments for His Majesty's opposition. And uh, uh, the quality of the contributions uh, has been uh, truly outstanding. Um, can I start by saying to Lord Green and Lord Howard, uh, whatever our view on the various amendments, um, uh, including within this group and the other groups, we are fundamentally and totally opposed to the whole bill and have voted against it at all stages. So I think that lays out our position fairly clearly with respect to what we think about, uh, about the bill. Uh, and can I just say to Viscount Helsham, I thought it was helpful for him to lay out again as we start this debate in committee to say that uh, the debate is not about stopping illegal migration or indeed reducing immigration, uh, but how we do it. And the bill is not the way to do it with respect to that. And that's, that's the whole point. I think Viscount Helsham uh, was right to uh, 
uh, remind us of that. Can I also say that uh, I, we support the thrust of the amendments three uh, 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 and uh, seven, uh, and various lords, Lord Anderson Garnet, the Bishop of Southwark, Baroness Chakrabarty herself, I come to her uh, lead amendment in a moment, Lord Hannay, Lord Kerr, uh, and many others, which goes to the heart uh, of the bill, uh, and however the various uh, amendments have tried to do it, but uh, 1 2 B, uh, which uh, replaces a judicial finding of fact uh, with Parliament simply declaring that Rwanda is safe, irrespective of the judgment uh, of the uh, Supreme Court, uh, without going into uh, the legal, legal niceties that we've heard. It does seem pretty remarkable to me that a Parliament makes a judgment, the Court has got it wrong, and we're actually just going to change that um, without reference to, uh, to that Court itself. Of course, the one word missing which gives uh, great uh, credibility to many of the contributions made in your Lordship's House uh, this afternoon from two, uh, uh, one, sorry, one, two B, is that this Act gives effect to the judgment of Parliament that the, the Republic of Rwanda is, sa is a safe country. Of course, what many of your Lordships have said, what the various committees that have reported uh, uh, on this bill have said, is that what the question is that this uh, part of the bill is saying that Rwanda is safe now. It's not saying that it will be safe, will become safe. It's saying that it's safe now. Uh, and the Supreme Court is saying that is the point of, of conflict, of difference between us. We haven't actually said the government can't act in this way. I would have thought the government would have been pleased about that and saying, look, the Supreme Court have said what we're doing is actually conforms to international law. But what you aren't doing is to actually say what, what, what you can't say is that Rwanda is safe now and the government is saying, well, don't worry about that, we'll just pass the law saying it is, uh, which is what the point uh, of conflict uh, about it. And that flies in the face uh, there of the Supreme Court, uh, of the International Arrangements Committee uh, and, uh, and many others. Can I also say that I thought Lord, Lord Tugendhat's uh, uh, contribution uh, was... was remarkable um, for, in its honesty and openness and about him saying as a member of the Conservative Party for decades he was, uh, and I apologise if I get his words wrong, but disappointed perhaps in, in the government coming forward with legislation such as this which he felt flew in the tradition uh, of the Conservative Party and was actually legislation that Margaret Thatcher herself uh, would have refused because it flew uh, in the face of her belief that governments had to act in accordance with the law and that it was, it was the constitution that was at stake if you did not do that. And that's what many of the amendments before us in this particular group seek to reassert, to reassert the principle that this country has always operated on, that, the, uh, that this parliament operates according to the law. Of course, parliamentary sovereignty uh, is paramount. Of course, parliament can pass what it wants, but an unwritten constitution says the part of that that is important that goes along with that is the belief that Parliament will always operate according to the law, even whilst recognising the sovereign power uh, that it has. Turning to Baroness, uh, Baroness sorry, Chakrabarty's uh, amendments, uh, or the leading uh, uh, member that she is for those, to say that we broadly support much uh, of that, and I think in answer to Lord Howard's uh, uh, contribution, I thought Baroness Chakrabarty, in the spirit of committee, actually said if that isn't right, if she hasn't got it completely right, then perhaps the, the, that amendment will need to be changed. And that's what the whole point of committee is. And, and accepting that Lord Howard may actually have a point uh, about that, I thought Baroness Chakrabarty turning around and saying that maybe the, the UNHCR being the sole person that advises or prevents the government from acting might not be the best way forward. But I tell you what I do think, and I wanted to pay particular, draw particular attention to, and I think many of your Lordships, particularly Baroness Hennig and my, my noble friend Lord Faulkner mentioned, and indeed Baroness Chakrabarty did in her own remarks, in the amendments one and two, um, and it may be flowery language that governments now put in, in the front of the bill. I'm sure we did it when we were in government, and hopefully uh, when we're in government in the future, we, we may well do it again. But the, uh, the point, the serious point in one and two, is that uh, the amendment adds the per in amendment one adds the purpose of compliance with the rule of law to that of deterrence. And in, and in amendment two, the second purpose is to ensure compliance with the domestic and your Lordships, I would want to highlight in the contribution in the couple of minutes uh, that I'll speak for, 
uh, and uh, compliance with the domestic and international rule of law. And I think that is really the fundamental uh, point uh, before us. Any bill, any law that we pass, of course should be compliant uh, with international law. That's why our country has sat standing across the world. What on earth are we doing? Why Amendment 1 and 2, that part of it, is so important? Is it, does, do we not care that the UNHCR has said what we're passing is not compliant with the Refugee Convention, is not compliant with international law? Is it of no consequence to us that the UNHCR is saying that? Have we gone beyond caring? Do we not, are we not bothered? Are we, are we simply saying it's an irrelevance? If that's so, I, I, I honestly cannot believe that is where we want our country to go. What are we doing? Ministers from that dispatch box have gone up with respect to Putin and the Ukraine and said we are not going to stand for somebody who drives a coach and horses through the international rules-based order. That is what this country has always stood for. That is what we are proud of. And therefore, we are going to continue that tradition. And we are right to do so. Why are we taking action against the Houthis in the Red Sea? I heard Earl Minto last week say it was because we are not going to have a group of terrorists actually holding the world's trading system to ransom and breaking every single rule of the international rules-based order. Rules that we are adhere to, conventions that we've signed. We've done that by being a sovereign parliament that's taken the decision that in certain areas of international life, it is better to pull sovereignty, to stand together, because if you do that, that's the way to overcome common problems. Not to retreat back into your own country, but to work together to overcome that. And that's why the compliance with international law is important. And within the context of this bill, what Baroness Chakrabarti's amendment with the Archbishop and uh, I think it was, was it Viscount, I apologise, was it Viscount Helsham? But anyway, the others that signed uh, those amendments were seeking to do was to say, as a point of principle, a bill dealing with migration, refugees, asylum, whatever, should comply with international law. I am astonished, astounded. I find it unbelievable that His Majesty's Government has to be reminded of the fact that we want our government to comply with international law. I would have thought that would have been a statement of the obvious. I would have thought that would have been something around which all of us could have united. Whatever party we are, whatever faith we are, we could have been stood together and said, that is why we are proud of our country. What are we going to say, and I'll finish with this, when we go to the United Nations, when we go to the Council of Europe, when we go to the Commonwealth, when we go, even if we still have talks with the EU, when we go to NATO, when we go to any other part of the world where there's an international organisation, how on earth can we lecture those people about conforming to the international rules-based order when we ourselves are prepared to drive a coach and horses through it with respect to this amendment that is before us here. And that's why much of what Baroness Chakrabarti and many others have said in their various amendments before us are so important. And the government may dismiss it, but they'll not win the argument on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my Lords, I'd like to thank all noble Lords who've spoken in this um, debate. Um, and my Lords, the overriding purpose of this bill is to ensure that Parliament's sovereign view that Rwanda is a safe country is accepted and interpreted by the courts to prevent legal challenge which seek to delay removals and prevent us from taking control of our borders. Uh, my noble friend Viscount Helsham's amendments 3 and 7 suggest that this legislation is replacing a judicial finding of fact. My Lords, the Government respects the decision of the Supreme Court in its judgment. However, the judgment was based on information provided to the court on Rwanda up until the summer of 2022, and their lordships recognised, explicitly and in terms, that those deficiencies could be addressed in the future. In response, the Home Secretary signed a new internationally binding treaty between the United Kingdom and the government of Rwanda, which responds to and resolves the concerns raised by the court. Alongside this treaty, the Government have also introduced this bill, the Safety of Rwanda Asylum and Immigration Bill, which buttresses the treaty and supports the relocation of a person to Rwanda under the Immigration Acts. My Lords, it's our view that Parliament and the Government are appropriately equipped to address the sensitive policy issues involved in this legislation and ultimately tackling the major global challenge of illegal migration. 
Amendments 1, 2, 5 and 34, tabled by the noble lady Baroness Chakrabarti, seek to include a second purpose to this bill, which is to ensure compliance with the rule of law by requiring positive UNHCR advice on the safety of Rwanda to be laid before Parliament before individuals can be removed to Rwanda. It also provides the UNHCR, requires the UNHCR to consult with international experts before providing the advice to the Government and Secretary of State. We consider that the terms of the treaty, which have been carefully agreed with the Government of Rwanda and will be binding in international law, to be sufficient to ensure that those relocated under the partnership will be offered safety and protection with no risk of refoulement. The Government has conducted its own assessment as to the safety of Rwanda, reflected in the published policy statement and the comprehensive supporting evidence, including two detailed country information notes and accompanying, accompanying annexes, which have been published online. This evidence draws on a wide range of sources in addition to the institutional expertise of the Home Office, the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office as experts on the bilateral relationship between the UK and Rwanda. Indeed, Annex 2 to the Country Information Notes is comprised entirely of UNHCR evidence, which has already been factored into the Government's assessment. It is also the Government's understanding that the UNHCR has not been consulted or worked with peers on this or these amendments and it's unclear what is meant by international experts or who bears the cost of such, such consultation. The provisions in the bill that prevent challenge on the grounds that Rwanda is not a safe country generally reflect the government's, government's confidence in the assurances of the treaty and in Rwanda's commitment and capability to deliver against these obligations. As I've set out, the Home Office has reviewed a wide range of sources, including evidence from the UNHCR, via an established process for assessing country safety. This is therefore the most appropriate ass assessment on which to rely. It would not be right for our ability to deliver this policy, which is key to our commitment to stop the boats, to be left solely dependent on a further independent assessment by an external body like UNHCR, who, we further note, has not been consulted or worked with peers on these amendments. My noble friend, give way. On that point, would he consider a domestic assessor? like, for example, the Joint Committee of Human Rights, if they were to advise, would he accept that? It's one of the groups that we're coming on to um, looks at the, uh, the uh, organisations and committees that are set up under the um, treaty. So I think we will return to that um, discussion as to the provisions of the treaty in respect to what my noble friend has just asked. Um, it would not be right, as I say, uh, to deliver our policy, which is key to our commitment to stop the boats, to be left solely dependent on this. Um, but, my laws, I'll turn now to Amendments 11 and 12, and 12 which were tabled by the noble Lord, Lord German, uh, which seeks to ensure that individuals who are relocated to Rwanda must have any asylum claim determined and be treated in accordance with the UK's international obligations. My laws, this is unnecessary in view of the comprehensive arrangements that we have in place with the government of Rwanda. It is important to remember that Rwanda is a country that cares deeply about supporting refugees. It works already with the UNHCR and hosts more than 135,000 refugees and asylum seekers, and it stands ready to relocate people and help them rebuild their lives. Um, we will get again on to this in a, in a later group, but perhaps, my lords, I should just remind the House that the UNHCR has signed an agreement with the Government of Rwanda and the African Union to continue the operations of the Emergency Transit Mechanism Centre in Rwanda, which the EU, EU financially supports, having recently announced a further €22 million uh, Euros in support, uh, support package for, for it. And indeed, as, late, as recently as late December, the UNHCR evacuated 153 asylum seekers from Lib Libya to Rwanda. Now, the noble lady Baroness Hamwe asked about uh, the international agreements um, that Rwanda has signed, and that is dealt with at paragraph 25 of the policy statement. And I'll read it for convenience. Rwanda is a signatory to key international agreements protecting the rights of refugees and those in need of international protection. It acceded to the Refugee Convention, as well as the 1967 Protocol in 1980. In 2006, it acceded to the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons and the 1961 Conventions on the Reduction of Statelessness. Regionally, it is a signatory of the Organization of African Unity Convention on Refugees in Africa and the 2012 Kampala Convention. 
Paragraph 26 goes on to say Rwanda's obligations under these international agreements are embedded in its domestic legal provisions. The Rwandan constitution ensures international agreements Rwanda has ratified become domestic law in Rwanda. Article 28 of the constitution recognises the right of the refugees to seek asylum in Rwanda. So, my lords, the presumption which appears to underpin this amendment is that Rwanda isn't capable of making good decisions and is somehow not committed to this partnership. My lords, I disagree with that. Rwandans, perhaps more than most countries, understand the importance of providing protection to those who are needing it. And my lords, I think um, I would remind the House that my noble friend Baroness Verma spoke very powerfully on this particular subject during the second reading. My lords, the core of this bill and the government's priority is to break the business model of the people smugglers. That will not happen if we undermine the central tenet of the bill, which is the effect of these amendments. And a point that was well addressed by my noble friend Lord Howard. We are a parliamentary democracy, and that means that Parliament is sovereign. Parliament itself is truly accountable, and I would therefore invite the noble Lady Baroness Char Chakrabarti to withdraw her amendment. Lord, could I ask him one question? If one looks at the bill, and you have clause 1, 2, B, which says that Rwanda is a safe country, why is clause 1, 3 necessary? <laughs> My Lords, I'm sorry, I had to uh, just confirm that uh, paragraph 13 is just a simple restatement of the various facts of the Bill. Well, the Noble Lord sits down. <coughs> He's rather disappointed me because he declined totally to address any of the points that Your Lordship's House voted for uh, some nearly two weeks ago, uh, and in particular the ten criteria by which it would be possible to judge whether the government's statement that Rwanda was a safe place was actually true or not. Could he perhaps now stand up and answer those, deal with those 10 criteria? Because it would be quite interesting for the House to have his account of the government's view of those criteria and whether they have been met and if they haven't been met, when they will be met and what tests they will put them to. Superb. <laughs> well, my lords, this is committee, and I'm answering um, or I'm speaking to the various amendments in this particular group. We get to another group which did debates, as I, I've just um, uh, reminded the noble, uh, my noble friend uh, Viscount Hel Helsham, which debates the, the uh, clauses in the treaty um, as regards uh, the various committees and so on that are in place um, later in, in the day. I know it's very boring, but could I ask the minister if he can respond to my question about the legal status? The effect of clause one. I'm still not clear what attention we should pay to it in a, in, in a were we to be in very formal proceedings rather than debating the, um, the situation broadly. In other words, if there is a breach of, of I don't know whether it can be called a breach of clause one. Um, but if, if um, um, there is no compliance with Clause 1, then what in formal legal terms? It's simply the introduction to the Bill, so I'm not entirely sure I get the drift of the Noble Lady's question. Can you say whether he will formally be responding to the Joint Committee on Human Rights, especially before we reach report stage? Um, I would say to the Noble Lord, I haven't yet had a chance to read the report, which I believe was only published today, um, but I will, of course, be reading it in due course and responding accordingly. The Minister uh, seems to rely on the emergency transit mechanism that uh, Rwanda works with the UNHCR on. Um, can he confirm that that mechanism has a maximum capacity of 700, is a temporary processing point for asylum seekers from Libya? and that none of the 1,453 evacuated to Rwanda have actually opted to stay in the country? Um, I don't rely on that at all. As I tried to explain during the course of my speech, there are a variety of aspects of the UNHCR's work which are included into our safety assessment. That is just one of them. I apologise for interrupting. 
because uh, I know my noble friend wants to sit down and sit down for good. But um, when he was speaking to clause one, two, little b, was he speaking for Parliament or for the government? As my noble friend is aware, I speak for the government. Uh, could the noble lord give an indication as to when the government will respond to the Constitution Committee of this House's report on the bill? Um, I'm afraid I don't know. I will find out. Write to me with the answer. Though. Thank you. <laughs> Any more? No. Um, um, I am so grateful to all members of the committee from around the House uh, for the uh, constructive manner um, and tone um, with which um, these proceedings have been conducted um, over the first group. Um, Noble Lords will forgive me if I don't, um, if I don't mention every um, excellent contribution. They will understand that's, only, that's not a discourtesy to, to members of the committee, but hopefully a bit of kindness to those who have amendments to follow this evening. Um, it, um, I, I'm particularly grateful, actually, to the, to, to the um, Noble Lord, Lord Howard of Limp, for, hit, for following immediately, because he was able to crystallise some key, some key issues between us um, in relation to... Um, uh, my suite of amendments in particular, but all the amendments in, in, in the first group. And I think he essentially had two points. Um, one which I um, can embrace to some extent, and the, and the other um, I can't. And I think he was the first to point out that um, in, in the way that I've formulated my suite of amendments, I've given perhaps too much, determina uh, too determinative a role um, for, for, the, uh, for the UNHCR. Um, I explained the reason for that by way of a probe. It, it was because the Prime Minister said he was going to assuage the concerns of the Supreme Court. But nonetheless, I take the noble, um, the noble Lord's uh, point, which was, ro which was echoed by sub subsequent speeches, if less robustly. And so I would not, um, uh, at the next stage in proceedings, um, hope to, to create a determinative role uh, for the UNHCR, though I also note that many members of the committee, including um, the noble lord, the minister himself, did refer to the, the important part that the UNHCR plays in the world um, in, um, in regard to refugees and the convention. However, the second uh, crucial point... ..to the point where she disagrees with me, <laughs> um, may I thank her for her response to uh, the first point uh, which I made. Um, of course, I don't speak for the government, uh, but no doubt we will consider the matter further when we get to report. I'm once more grateful to, to the <laughs> noble lord. However, however, um, his second central point was the big con was really the big constitutional one, which is that Parliament is sovereign, and that's pretty much it, and that the Supreme Court's decision of the 15th of November was mere opinion rather than um, a de determinative finding of fact in our, in our system. I have to disagree with him, I'm afraid, yeah, yeah. about yeah, yeah. that, um, because f for essentially for the reasons outlined later um, in the debate by my noble and learned friend, um, uh, Lord Faulkner, and, and he in turn actually echoed some of the points made uh, by uh, the noble Lord <coughs> Clerk of Nottingham at second reading about the dangers that lie if it is going to be possible in the future in our country um, for governments with large majorities, say, of whatever stripe, to, um, to use legislation to change, not just change any old finding of fact, but to change a finding of fact that was made recently by our highest court. That is, that is um, not just silly uh, to echo, it is silly, um, um, to echo the noble and learned Lord Garnier, but it's, it's very dangerous as well in a democracy that is built fundamentally and first upon uh, the rule of law. Parliamentary sovereignty follows, but Parliament and, and the executive in particular has to have a little, a little bit of respect for the independent referees of our democratic uh, system. I was so grateful to the, um, the, the, the noble uh, lady, Lady Hellich, for making the international point that follows from that. 
which is that the domestic rule of law is a bedrock of our system, but so a quarter of the way into the 21st century is the international rule of law. And all sorts of terrible consequences um, come when we don't respect that. And she cited wars of aggression, war crimes that in turn drive the dis displacement of people that is leading to the refugee crisis that governments around the world are trying to uh, res respond to. And therefore, she, she's a great proponent, and we know this from her other work, a great proponent of the international rules-based order. I was also very grateful to um, the Right Reverend Prelate for speaking on behalf of, of, of his benches, the Bishop of Southwark, who reminded us of our duty of care to, to refugees. Um, like, like me, he's uncomfortable, the church is very uncomfortable with offshoring at all, but nonetheless uh, is engaging with this process, not a wrecking process, but a constitutional compromise, um, in the spirit with which I've been trying to address um, the noble Lord Howard's um, objections. And I was therefore also grateful to the noble Lord Hannay for saying what ultimately is the government's problem? Well, what we're really trying to do is to make sure there will be further factual assessments to meet, for example, the tests of your Lordship's International Agreements Committee to make sure that R Rwanda has become safe per the terms of the treaty before we deem it so not wrecking amendments, but an attempt um, to, to do our duty. Um, I have to say, of the, of the um, noble Viscount Hailsham's uh, contribution, um, I, it, I hope he won't be cross with me for, for suggesting that he has really done his father proud today. Um, because that famous speech that so many of us read as students about the elective dictatorship was really in itself an answer to his noble friend, Lord Howard, though that was in the 1970s, I think 1976, because Parliament is not just the House of Commons. Whether we like it or not, whether we would all vote ourselves out of business, Parliament is both houses in the current system. And, and Parliament is not interchangeable with the government of the day, however large its majority. Um, we do have to have checks and balances, and at the moment, in our system, for all our defects um, in your Lordship's House, we are one House of Parliament, and Parliament is not interchangeable with government. Um, and, um, and facts, he, he went on to, to talk about how facts must be examined by due process of law, um, and he rightly, I think, flagged future, and I know this might irritate the noble Lord, the Minister, but he was right to flag future uh, uh, groups of amendments because they're all so interchangeable in the scheme of what is a very short bill um, but, a, but a hugely controversial one. And so if it isn't to be the UNHCR, there has to be some other process of examining the facts on the ground before Parliament just signs up with the government of the day and says dogs are cats. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's what I, I, I say to, to, to the noble Lord, Lord Garnier um, as well. Um, I think most members of the committee would, if not all, would agree that the noble Lord, Lord Tugendhat's contribution was an incredibly powerful and, if I may say, poignant one. Uh, and, and I repeat points at second reading, this is a very unconservative bill. Whatever one thought of the late Lady Thatcher, she was, on her own case, committed to the domestic and international rule of law, despite controversial poli politics that, that we would find controversial on our benches, she was committed to the rule of law, and those who served her as attorneys general um, said that that was their experience too. Um, I, I, I think that my noble friend, uh, Lord Faulkner of Thoroton, um, represented the Constitution Committee um, with, with great precision and, and, and not a bit of passion um, as well. He spoke of the 70-year commitment that this country has had to non-reform, which I think many of us now believe is part of customary international law <coughs> rather than just one treaty or another. He, um, he echoed uh, Your Lordship's International Agreements Committee that there is a lot more that needs to be done before the Rwanda Treaty can be the safeguard that the government relies on. And that is a lot of change, a lot of administrative and cultural change on the ground that doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight in our own home office, let alone in the Republic of Rwanda. 
Um, I was grateful also to the noble Lord Lord Alton for representing the Joint Committee on Human Rights with its own um, similar and further um, criticisms of the bill in its current form and his response to my noble friend um, Lady Ritchie of Downpatrick was important in acknowledging the violence that we, that we may be doing to that precious settlement in Northern Ireland every time, every time we violate international law, the ECHR in particular. I was particularly grateful to the noble Lord, Lord Horam, for the way in which he engaged, um, similarly to, to, to the manner that Lord, Lord Howard engaged, and, and also um, with his rather honest reflection that we have unsatisfactory uh, safe legal routes to this country at the moment. And, and this bill doesn't, doesn't address uh, any of that. And he said he would like to prioritise refugees over economic migrants. And I, I listened to his comments carefully. Um, I think I may have dealt with uh, the concerns of uh, Lord Kerr of Kinlochard in what I say about the, 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 the ECHR. To my noble friend, Lord Coker, I am so grateful for his support for the broad thrust of this suite of amendments. And in particular, it is so comforting to know that any incumbent Labour government will be committed to the international and domestic rule of law. And so I finally say to the Minister, if the Rwanda Treaty is, as he said, binding and sufficient, wasn't, wasn't the Refugee Convention of 1951 binding and sufficient as well? It's a slightly circular argument to rely on one and not so much on the other. We are not traducing um, Rwanda, my lords. We are just honouring the recommendations of committees of this House and of our Supreme Court, which is why we must have on the face of the bill a commitment to compliance with the law. We must substitute is with may become safe, because that is, a, that is the truth. We must have some kind of independent fact-finding assessment before we say that Rwanda is um, safe. Safety must only be a rebuttable presumption, uh, as in keeping with prior statutes, including conservative asylum statutes. And the courts must not be ousted from their proper role that is fact-finding and rights-protecting in our constitution. Um, but for the moment, my lords, I beg to withdraw my amendment. Yeah. Is it your lordship's pleasure the amendment be withdrawn? The amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendments 2 and 3, Baroness Chakrabarty, not moved? Not moved? Amendment 4, the Lord German, not moved. Amendment 5, Baroness Chakrabarty, not moved. <laughs> Amendment 6, the Lord Hope of Craighead. Oh, sorry, I... Do you, wish, do you wish to speak to Amendment 4, Lord German? Put in the next Yes. Four. Yes. <laughs> I thought you, uh, my apologies to my Lords. So I thought I was referring to the amendments in the first group. Uh, I am now speaking to Amendment 4 and also to a suite of amendments which go right throughout this Bill, and perhaps it indicates the nature of the way in which all these things are interconnected, uh, because these uh, suite of amendments will deal with a lot of the concerns which have been raised in this House in the course of Group 1 and will be relevant to any changes that we might presume, uh, pursue in report stage. First of all, the suite of amendments, in, in summary, remove the absolute nature of the declaration that Rwanda is safe. They enable the courts to consider the safety issue. They require the Secretary of State and not Parliament to judge when Rwanda is safe and ensures that all the measures this House has considered in its resolution of the treaty to be operational and functioning according to our, op our international obligations before the Secretary of State can lay a commencement order before Parliament. My Lords, this Bill, as we have heard, deems Rwanda to be safe, regardless of whether it is a, in fact safe, and this House has already determined that it is not yet safe. Unlike the use of deeming clauses in domestic legislation, this deeming subclause is being used alongside an international obligation. 
which, as the Bar Council and as evidence to the JCHR, among others, points out, uh, deeming Rwanda to be safe in order to meet the UK's international obligations under the ECHR and the Refugee Convention steps outside the domestic use of deeming clauses. And this is particularly so when you take into account the conclusions reached by the UNHCR that this bill and the treaty, and I quote, does not meet the required standards relating to the legality and appropriateness of the transfer of asylum seekers and is not compatible with international refugee law. Uh, and if the arguments which the government puts forward uh, about it being uh, um, a, a, a in, con in context of the international laws, then why don't they let the courts have their say finally about this matter? Now, there are some on the government side who are comfortable about overriding our international obligations, maintaining that it is perfectly acceptable to be incompatible with international rules, laws, commitments and obligations of which we are part. But, my Lords, I'm not a lawyer, but having read all the evidence to committees of this House, of the other House and of all the, the, the people who have put the evidence before us, they are a minority, it seems, of legal opinion. And we have witnessed incredible displays of legal acrobatics, most of it on the head of a pin. But fundamentally, my Lords, based on Article 27 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, no rule of a state's internal law can be used to justify a breach of an international obligation. And further, as our own Constitution Committee states, to legislate in this way could undermine our constitutional principle of the rule of law. And separately, back in 2020, and again recently, said, respect for the rule of law requires respect for international law. And today, we have that view expressed by the report of the JCHR. We will hear much more on the rule of law and the words of Dicey, but this suite of amendments, taken as a whole, will ensure adherence to the rule of law, reinstate the role of the courts, protect human rights, and meet our international obligations. Fundamentally, these amendments seek to safeguard and uphold the UK's constitution and the rule of law. It's deeply problematic that the terms of the UK-Rwanda agreement have not yet been met, especially as the government has deemed it as the basis for the declaration in this bill that Rwanda in, is in fact safe. And in fact, in their own policy statement, they're called, and the government says they're assurances and commitments. Assurances and commitments, my lords, are not things which are happening at this moment. So through these amendments, we are seeking to ensure that the final arbiter on the safety of Rwanda ultimately lies with the judiciary and not with Parliament. The Secretary of State would come to a decision on the safety of Rwanda, but the legality of this decision can, however, be reviewed by the judiciary. This enables the proper role of the independent judiciary of our domestic courts and tribunals to review the legality of the Secretary of State's actions and decisions. The amendments in this suite would mean that the Secretary of State should only deem Rwanda safe if it is safe for every person of every description – women, ethnic minorities, religion, LBTQI+, those in power, those whose political opinion differ, differs from those in power, every nationality. In coming to their conclusion, the laws of Rwanda and how they are applied should be scrutinised together with evidence from international bodies and civil society organisations. Only when the steps set out in Amendment 84, of which the Noble Lord the Minister spoke earlier, and that we've reached them already, Amendment 84 have been met, could the Act come into force? So in replying, can the Noble the Minister tell the House, I think it was Lord Hanney's question as well, which of the matters listed in Amendment 84.1c are currently in place, which are the ones which will be in place soon, and which, one of them, which ones of them will be operational on the date they think this bill will be enacted? And for those who've got the 84.1c in front of you, it is the 10 issues raised by the uh, committee which reported to this House on the treaty. And as this House has determined in its resolution on the treaty, 
It is critically important for the safety of those concerned that any assessment of safety is completed before this Act comes into force. The judgment about whether Rwanda is safe could be one of life and death. The Supreme Court has already made a factual assessment. Parliament should not be legislating to reverse the Supreme Court's factual assessment and at the same time tying the hands of the judiciary and one moment I'll finish the sentence if I may and requiring them to ignore facts placed okay. before them. I did say uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 he should have sat down. Thank you. Uh, I thank the noble lord for uh, giving way. Uh, he has said repeatedly that um, the Supreme Court has held as a fact that Rwanda is an unsafe country. If one looks at the judgment of the Supreme Court in paragraph 105, the noble lord will see that Lord Reid, the president of the Supreme Court, said that the Rwanda was unsafe uh, at the time that the divisional court was considering the evidence. And as my noble friend the minister said in the last group, uh, the short point is this. The question that this parliament is determining uh, as to the safety of Rwanda is in the light of the current new arrangements. Um, uh, the other clause that uh, the noble lord did not refer to in the, uh, in the Supreme Court judgment, of course, is that it will take a considerable time for those matters to take place. Yeah. And that is why I have asked the minister right then in this, in this chamber, and having heard the views of the Treaties Committee of this House, and having heard the matters which they raised, having taken evidence just in this last month, whether or not the items in, uh, in Amendment 841C are in place now. Are they operational? Which ones will be in place and by when? Because that is the judgment, if we follow the noble Lord's uh, remarks, that is the judgment we are trying to make now. It, Certainly. It's not only a question of whether they are in place, but whether Rwanda is compliant and remains compliant, and whether there are any other reasons to doubt the safety of Rwanda. Indeed, and that is why the, uh, in the uh, suite of amendments, the, the, the Secretary of State has to take the advice of a number of organisations, not one in particular, but a number of organisations. It has to produce the evidence to show that it is in place, it is operational, and it is working according to the de decisions that were originally in place as wanting to see this thing through. Um, the, yeah, sure. Is it right that what perhaps the noble lord had in mind when referring to the Supreme Court judgment was its words that it thought that the problems in Rwanda were not a lack of good faith on the part of Rwanda, but, quote, its practical ability to fulfil its assurances, at least in the short term, in the light of the present deficiencies of the Rwandan asylum system, the past and continuing practices of reformment, and the scale of the changes in procedure, understanding and culture which are required. And the noble Lord, Lord German, might also have had in mind that it, the Supreme Court that is, identified a culture within Rwanda of, at best, inadequate understanding of Rwanda's obligations under the Refugee Convention. And would it be the case that Lord German might have been also rather worried that simply entering into an agreement saying we won't refoul from a date which I assume would be about a, a month or two from today it sits rather unkindly against that assessment by the Supreme Court. But am I right in also saying that Lord <laughs> German would have been very heartened by Lord Sharp, who said he accepted all that the Supreme Court had said? <laughs> I, I, I'd love to uh, say yes to a, a leading question from a leading lawyer. However, he's absolutely right, of course. And for those words added to what I earlier said, and also paragraph 104, of the, uh, uh, of the, which, the, which we've ha already had referred to, uh, the necessary changes may not be straightforward, as they require an appreciation that the current approach is inadequate, a change of attitudes and effective training and monitoring. There are, uh, you know, if you read the Supreme Court judgment, you will know what we have to test in order to be able to prove its, uh, its safety. And that is what the committees of this House have been trying to do. So what this uh, group and suite of amendments does, of course, is it turns it all around. It says, it is the judgment of the, of the government, which they would have to bring forward an, an order for the House to accept. But it, before they do so, they'd have to address all the issues which are in Amendment 841C. 
They would also have to consult with and have to be certain that they have reached the case. And if, at the end, Parliament so approved what the government order that he put before it, then the courts could intervene and test it on the basis of fact. That seems to me to be what our current procedure is for dealing with issues of this sort. So it's what, I, you know, I'm loath to say it's, this is back to the future, but what this is, is keeping in track where we stand as a Parliament, how we make decisions and where those decisions are tested and where they can be tested in the courts. My Lords, we need to stand, uh, we, we, we can't allow a dangerous precedent to be set with this overreach of Parliament's role. The courts need to remain in check, the check and the balance on the exercise of the Secretary of State's power. And Parliament cannot be allowed to overturn the evidence-based findings of fact made by the highest court in the UK, given that at the present moment this bill does make, it, it is there forever. It is, a, it is not a bill which looks what, what happens in the future. So we need to stand firm against the government's attempt to subvert the separation of powers in this country. Today, this is about asylum seekers. Tomorrow, this precedent will be applied to the next group who find themselves in the, as the latest government scapegoat. I, I want to end with the words of a late noble Lord Judge in this chamber, and I was sitting here and listening to him, and I can remember them, and I hear them echoing in my head now. He said, the rule of law is a bulwark against authoritarian incursion, and even the smallest incursion threatens it. My Lords, those are wise words, and this suite of amendments seeks to uphold the principle he espoused so powerfully. I beg to move. Yeah, yeah. Amendment proposed, clause one, page one, line 11, leave out Parliament and insert the Secretary of State. I, I regret it I didn't able to take part in the previous discussion of the committee because I was on the train and it began. But my Lords, I think the point that's been made here is an important one and it wasn't one that I heard uh, elaborated on during the debate on the first grouping of the um, amendments because without wishing in any way to disparage uh, Rwanda, countries in that part of the world do have, it, have a habit from time to time of changing their regimes and those regimes often have very different characteristics. And if you are approaching this problem, which is, it seems to be entirely reasonable in all circumstances, that the, uh, the country where uh, the uh, asylum seekers may end up is one that should be safe, it doesn't follow that once it's been ruled to be safe, it then continues to be safe. And it seems to me that the problem with um, clause 1-2-B is that if it if the wording like that remains as it is now, even if you go through the procedures the Noble Lord, Lord German is discussing, once you've, it's, there's been a ruling that the country is safe, there is no means to return to the question if circumstances fundamentally and uh, damagingly change. I will finish this time. Perhaps I might commend to him the concept of the rolling sunset, therefore, <laughs> which you will find in Amendments 81 and 82 to this bill. Uh, very interested in the noble Lord, Lord German's amendment. On one view, what the amendment is saying is the Secretary of State makes his decision or her decision only after properly considering all the relevant factors, it may be that what he has in mind is that thereafter there can be appropriate review of that by the courts. And I assume that the noble Lord, Lord German, has in mind judicial review in relation to it. So it would be, it would be, it would be the decision of the Secretary of State that was judicially reviewable. I wonder if what's then envisaged by the noble Lord, Lord German, whether it is or whether it, is, it might be worth thinking about, that once that decision is made, and if it were upheld by the courts on the basis that there was a proper basis that a Secretary of State could reach that decision, then in general terms, the question of whether or not the country was safe would not thereafter be open to be considered by the Immigration Office. I wouldn't be in favour of that as a matter of principle, but if one's looking for a compromise, and it was something that the noble Lord, Lord Anderson of Ipswich touched upon, and it may be dealt with in later amendments. 
I would be very interested to hear what the view of the government was in relation to a situation where, in effect, the Secretary of State had to make a proper decision addressing the proper considerations, and that decision was then open to judicial review. Could that be a compromise? Lord, I hadn't intended to intervene in this debate, but the noble Lord, Lord Faulkner, has just raised an extremely interesting point, because what he has suggested is that a decision of the Secretary of State, in the light of the consideration of the factors to which the noble Lord, Lord German, has referred, should be subject to judicial review. Now, the principles of judicial review are clear. On judicial review, the court does not substitute its own view of matters. It assesses whether the Secretary of State came to a reasonable decision which he could have come to. One of the problems, and I'm straying and, and departing somewhat from the view of the government, one of the problems which I have with the decision of the Supreme Court is that the decision of the Supreme Court was not based on the principles of judicial review. The divisional court did approach it on that basis, and the Supreme Court said that was wrong. And the Supreme Court, relying on precedents which have never received the authority of Parliament or statute, decided that it shouldn't apply the principles of judicial review, but it should decide these matters for itself. That's a very important distinction between what happened in this case, in the case which gave rise to this legislation, and the procedure which is now being proposed by the noble Lord, Lord Faulkner. So I rise with some hesitancy in the middle of a rather technical debate, um, but I do have a couple of points on this particular group that I'd like to make. Um, and this committee has already heard from my noble friend, uh, Baroness Jones of Molscombe, who in her inimitable way made it very clear that the Green Party remains utterly opposed to this entire bill, and we greatly regret that we, are, we did indeed give it a second reading. But given we are where we are, um, listening to the first group of debates, uh, a word that kept coming up again and again, and I think might be surprising um, to people listening outside this committee, was the word silly. And of course, what we're talking about is absolutely deadly serious. But I think it's interesting if you look up the definitions of silly, as I did, um, which, one of which is showing a lack of common sense or judgment. And I think those two um, common sense and judgment are two things that this group of amendments actually seeks to introduce into the bill. Uh, and I commend the noble Lord, Lord German, um, uh, for introducing it so clearly, and indeed the noble Lord, Lord Faulkner, for his uh, excellent assistance in presenting the argument. Um, and I think um, it's a statement of the obvious that Parliament, as uh, your Lordship House certainly, as we voted on the Rwanda Treaty, um, this, what the bill states is not common sense, it's not based on the evidence, it is being disproved. But more than that, what this is saying is that there is a person being held responsible for making a judgment, which is the Secretary of State is by these amendments made responsible for making the judgment. And surely if we are going to have a rule of law, that has to be a person who's there going to be held responsible for making a judgment, a person identified as making that judgment. We're introducing a sense of responsibility here and a sense of evidence. And um, that would be a step forward, at least. My Lords, I raise uh, just briefly to support my noble friend, Lord, Lord Drum. Um, it's been a, a short debate in comparison with the first group, but I think that's uh, presumably because of those who had their second reading speeches all done in the first group, and then, uh, <laughs> and then now that's sufficient for them in the bill, so uh, we'll just have to go through the grind. Um, but nevertheless, interesting, and I, I want to pick up on the, the, the point that Noble Lord Howard had, had mentioned. Now, of course, the members of the Supreme Court are not here to answer questions, um, but my understanding is that the Supreme Court um, considered... Uh, whether the divisional court was correct 
in, feeling, in deciding whether ministers had carried out the incorrect process under law. Uh, but the Supreme Court made the view that the, the question to answer was whether or not issues of fact with regards to refoulement as to the origin of this course for the appeal was then to be determined. So that is why the Supreme Court made the decision that it did. And that is the relevant part. His question about judicial review, so I don't think that the relevant part of judicial review is the Supreme Court's judgment. I think that the relevant part for judicial review in this bill is that judicial reviews can no longer in future be carried out on ministers' decision, on any decision makers for their decisions of sending anybody or relocating anybody to Rwanda on process. That is now going to be um, uh, prohibited. Uh, and that is, if I may say so, a very major constitutional step, something which the Bingham Centre have, have warned against, many others, and I suspect we will hear that in other groups in this bill. So for me, that is the important part of judicial review. But the Lord, Lord, Lord Murray, who's, who's not in his place, even though he spoke in the, in the group, listening to the, to the closing speeches of the minister, or is he, may, maybe he's moved, I don't know. No, I don't see him. Um, the, he, met, he referenced uh, the Supreme Court in an intervention to my noble friend with regard to when the Supreme Court made its decision and whether that decision made could only be taken as a snapshot view of the position of Rwanda then, because that seems to be what the ministers have said. The minister, Lord Stewart, the Advocate General said it at second reading, the minister referred to it in the first part. This seems to be a fundamental part of the minister's case that the, you only, we can only look at the Supreme Court judgment in the context of the evidence that it took and the information that it took up to the point of its judgment. But we know, as my noble friend said, paragraph 104 of the Supreme Court judgment uh, said categorically and very clearly uh, that, I quote, the necessary changes may not be straightforward as they require an appreciation that the current approach is inadequate, a change of attitudes and effective training and monitoring. In paragraph 102 of its judgment, the scale of the changes in procedure, understanding and culture which are required. So the scale of the changes would be necessary as well as attitudes, effective training and uh, the current approach. But there has not been, as we know from the UNHCR report this January, that the UNHCR, which the Supreme Court gave considerable weight to, all of those factors are not in place still. And that was a major reason why this House declined to state that currently we are able to say that Rwanda is a safe country. So the Minister's case, if he is, um, when he's winding this group, if he is to persuade us that the Supreme Court's view should now, to some extent, be addressed because of the time lapse, it has to be evidenced what has happened between then and now. And that is what my noble friend is asking of the Minister, and I hope he's able to give a very clear, uh, detailed um, response with regards to Amendment 84. Because what Amendment 84 does is lay out the 10 areas which had been identified by a committee of this House, uh, which have, um, uh, of those areas, um, relating to what needs to be done before we might consider if Rwanda is a safe country. And at this point, I want to raise the, the, the challenge that I've got about the we here. Because the we here is Parliament, not the executive. The legislature, not the executive. And making a determination about a relocation, or indeed of a safe country. Now, we know that it's been fairly long practice for there to be lists of countries of which someone could be relocated to. It's either because we have a relocation or resettlement agreement, it's where or where the ministers have stated uh, in secondary legislation, of which subsequently has either not been vetoed or been approved, approved by Parliament, uh, that, a country, that a, an individual may be uh, sent back to. Uh, sometimes that's under a voluntary scheme, or that could be a forced removal. Um, that is a long-standing practice. Um, it's hard. 
It's difficult, it's controversial, but there's consensus that we have that approach. That is a world away, a system where you have a, an executive stating that they would consider a country to be safe, approved by parliament, and then can be judicially reviewed. We are now a world away from that when it comes to uniquely one country of Rwanda, uniquely. It's kind of a reverse, um, reverse um, Keynes, isn't it? When the, when, if, I change my, if the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Well, it seems as if ministers have changed their mind, so they want to change the facts. So what are we going to do now? Um, well, I don't think we should approve it, because we will now be, on the statute book, unique amongst our legislation to have legislated in perpetuity in a primary legislation that are defining a country's asylum procedures uh, in accordance with our standards. That if they change them in any way, we would have to change statute in this country to follow what they do. With my, with the noble of course I'll give it to the noble I, I know I'm going slightly outside the ordering of clauses. But if you would look at Amendments 81 and 82 to Clause 9, that addresses this very difficulty which the Noble Lord has identified. Circumstances can and almost certainly will change. What we need to put in place is rolling sunsets. So a, this bill is never in force for more than, say, two years. And at each time that it is extended, there is a proper assessment of the safety of Rwanda, its compliance with treaties, and incidentally, whether the policy itself is succeeding. I'm grateful for the Honourable Viscount, and I, 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 I listened carefully to what he said, and, and including at second reading, and, and when he comes to make the case, I'll also listen very carefully for that. Um, if he forgives me for saying so, I th uh, we will be into the, the, the kind of the categories of Plan C, D, E, and F to try and make this bill a bit better. I think this is the referred to the noble Lord Kerr in the first group. These are all um, silk purse amendments, aren't they? We are tr desperately trying to make something that we, in our hearts, know can't be better. We're trying to just take the rough edges off it slightly. Our approach in this group is to revert this bill to long-standing common practice for asylum laws, laws which ministers, for regular ministers on those benches, uh, have said is the proper procedure because it includes executive decision-making, parliamentary approval, and then judicial review. Uh, that is what we see, that is what we are saying should be the case because that's what ministers have said for us for years is the case and that's what we're seeking to restore. The mechanism on the, and, the def, and the reason why 84 is amendment is because it um, re requires ministers to report on these areas. Uh, I wrote to uh, the Foreign Secretary in December asking a whole series of questions regarding the treaty. Um, the, the minister, Lord Sharp, gave me the courtesy of a very substantive re reply, and I'm very grateful for it. I asked questions specifically about when some of the mechanisms of the treaty would be in operation. Uh, for example, uh, on capacity with regards to uh, the decision-making processes um, in Rwanda for us to determine whether or not they would have the capacity and it would therefore be able to be safe. The minister replied, I quote, some of the newer, mecha some of the newer mechanisms will be finalised before operationalisation. So I want to know when. The government clearly is working on it. They must have a working assumption of when they're going to be the place. So tell us, because if the government's saying we are the determining body, tell us when those procedures will be in place. Because the government can't have it both ways. They can't say that we are the determining body, but they have the information. That doesn't cut it anymore. If we're the determining body, we have to have the information. It's why I asked about when the judges will be in place, because, because under the treaty there will be judges who are not Rwandan nationals uh, who will have to be trained on Rwandan law, not UK, Rwandan law, because uh, the Lord, noble Lord, Lord Horam, he's not in his place, he was completely wrong in the first group about this uh, being similar to the Australian processes. Uh, these, pe these people who are going to be relocated will be, will be processed under Rwandan law, not under British law, so the judges will have to be trained on it. Non-Rwandan judges will be trained on it under the treaty. So I asked when that, would be ha when that would be complete, because obviously we're not going to relocate an individual where there would be a panel of judges who are not trained sufficiently on Rwandan law to process them. I'm sure everybody would agree with that. So the minister replied to me, 
the proper procedures, facilities and support for re relocated individuals uh, with regards to the judges' training will be in place before they are relocated to Rwanda. Will be in place before relocations. But the Prime Minister, obviously, when he bet with Piers Morgan that the flights would be leaving, he obviously <coughs> knows when the, the judges will be trained. So when will they be trained? What is the working assumption of when they'll be trained? Uh, I'm desperately trying to not make this a complete um, silk purse exercise. The final thing I would say, um, where we fully are in Alice in Wonderland situation, the minister in the earlier group said, because things have changed, we now should look at the new country note. So the new country policy and information note, version 2, and now version 2.1 in January, that's what he was referring to. That supersedes the summer of 2022 country note. Uh, so the minister is saying that old note shouldn't be taken into consideration because there's a new note. And if we wanted to refer to what the position of the UNHCR was uh, up to date, then we should, as the minister said in the first group, we heard him, we need to look at Annex 2 of that report. Not only have I read front to end the country policy notes, I also clicked on the links in the policy note of Annex 2. Anybody can do it now on their smartphones. Click on the link. What comes up is a box saying this publication was withdrawn on the 11th of December 2023. Uh, uh, the publication that was the minister referred to, which was withdrawn, withdrawn, was from May 2022, which the Supreme Court used as its evidence for UNHCR. So how on earth, if we are going to be the decision-making body, going to be making decisions when the government doesn't tell us even the basic information of when it thinks Rwanda will be a safe country, not us. Uh, my Lords, um, as uh, the noble Lord, Lord German said, um, there, there is a suite of amendments here in this group which in, in many ways is uh, covering the same uh, ground as in, and, as in Group 1. Um, and it's clear from this short debate, as well as the Group 1 debate, that uh, the House and the Committee uh, wishes to approach this bill by ensuring that the terms of the treaty are being uh, properly ad adhered to. And we're, essentially, we're debating that mechanism. Uh, this debate on how best to do this will d dominate really the whole of committee stage. And I hope the colleagues can work together to return uh, the best possible solution on this issue. Uh, my Lords, for the opposition, in the same way that we would not wish to delay the passage of this bill, um, it, we would not want to create uh, barriers for the scheme to start. Our focus should be on how we monitor and judge the safety of Rwanda, who monitors it, and what should happen if Rwanda is judged not to be a safe country for those being removed to it. Uh, the noble Lord, Lord German, on introducing uh, his amendments, um, he, his amendments 4 and 17 um, said that the, um, the, there shouldn't be a commencement of the Act until Rwanda is deemed uh, a safe country. And then he spoke at, a number of noble lords have spoken at length to amendment 84, 1 bracket C, which are the 10 issues uh, raised by the committee of this House about how that might be achieved. And as the noble lord uh, said, um, it was really looking at um, how that might be done, in, uh, how many of those elements are in place, uh, which are operational, and, and perhaps more fundamentally, whether Rwanda has the practical ability to fulfill uh, the undertakings on a, on a more long-term uh, uh, in, in, in a more long-term way, and that's really the point which the noble Lord, Lord Inglewood made on his brief, into, in, in, uh, brief contribution to this uh, group. Um, my noble uh, friend Lord Faulkner uh, uh, speculated that the Secretary of State uh, could, uh, after making a decision, could be open to uh, judicial review, and the noble Lord, Lord Howard, um, um, said that um, the Supreme Court didn't use the principles of ju judicial review when it made its decision, but decided to uh, decide the case on 
first principles. Now, my lords, the, both noble lords are well above my grade in, in legal matters, um, but, it, but it did seem to me that this may be another uh, example of possi possible compromise as we move forward, as there, as there were possible areas of compromise discussed uh, within Group 1. Uh, my Lords, uh, the noble Lord, Lord Purvis of Tweed, um, gave his customarily extremely articulate uh, speech on the various provisions within uh, Amendment uh, 84.1c. And uh, to use his, fra his phrase, he, he spoke of making a silk purse out of a sow's ear and, 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 and went through various ways that might be achieved, although he made his reluctance to do that uh, very clear. And the noble Viscount uh, Lord Helsham spoke about his amendments 82 and 84, which we're getting to in a subsequent group. Ah, okay. 81, 81 and 82, I beg his pardon on the, the rolling sunsets as he described them. And um, so, so really, this whole group is, is, is trying to uh, make sure the government is properly held to account. Uh, as I said in my introduction, our focus be, will be on how to monitor and judge the safety of Rwanda, who monitors it, what Parliament's role is in that, rather than putting up a barrier against the bill itself. My Lords, I'm grateful to all noble Lords who've contributed to this debate, in particular to Lord German for opening, uh, and I acknowledge the uh, spirit across the House uh, of approaching this matter uh, as a matter of uh, looking to see what can be amended uh, and not setting out uh, to wreck the bill, as indeed Baroness Chakrabarti said in opening uh, in Group 1. Let me intervene for a moment. I would like to wreck the bill, just say no. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do accept, and I did hear the noble lady make that point uh, from the benches opposite. Uh, my Lord, since summer 2022, uh, when judicial review proceedings in relation to the Migration and Economic Development Partnership began, uh, the United Kingdom and the government of Rwanda have worked to refine and improve that uh, partnership. And this has not only strengthened the operational readiness of Rwanda to receive and support migrants relocated under the partnership, but also the legal footing of the agreement and the commitments both sides undertake to ensure national and international obligations and standards are met, having scrutinised closely and carefully all the circumstances of the country uh, and information from appropriate sources. Rwanda has a long history of supporting and integrating asylum seekers and refugees in the region. It's also been recognised internationally for its general safety and stability, strong government, low corruption and gender equality. Uh, my Lords, I quote uh, from the Kigali-based Comprehensive Refugee Response Officer, Nayana Bose uh, of the UNHCR, uh, when she said in December 2021, 2021, my laws mark the date, Rwanda has done an excellent job integrating refugees into the national education system, including urban refugees in the national community-based health insurance plan, providing them with national ID cards and offering them livelihood opportunities. My lords, as the uh, committee is aware, uh, the bill is uh, a matter which is underpinned uh, by the treaty and Article 10 of the treaty in particular sets out the assurances for the treatment of relocated individuals in Rwanda, including abiding by the Refugee Convention in relation to those seeking asylum. Furthermore, pursuant to Article 3 of the treaty, the parties agree that the obligations therein shall be met in respect of all relocated individuals, regardless of their nationality and without discrimination. Under this commitment, Rwanda will treat all groups of people fairly. We have assurances from the government of Rwanda uh, that implementation of measures within the treaty will be expedited. The treaty will follow the usual process with regards to scrutiny and ratification. And I note uh, amendments tabled by noble lords on this topic uh, are to be debated in the group to follow. Uh, my lords, amendment 17 would also oblige the Secretary of State to consider only, or only consider Rwanda safe if it was uh, deemed so for every descriptive person 
as set out in Section 3 of the Illegal Migration Act. On relocating individuals to Rwanda, decision makers will make a case-by-case -case decision about whether there is compelling evidence that the specific, the um, particular circumstances of each case uh, would mean that an individual would be at risk of serious and irreversible harm were they to be relocated to Rwanda. <laughs> My Lords, this means that each person's circumstances are considered before relocation and we consider therefore that this amendment is unnecessary. Amendments 24 and 27 are in relation to the rules of courts and tribunals. It is important that we recognise that these are considered decision makers in relation to relocating individuals to Rwanda and they may have a say in this. Amendment 27 in particular would place an obligation on courts and tribunals to consider any claim that Rwanda may breach its international obligations by removing an individual to a country that was unsafe for them, to consider any claim that an individual may not receive fair and proper consideration of their asylum claim, and that Rwanda will not act in accordance with the terms of the treaty. My Lords, this obligation is unnecessary. Rwanda is as committed to this partnership as we are. We have worked closely together to build this partnership and have trust that the commitments in the treaty will be upheld. And that is why we have introduced this bill, which reflects the strength of the government of Rwanda's protections and commitments given in the treaty, allowing Parliament to confirm the status of the Republic of Rwanda as a safe third country. Now, the noble and learned Lord, Lord Faulkner of Thoroton, in his intervention, and I speak to his later intervention rather than when he was assisting the noble Lord German uh, with uh, legal analysis uh, and intervening, he referred to the possibility of judicial review and uh, posed the question uh, of whether that might be applicable, a point which my noble and learned friend Lord Howard of, Lim took up, of Limney took up as well. Now, my lords, in relation to that aspect of matters, uh, I'd refer the noble lords to uh, the terms of Article 22 uh, of the treaty, um, which uh, provides that uh, in the event of a dispute arising out of or relating to this agreement, including any question regarding its existence, validity, termination, interpretation or implementation, the parties shall refer the dispute to the Joint Committee, which shall meet within 14 working days to discuss and seek resolution of the dispute by consultation. Now, my Lord, the, therefore the process by which uh, matters will be addressed if some uh, there is some shock to the operation of the system once it is operational is set out in terms of the treaty and therefore operates uh, on the level between the two countries. I'm very grateful to the noble and learned Lord for answering the question. I'm not sure that does answer the point. Suppose the position were that the UK was saying that you haven't implemented it properly. The effect of this act would be nevertheless the minister and every single deciding body would have to decide that, you, that Rwanda was a safe country. So I'm not quite sure how Article 22 responds to the suggestion that I think the noble Lord Lord German is making in his amendment that judicial review should be available, albeit, as the noble Lord Lord Howard of Limp said, it would be the decision of the Secretary of State as to whether or not it was a safe country. So could the noble Lord address that suggestion? Yes, uh, my Lord, sir, in relation to the operation of the treaty during its currency then, uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, there is in place a monitoring committee which examines these things on a going forward basis uh, and keeps them under supervision and reports back. <clears throat> My Lords, uh, in preparation for the, uh, or oh, I do beg your Lordship's pardon, I'm taking uh, matters out of their natural order. Uh, My Lords, Annex B of the treaty also sets out uh, that claims, uh, the claims process for relocated individuals and how they will be treated. It sets out um, clearly that members of the first instance body who will make decisions on asylum and humanitarian protection claims shall make such decisions impartially, solely on the basis of evidence before them and by reference to the provisions and principles of the Refugee Convention and Humanitarian Protection Law. My Lords, in preparation for the potential relocation of individuals, officials in the United Kingdom have worked together with Rwandan officials to develop and commence operational training for Rwandan asylum decision makers. 
most recently, uh, Home Office technical experts in collaboration with the Institute of Legal Practice and Development delivered a training course aimed at asylum decision makers in Rwanda. Might tell us how long the course was for and how many people were training and where they were from? Well, the noble lord won't be especially surprised, I think, to hear that I haven't got those facts to hand. Uh, but I, I will uh, undertake on behalf of the relevant department uh, to communicate with him in writing uh, on that topic. My Lords, the uh, course focused on applying refugee law in asylum interviews and decision making. Way. The UN has, um, uh, has um, reported on the treaty and the deficiencies that the Supreme Court gave. And in January of this year, noted in paragraph 19 of its report on the issue, that training in itself, based on its historical view of what's required in such circumstances, normally is of limited, um, of limited use. Could I ask the noble lord, the minister, over and above the training, what else has been put in place for these decision makers to ensure that they fully abide and understand their obligations, not just within Rwandan law, but also international agreements? My well, Lords, as I um, said when I was answer responding to uh, a point taken by the noble lord, lord Faulkner of Thornton, uh, the presence of British officials in Rwanda, the presence of foreign judges in Rwanda uh, looking at these matters and working collaboratively to resolve them uh, will clearly inculcate uh, an atmosphere, um, will inculcate uh, a spirit of their proper observance. The noble lord uh, speaks in the future tense. Uh, the presence of British judges will have that effect. The training will have that effect. And I guess he's right. It may very well have that effect. But the point is we are asked to declare Rwanda safe now. The, uh, I hope the noble lord is going to answer uh, Lord Purvis's questions about timing. When do we expect that, uh, Rwanda to produce the new asylum law? When do we expect the judges to be appointed? When do we expect the system that is to be devised to uh, ensure that there is no refoulement? When is that system going to be created? When are the government going to see it? When is the House going to see it? If we are asked to say that Rwanda is safe, then we, we, we have already voted that we cannot ratify the treaty until the measures that were set out in uh, Amendment 84 that were in the International Agreements Committee report have come into effect. So it's all very well the Minister speaking in the future tense. He has to tell us now when things are going to happen. My Lord, I could intervene. Um, I may have missed it, but I wonder whether the noble Lord, the Minister could say whether Rwanda has, has drafted a refugee law. This list, um, as, as the Noble Lord set out, of the number of judges who have agreed to go to Rwanda, Rwanda and work there, and indeed of the number of officials, and for how long? My Lords, it's a matter of working towards uh, the uh, having these uh, safeguards in place, and we have received assurances from the government of Rwanda that the implementation of all measures in the treaty will be expedited. And the point being, my lords, uh, that we are working with them to accomplish that end. Um, we have already developed and commenced operational training. I wonder if, uh, I'm grateful for the minister, that's the closest we've got to an answer, working towards. So can we just pursue that just a, a, a wee bit more? Um, if, if, if Rwandan government is working towards putting safeguards in place, that means that they are not currently in place, is that correct? Well, it must do, my lords. Um, and and in, uh, just before the noble lord sits down, um, on a, so, so that, so before the noble lord stands up or resumes his seat, <laughs> resumes his position, um, I do have specific information on the point which he raised uh, earlier on about information available electronically. Uh, I'm told that the page to which the Noble Lord on, on the GovUK site 
uh, was referring was in fact withdrawn on the 11th September 2023 uh, and that it has been superseded uh, by one which is dated the 11th of January 2024 this year. Well, uh, Griffo, I, I clicked on it half an hour ago, sure. so the box, maybe they can do some clicking in the box, uh, because it doesn't, <laughs> because the information he's just provided to is false, so uh, he does need to correct uh, the record, but he can do it in writing to me if he so wishes. Um, I, think, I think a discussion on this point would be uh, taking up too much of the um, committee's time. So the question is, as the Minister had confirmed to me, that by definition the safeguards are not in place to, that would make Rwanda safe, because the Rwandan government is working towards having them in place, then why, is he asking, why has he asked us to determine that Rwanda is currently safe when the Minister has said it is not currently safe? Well, right, I have a question. Is the Lord not embarrassed by the word is? in that clause, which is, uh, I'm going to address in the next group. It's the language of that particular provision that causes embarrassment to the, the government, and they really do need to face up to the significance of using the word is. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> My Lord, I think um, that brings us, taking the Noble Lord Lord Purvis of Tweed's contribution together with the Noble and Leonard, Leonard uh, Lord Hope of Craig Head's contribution, uh, into considering where we are uh, with the uh, decision of the Supreme Court and how that sits with what we are as a government inviting the House to do at this stage. Uh, my Lords, the point is that, uh, and it's one which has been anticipated uh, by noble lords contributing in this and I think in the previous group, that the factual basis upon which the Supreme Court reached its decision has changed. The factual basis upon which the Supreme Court reached its decision was the one which was uh, frozen in time, as it were, uh, by the Court of First Instance. And since then, considerable development has taken place. The facts have changed. We are entitled, my Lords, uh, to move forward. Nor do I consider, my Lords, that there is uh, anything... Lord, give way. The UN, in January of this year, has given it an assessment of where the Rwanda um, immigration system is. And paragraph 18 of that report says, as of January 2025, the, uh, for the, UN, the UHNCR has not observed changes in the practice of asylum adjudication that would overcome not only the concerns of its 2022 analysis and in the detailed evidence presented to the Supreme Court. So what the UNHCR is saying is that as of January of this year, they have seen no evidence that the issues that the Supreme Court had in its evidence has been addressed to make Rwanda a safe country. Well, my lords, we disagree with the uh, views of the UNHCR on that point. The UNHCR, as uh, noble lords were reminded at an earlier stage in the previous division, are not the sovereign parliament of this country. Ago said that Rwanda is working towards. That is not the same as is. So he's. I, I, mean, I hate to say it, but it would appear that he is contradicting himself. I don't think that's the case, my lord. Um, I think that um, by saying that Rwanda is continuing to work in a process uh, is to say that it is working on making things safer, not to say that they are not safe already. Interrupt, but I, I, I just want to ask this. It's just that we haven't received any evidence as to how this change has taken place in this short period of time. What, what evidence is being placed before this House to show that there, rather than an assertion, what evidence is being placed before this House as to what is taking place and what has taken place to cho totally change the assessment of safety into I really would like to hear what the evidence is. Could I just, in, to assist the noble and learned lord in relation to this, you, you, there's a document called Safety of Rwanda, Asylum and Immigration Bill. And what this rather excellent document reveals is, uh, I think, 
and no doubt the noble and will correct me if I'm wrong, since the Supreme Court decided there's the agreement that's been entered into, which is really just making, as it were, legal and international law commitments they'd already given. And just before the Supreme Court gave its judgment, there were two courses that were held, one from the 18th to the 22nd of September 2023, and the second from the 20th to the 24th of November 2023, in which a number of Rwandan officials attended a course, training them, as this document says, to have a better understanding of the Refugee Convention. Now, apart from those two courses and the um, entering into of the agreement that you've referred to, could the noble and learned Lord tell us what else has happened since, since the rendering of the judgment of the Supreme Court, which I think was a few weeks ago? Uh, not more than a few weeks ago, I think, my laws, but what we have is an internationally binding treaty between two sovereign yeah. states. That, that if, if it, the noble law will bear with me, that is a matter of the utmost significance in considering such matters. It's in saying that the legally binding commitment commits them to do the things in particular in relation to refoulement, which they had already promised, though not in an agreement, to do. And am I right in saying that the very judgment that Lord Sharp said to us an hour ago, the government respects, said it would take a considerable time to give effect because of the cultural uh, understanding and the need for very substantial change. And I am looking for something other than simply signing an agreement to do with that which they'd already promised to do, which the Supreme Court said they weren't in a practical position to deliver. So tell this House, if you would, what, uh, if the Minister would, I apologise for calling him you, uh, could the Minister tell us what's happened which gives one confidence that that which the Supreme Court says would take time will in fact be ready in an instant? It's not a matter of being ready in an instant, my Lord. The work is, my Lords, the work is, is being undertaken. The point is that we have a specific treaty commitment not to refool, not to, in other words, as the noble and learned Lord knows, and just to remind the whole House, not to send people from Rwanda anywhere other than back to the United Kingdom, and specifically not to send them to places where they might be uh, subject to torture or inhuman treatment, and specifically, again, further, not to send them back to the countries from which they emerged if those countries are deemed dangerous. It is the position that we have bought through financial consideration a special treatment for the people that we send for asylum as distinct from anyone else who's been considered for asylum or is the asylum system as a whole being reformed? Because if we're buying them business class as distinct from sitting at the back of the bus, then is that something that really conforms to our high standards of the rule of law and the protection of human rights? Or are we just buying something a bit special for the folk that we're intending to put on a plane? My Lords, the government enters into diplomatic uh, arrangements such as treaties with another country. We do so on behalf of the government of the United Kingdom. We do so on behalf of the people, the country of the United Kingdom. Um, decisions as to how to approach um, uh, handling uh, migration or immigration uh, or asylum claims elsewhere are surely matters for other countries. We would not trespass uh, upon their independence and privileges in order to negotiate on behalf of them with a separate sovereign country. To be reformed in order that we can be confident of, how, of the quality of decision making. I, I, think, I, I think the noble lady has my answer. But the point is this, uh, we do not impose or seek to impose upon anyone, nor when, we, uh, nor when the noble lady talks about buying uh, a privileged status, would I go along with that. What I'm talking about, what the government is seeking to uh, enact in this measure, is a commitment with a forward-looking, democratic country which is uh, signatory to the same treaties uh, and the same international obligations which we are. To my noble friend, um, the noble lady, Lady Lister, is about to stand up to intervene. 
I'm aware she hasn't been in for the, for the whole of this debate. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm sorry to intervene again, but I have been here the whole debate. Um, may I take him back to the noble Lord, Lord Scriven, who quoted from the UNHCR, and the noble Lord, the minister, said, well, we don't agree with the UNHCR. <coughs> but the UNHCR does point out that its conclusions are based on, quote, its own extensive experience in capacity development of national asylum systems. Is the noble Lord saying that this government has more experience than the UNHCR? in terms of the capacity of countries to change. And it makes very clear that training isn't enough. It's all about, it needs to be systemic change and change its culture. As I say, uh, my lords, this is now a matter of a treaty commitment um, by that country. And we do accept the possibility, surely, uh, that countries have changed. We know the trauma which Rwanda has gone through in the comparatively recent future, uh, and we support uh, and acknowledge uh, the work that they are attempting to do uh, in, as part of a forward-looking African country, uh, looking, as it were, to provide solutions as opposed to exporting problems. Uh, the noble Lord Lord Howard. To uh, my neighbour friend for Green Way, these questions have ranged far and wide, but is it not the case that the one issue, as I understand it, on which the Supreme Court came to its decision was the risk of referment. And that is covered in the treaty, and anyone, anybody would be able to see and know whether anyone was refouled in breach of, uh, uh, of international law and in breach of the concern expressed by the Supreme Court. I'm grateful to the noble law because, of course, um, the matter is entirely patent uh, on the uh, Supreme Court's decision. It is about refoulement. We now have a treaty commitment preventing that from happening. A straightforward and simple, more simple question for the uh, noble Lord, the Minister. In paragraph 20 of the policy statement, it says, in order to implement the treaty, the government of Rwanda will pass a new Rwandan asylum law in the coming months. When will that law be produced? And has it already been passed? And when will it be passed? Because it's, if it's going to be after that we pass this act, as an act, then this obviously can't be, the treaty can't be enabled. Lords, I don't have information specific to the questions which the Noble Lord raises. Uh, before the Noble Lord sits down, um, I've listened very carefully to this debate, and I was particularly interested in the comments from my noble and learned friend Lord Faulkner about the training of people in Rwanda. And he said, I believe I got it right, that um, there were two weeks of training. Now, any treaty to work must be, e must be between countries of equal. And my impression is that we are telling the Rwandan government people what to do putting pens into their hands and making them sign without properly training them and giving them the experience to act equally to what we are, what we're looking to do ourselves. I may be wrong, but maybe the Minister can put me right. Well, I do think that the, uh, the Noble Lord overstates the matter. Um, advice and assistance is being provided uh, to assist a country um, to uh, shape its uh, laws uh, and its culture in a way which uh, is consistent with ours. Um, my Lords, the work uh, which Rwanda has undertaken is substantial and work has been done in response uh, to the uh, decision of the Supreme Court, albeit um, as the Noble Lord, Lord Howard, Noble and Leonard Lord, uh, Lord Howard of Limney points out, uh, that uh, decision ultimately related to refoulement, which is a matter expressly covered in the treaty. Again, for interrupting, the noble and learned Lord, sorry, the noble Lord, Lord Howard, is correct when he says that the fundamental reason the Supreme Court said no to this was because of the risk of refoulement. But they said the risk of refoulement was caused by the totally defective system right across the board in relation to their asylum system. They couldn't prevent refoulement 
because their system was so bad. And I quote from the judgment, its practical ability to fulfil its assurances, at least in the short term, in the light of the present deficiencies of the Rwandan asylum system, the past and continuing practice of refoulement, and the scale of the changes in procedure, understanding and culture which are required, is what it identified as being required. And so it is a both accurate but rather misleading statement to say it was only refoulement. There was the risk of refoulement because of the failures. Would that be the government's understanding of the position? People cannot be refooled to a different country under this treaty. They can be sent exactly. back to the United Kingdom. Exactly. They can be sent back to the United Kingdom, and that is as far as it goes. Uh, the noble Lord, the Minister, rests a, a great deal on a signature of a treaty uh, with a country that, with this government, has in the last decade refooled over 4,000 refugees which Israel sent to Rwanda. So that was this government of Rwanda behaving badly with refoulement. Why are you so confident that the same government is so fundamentally different and reformed? Well, my lords, um, the treaty is governed by our laws, by the government of Rwanda and by international law. The noble lord, the noble lord for a diplomat, seems to have, for a former diplomat, seems to have very, very little confidence in the ability of treaties to regulate the conduct uh, of governments uh, between one another. Of course. Very generous. I just want to <laughs> pursue. If, if the minister was to be persuasive in response to that question, he wouldn't have said that they are working towards putting safeguards in place, which have to be in place in order for the point for refoulement for the noble Lord Howard said. And that's what the minister said. The minister said that the safe, working towards putting safeguards in place, of which the minister, Lord Sharp, had said that no relocation will take place before these safeguards are in place. So at the dispatch box, can the minister reconfirm that position? No individual be, will be relocated before the, work, the safeguards are in place, which includes the appeals mechanism, the training, uh, the capacity building. And when will that date be for when relocations of an individuals can happen? Because we will be informed in Parliament that all of those safeguards are in place. Not that they will be in place, not that they're working towards, but will be in place. Well, Lords, I can answer the first part of the Noble Lord's question in the affirmative. The second part, I cannot give a date. Would my Noble Friend give way? As I understand it, my Noble and Learned Friend is effectively saying that because the treaty is going to be in place, Rwanda can be um, presumed to rely on its obligations. But may I just point out that if we look at this bill and its section 1-4, it says in terms it is recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom is sovereign and the validity of an Act is unaffected by international law. International law is very widely defined in subsection 6. If that is true of this country, is it not also true of Rwanda? And why should we necessarily believe on their commitments to that treaty? Another noble lord who uh, is too ready, perhaps, to disparage the activities uh, and the views uh, of the Rwandan <coughs> government. Uh, my Lords, as to the, the first point, I quote uh, from the Constitution Committee's report at uh, paragraph 54, which was uh, the report which was published recently and which was quoted earlier, I think, by the Noble Lord, Lord German, uh, towards the beginning of this debate. Uh, it is the case that the United Kingdom Parliament is sovereign and therefore may enact legislation which breaches international law. It is also true that the validity of an Act of Parliament in domestic law is not affected by international law. Nevertheless, the United Kingdom is still subject to the provisions of international law. My Lords, I don't disagree with anything that the Constitution Committee says in that document. Uh, the United Kingdom and this government takes its international commitments extremely seriously. But this measure, this treaty and this bill are drawn up in response to a considerable problem. People are dying and a huge amount of money is being spent by the United Kingdom in accommodating people 
uh, and many of whom have no business being here in the first place. This bill is an attempt to drive the matter forward. As the noble Lord Lord Coker said in winding up uh, for the opposition front bench in the course of the second reading debate, there are a number of things that are being done already. He endorsed them on behalf of uh, his party. He spoke about the criminal, the, the directions against criminal law, uh, against criminal groups in order to try to break their business model. He spoke about the uh, enhanced levels of cooperation with our partners on the continent of Europe. But patently, while this is a complex and multi-layered problem, these things are not working of themselves. And the government has taken the view that we must take further measures to try to stop the boats. I do think that the noble Lord Lord Howard is quite right that the crux of the Supreme Court judgment is the question of reformal. Ex-diplomats tend to take treaties very seriously, and indeed they, they read them. Article 10.3 of the Treaty with Rwanda says the parties shall cooperate to agree an effective system for ensuring that reform does not occur. The parties shall cooperate to agree an effective system. That's the crux of it. Where is that system? Can we see that system? If we could see that system, it might help us to determine whether Rwanda is safe. The noble lord is aware that the provisions of the treaty, as I explained a moment ago, will send people to the United Kingdom only. They will not and cannot be refiled under uh, the treaty and under the arrangements that we have with Rwanda. I, um, why then? Would does uh, uh, Article 10, 3, second sentence exist? Why is it there? Why is there to be uh, the party shall cooperate to agree an effective system that removal for ensuring that removal, contrary to the obligation which the old learned minister refers to, does not occur? Why do we need a system? If the minister is completely confident, why has his government signed a treaty which has a fallback to, uh, to say what should happen if reform does occur? And when will we see that system which is to ensure that it, the, uh, the fallback, the, the, uh, the safety net, when are we going to see that? It's not good enough for the minister to say reform all can't happen because we've signed the treaty. You've also signed a treaty containing a provision for what happens if reform all nevertheless occurs. My Lord, I think it's entirely prudent and appropriate uh, to anticipate contingencies in the terms of a document such as a treaty. I'm very grateful to the Nibbon Landed Lord. I, uh, He's, he's taking a much tighter position and a, a much more defensive position than the government itself is taking. They accept the proposition of the noble Lord Lord Kerr's question. They don't say Article 10 is enough on its own. They say the following. The Supreme Court concluded that changes needed to be made to Rwanda's asylum procedures in order to ensure compliance with the principle of non refoulement They accept the proposition. That's paragraph 76 of, your own, of, of the government's own statement. So tell us what changes and where we've got to. It's not enough, because the government accepts it's not enough just to rely on Article 10. My Lords, I've adverted at some length already to the monitoring committee which is there, to the work which is uh, currently underway by judicial and uh, by uh, bureaucratic by civil servant um, uh, staff assisting the Rwandans in working through these matters. My Lord. I'm, I'm feeling slightly confused at this point, but am I correct in saying that the government accepts that at present uh, Rwanda has not fully uh, adhered to the commitments it's given, and therefore it follows that it is, would be, be, by reference to those tests, unsafe? But, as I understand it, even if the government did nothing, by the, when this particular bill, if it goes on the statute book as currently drafted, 
no changes will take place in the wider world, and suddenly it becomes a safe country. Is that the reality of what we're looking at? Uh, my Lords, the, um, the intention of the bill is to provide that Rwanda is a safe country. Um, the, as I've explained to the noble Lord, Lord Faulkner of Thornton, in discussion of Article 22 of the treaty, in the event of some uh, disturbance uh, to that situation, the matter will be uh, approached on the government-to-government -government basis or by the convening of the relevant committee within 14 days. <clears throat> My Lord, returning to a text which was prepared earlier for me. <clears throat> the committee might uh, bear in mind that uh, Article 10 of the treaty uh, in particular sets out assurances for the treatment of relocated um, individuals in Rwanda, including ability by the refugee convention, in including um, abiding by the refugee convention in relation to those seeking asylum. Furthermore, pursuant to Article 3 of the treaty, the parties uh, agree that the obligations therein uh, shall be met uh, in respect of all relocated individuals, regardless of their nationality and without discrimination. Under this commitment, Rwanda will treat all groups um, of people fairly. Furthermore, my Lords, Article 10.3 in the United Kingdom Rwanda Treaty sets out clearly that the only place, uh, we've covered this ad longam, uh, to which Rwanda can remove individuals is to the United Kingdom, and that ensures that there is no risk of refoulement. For noble lords who remain concerned as to whether the treaty will be followed, be, uh, will be abided by by the Rwandan government, the independent monitoring committee will be in place to ensure that obligations in the treaty are adhered to. For an initial period of at least three months, there will be enhanced monitoring where monitoring shall take place daily to ensure rapid identification of and response to any shortcomings, and I refer the committee in that regard to Article 15.7 of the Treaty. My Lords, this enhanced phase will ensure that monitoring and reporting takes place in real time. Individuals who are relocated to Rwanda will be able to raise any issues of concern should they arise with the committee. It should also be remembered, uh, as I've said on a number of occasions already, that this is a legally binding treaty that will become part of Rwandan domestic law. My Lords, taking all of this into consideration, I submit that these amendments are unnecessary. Further, they undermine the objective of the Bill, unnecessarily delaying, potentially, the relocation of individuals uh, to Rwanda. And I therefore uh, ask the Noble Lord to withdraw his amendment. Before the Noble Lord Minister sits down, um, if the committee will forgive me, um, slid into an earlier part of the Noble Lord's response was a reference to some glowing statements about the progress within Rwanda um, of gender equality. And I think those are, are statements that should not be allowed to just left stand, because although we have been very much focused in this debate on the issue of reform, uh, we're assuming that if people, refugees, in particular women refugees, are given status in Rwanda and they remain in Rwanda, they will have to live in Rwanda. And making glowing statements about gender equality in Rwanda. Now, I think it's very well known that, uh, yes, in terms of parliamentary representations, ministerial representation, Rwanda has made uh, very considerable progress, indeed uh, more progress than our own parliament has. But nonetheless, I don't know if the Noble Lord the Minister is aware that in Rwanda, 83% uh, of women work in the informal sector or in low-wage occupations, earning on average 60% of men's incomes. And the 2021 National Gender Statistic Report revealed that physical violence affects 36.7% of women and girls aged between 15 and 49 in Rwanda. So I just wonder if the Noble Lord the Minister would acknowledge, with regard to his earlier remarks, that making claims about gender equality progress in Rwanda uh, needs to be done with caution. Well, I, I think it, it is, I respectfully agree with the Noble Lady, that it is important uh, to look at such matters with, with caution. Um, and I would say that, uh, in relation to the figures which she, she cites, um, the statistics in concerning uh, domestic violence uh, would be uh, primarily, one presumes, a matter for Rwandan society itself, uh, as opposed to. 
Those were not domestic figures. Those were general violence against women and girls figures. And the noble lady is uh, very aware, and I'm aware of her uh, campaigning work on the topic, uh, that uh, the bulk of violence uh, visited upon women uh, criminally is within the domestic setting. Um, my Lord the Minister, given that, what's the basis for his assertion, which is also made in the noble Lord Lord Sharp's letter to peers about gender equality? Perhaps he could give us some references, um, because the noble lady has. I have a feeling, uh, with respect to the uh, important point which the noble lady tables, uh, that this is a matter dealt with in a later group. I don't have the figures to hand in front of me at the moment. Um, if we do not touch upon that in a later group with which I may not be concerned, and I haven't had a look at that, uh, as a result of the division of labour on these benches, uh, what I'll do is make sure that the point uh, which the noble lady takes, uh, which reflects the noble lady's uh, original question, uh, and that those figures are brought out either in the scope of the debate or are the subject of correspondence. <clears throat> find his place. Um, <laughs> ju just, ju just to help the Minister find his place. And to be helpful, actually, this is clearly becoming a bone of contention between the Government from Bench and the House in terms of the progress that's been made. To help us before we get to, uh, to report stage, could the noble minister write to, P uh, to, 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 to noble lords who have taken part in this part of the debate to show the significant progress, and that's the word that the noble lord, the minister, used in terms of the significant progress that Rwanda has made to deal with the concerns of the, um, of the Supreme Court. So we have some evidence before we get to report to see exactly the content of those uh, significant um, uh, reforms. I'm happy to take up uh, the noble lord's suggestion uh, and we will correspond with him and other noble lords who have participated in this debate. So, my lords, Ida touched upon the uh, role of the Independent Monitoring Committee. We've heard already uh, about the uh, presence of persons from out with Rwanda uh, offering their expertise and skills, bolstering the system uh, that is um, that will uh, rule in these situations. One point that um, the noble lady Baroness Bennett of Manor Castle made um, was in relation to uh, the situation in Rwanda, and of course. The committee ought to bear in mind uh, that it is not the intention uh, of the government uh, that this be a means of sending people to Rwanda. Our intention is that people who want to come to Britain will be deterred from following illegal routes by travelling to Britain. We are intending to use Rwanda as a deterrent for those people. Rwanda itself is safe. The point is that people who want to travel to Britain will be deterred from travelling if, if they know that they will be taken instead to Rwanda. Now, my lords, as I say, the, this, um, this, will be, uh, this is expressed in a, a legally binding treaty which will become part of Rwandan domestic law. And, my lords, taking all of this, all of what's been said, including uh, the uh, extensive extempore um, interventions uh, from members of all sides, uh, I submit to the House, uh, to the committee, that these amendments are unnecessary. They undermine the bill's objective. They delay matters uh, in relation to relocation of individuals and that deterrent effect to which I spoke uh, unnecessarily. And I therefore uh, invite the noble lord to withdraw his amendment. Well, my lords, I can, can I congratulate the noble lord, the minister, on keeping his cool during the course of this, uh, this debate because it's, he's had a lot of information quests thrust at him. But if you were to separate this group of amendments into two halves, the one half is about the process by which Parliament deals with the uh, results of this bill and the way it should, do, uh, it should do it in looking at normal parliamentary practice. And that's what was at the heart of these, this group of amendments, that we do it in a proper and appropriate manner, that when the government has determined that it is safe according to the conditions which have been laid down for it by this House, then it then 
puts an order before this House and the, and the Commons, and then it's voted upon, but which could have a, a judicial end to it if necessary. That was the purpose of these group of amendments. But in the course of the group of amendments, of course, the second half, which has been much more about what do we know in order to make that decision about when uh, Rwanda is safe. And uh, uh, you know, we've had words like, Rwanda is safe, but we're going to make it safer. We've had words like, it will be expedited. We're working towards getting it right, or the treaty. We are, as written down, seeking assurances and commitments. Now, all of those are in the future, in the future tense. And here we are in a house which is asked to change its mind about what it has already determined. And we need to have the evidence in order to be able to make that determination. And on the most fundamental, simple question, which was that in order to implement the treaty, the government of Rwanda will pass a new Rwandan asylum law, we don't know the, even know the answer to that question, let alone all the other ones which people have been raising. Uh, and so we, we, what we don't know is where we're going to be by the time we get to report stage. I, I, on the process issue, I, I mean, I do bear in mind the, the idea of uh, rolling sunset clauses. I think we need to look at the judicial review and everything else. All those matters, I think, are important, but they don't deal with what happens before the bill is enacted. They deal with, uh, sorry, before the Rwandan Treaty is enacted, they deal with afterwards. And I'm interested in both before and afterwards to find solutions which meet the needs of this House. So, in a sense, I, 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 I'm a bit in a quandary because if you were to ask me after listening to this debate to make a decision about whether Rwanda is safe, but the answer is I don't, that, don't know. I'll come back later, but tell me, please, when I should come back. And as, as far as I, I can see, this House does not know. And we've had no evidence, no dates, no timing, no roll of it, rollout of information to help us make that decision. So uh, I, I hope, and I hope that we are going to see it. If we don't see it, then we'll be back. We certainly will be back. But uh, in, the, in the meantime, I, I beg leave to withdraw my amendment. Your Lordship's pleasure that this amendment be withdrawn. Amendment by leave withdrawn. Amendment 5, Baroness Chakrabarty, not moved. My Lords, I beg to move that the House be resumed. The question is that the House be resumed. As many of that opinion will say content. Yeah. Yeah. Not content, the contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn during pleasure until ten past eight. The question is that the House adjourn during pleasure until ten past eight. As many of that opinion will say content. Yeah. Contra not content. The contents have it.
House to be again to be again in committee on the safety of Rwanda, asylum and immigration bill. Lord Sharp of Epsom. My Lord, so I beg to move that the House do now again resolve itself into a committee upon the bill. The question is that the House do now again resolve itself into a committee on the bill. As many as that opinion will say content. content. The contrary not content. The contents have it. Amendment 6, Lord Hope of Craighead. So I have four amendments in this group, numbers 6, 14, 20 and 26, and uh, they're all part of a, a single package, and they're designed to address in a slightly different way the points that have been debated in the two previous groups. So in a way we're on very familiar ground because we've covered uh, the ground in considerable detail, particularly in the exchanges with the Lord Lord, Lord, Lord Stewart at the end of the last group. And Lord, I take the uh, committee directly to the wording of Clause 1 2 B. Uh, that clause states, as we know, that the Act gives effect to the judgment of Parliament that the Republic of Rwanda is a safe country. Uh, the word I'm concerned with is the word is. Now, by way of preamble, uh, I'm not speaking entirely for myself, in, I'm duly troubled by the fact that the government is asking your lordships to reverse the finding of the UK Supreme Court of 15th November last year. The court said that there were substantial grounds for believing that the removal of claimants to Rwanda would expose, expose them to the real risk of ill treatment by reason of refoulement. In other words, it was not a safe country as defined for the purpose of this bill by Clause 1 5. But that finding was based on the evidence which was before the court, uh, and indeed that was evidence which was before the divisional court uh, a year before in 2022, as uh, the noble Lord Lord Mario Bridworth reminded us. So in a sense it was talking about material which uh, has moved on, uh, at least other things have moved on since the facts were gathered together, which was the basis of that finding. And it's important to know that the uh, document which was available at that time was not the treaty, but the then memorandum of understanding between the two governments entered into in April 2022. And then that uh, uh, had some quite important differences from what we now found in the treaty. Now, the Lords, as all judges know, decisions on matters of fact are open to review if there has been a material change of circumstances. Now, I'm very far from saying that there has been a sufficient uh, material change to justify a different finding, but in principle, that finding is open to, uh, to be looked at again if the circumstances change. Certainly, things have moved on since 2022. Uh, as I've mentioned a moment ago, there is a new treaty. And as for Parliament taking upon itself the responsibility of making the judgment referred to in Clause 1 2b, uh, I suggest that one has to be quite sanguine about it and just recognise that there are circumstances where judgments can be looked at again. And no judgment is going to be particularly aggrieved if people suggest that that should be so. If I was in the Supreme Court still, uh, I would just shrug my shoulders at this and say, well, uh, let Parliament carry on and do what it likes, as indeed it can. My Lords, the President of the Supreme Court, Lord Reed of Alamur, uh, is a member of this House, but unfortunately he is disqualified by reason of his office from coming to address us. But there is a mechanism by which, if he was unduly troubled, he could submit in writing his views for us to take into account. And so far as I know, he has not done that, and I'm not uh, greatly surprised that he didn't think it necessary to do that. But, my Lord, while I said that uh, Parliament can do what it likes, even if, as is plainly the case here, what it's doing is plainly in conflict with our international obligations and therefore deeply regrettable, it must think very carefully about what it is doing. It must be careful in the choice of words. If it's going to take the place of judges who are very careful in their choice of words when they issue their judgments, it must exercise the same degree of care and skill. That is all the more important in view of the way this bill gives effect to the judgment. It's surrounded by so many barbed wire fences, all designed 
to prevent that judgment ever being challenged in any UK court under any circumstances. This means uh, that the judgment your lordships are being asked to make is crucial to the safety, lives and well-being of everyone, wherever they come from, who are at risk of being removed to Rwanda. Words matter, as I've said many times in this house. That is why the choice of the word is is so important, and I suggest to your lordships its use here is so wrong as the exchanges at the end of the last group demonstrated so powerfully. What it does is refer to the state of facts when the treaty comes into force, which, uh, if we look at the end of this bill, is the bin bill's commencement date. So it asserts that as from that very moment, simply because the treaty is then in force, Rwanda is a safe country. Furthermore, it asserts by the use of the word is that it continues to be a safe country and must be treated as such by any decision maker forever after, whatever has happened and whatever the circumstances, so long as the act remains in force. Well, my lords, I simply cannot in all, in all conscience make that judgment. The words is a safe country would be fine if one was simply creating a slogan or defining an aspiration. <clears throat> but that is not what we are dealing with here. This is legislation. It is legislation which, as Clause 9.2 tells us, applies to any decision by a decision maker relating to the removal of a person to the Republic of Rwanda that is made on or after the treaty comes into force. It has no regard to the safety of all those who are at risk of removal, wherever they come from, if they are exposed to the risk of reformment while they are there. And also there is a crucial difference between building legislation around a judgment of fact relating to the laws of physics or propositions about things that have existed for all time and will not change and what your lordship is being asked to form a judgment about here. There could be no, <coughs> there could be no objection, for example, to Parliament basing legislation around a declaration that in its judgment the earth is round. Now, that might have startled some people a century or so ago, but not now, as we know it to be true, and furthermore, we know it will not ever change. But what we're dealing with here is human behavior. It is people who will have to uh, uh, implement the Rwanda Treaty. And one has to assume that then, and be assured that they have the practical ability to fulfill the assurances that are being given. Now, my lords, I don't for a moment doubt the integrity and good faith of the government of Rwanda. The parties have committed themselves to clear and binding obligations as to, and as to how they're to be secured. They've committed themselves to taking all steps, necessary or appropriate, to ensure that these obligations can be and are in fact being complied with. But when you have to rely on people to achieve these things, there is always a question as to whether they will always do what they are told to do or indeed are capable of doing what they are told to do. Or be there. That is why uh, the treaty itself provides for a monitoring, monitoring process to see that what the treaty provides for actually happens. The implementing of these obligations lies in the future as done the making and bringing into force of the essential new Rwanda asylum law, not yet in force, but, yes, but nevertheless essential, designed to strengthen the decision-making and associated appeals processes. The government's policy statement of 11th January 2024 states that this will happen, and I quote, in the coming months. So it seems it may well not be there when the treaty comes into force. This is something to which, to adopt the noble and learned Lord Stuart's phrase, the, 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 the arrangements we're working towards, a goal somewhere in the future which uh, we cannot be assured will be there and achieved by the date when the, bill, the Act commences. And there are also the ten points, as noted by the, by the IAC, and now very helpfully listed in Lord German's Amendment 84.1c, which was discussed in the last group, but to which I'm extremely grateful because it just illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. 
That is the background to amendments, which indeed are very simple. My Amendment 6 would remove the words, is a safe country, which I submit are, are really wholly misguided. And indeed, it became clear in the exchanges with the Norman Lord Stuart that it was embarrassing for him that he was trying to assert that the word is really means what it says. I would replace it with the words, will be a safe country, when, and only when and for so long as, the arrangements provided for in the Rwanda Treaty have been fully implemented and are being adhered to in practice. That's a formula which uh, I would have thought the government could perfectly well accept because uh, they believe that the Rwanda Treaty is doing what is, not, is needed and uh, they would not be troubled at all by adopting these words and if they did it would certainly assure or reassure a lot of us who are deeply worried about uh, the reliability of what we are being told. So I would encourage the noble world to look very carefully at my wording and, and wonder whether there's anything really to object to. It doesn't in any, any way seek to undermine the bill. It seems to use the words which any judge would use if he was uh, forming the judgment which we are being asked to make. My amendments 2 and 26 would qualify the directions that are given to every decision maker and to the court and tribunals in clause 2 uh, so that they are uh, qualified to the same effect. And then my amendment 14, which is an essential part of the package, seeks to provide a means by which it can be determined whether the Rwanda Treaty has been and continues to be fully implemented. My Lords, I think it's the feeling across the committee that uh, we really cannot just accept the government's assurance. There has to be some method of checking that implementation is taking place and indeed will continue to be uh, the case in the future. Uh, two other means of addressing this vital issue are proposed in this group. Amendment 18, in the neighbour of my noble loyal friend Lord um, Anderson of Ipswich, and Amendment 64, in the name of the noble Lord Lord Coker. So there are three solutions on the table, and I'm simply uh, putting one forward, no uh, claim to priority in any way. It's just another solution of which uh, I suggest should be uh, weighed up against the others. My approach, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, in line with the point that the noble Lord Lord Ponsonby made in the course of his uh, reply last time, my approach is not to do something uh, which would have the possibility of delaying the bill or its implementation. Uh, and uh, as, as might happen if one was in using as a, a monitoring uh, committee the IAC or some other outside body. What I've done is base my, uh, my formula on the provisions of the treaty itself, which I would have thought the government would not complain about because they, after all, have uh, agreed to these committees being into the treaty in the first place. On the one hand, there is a monitoring committee, already in existence, made up of eight independent experts. Now, my Lord, I can't claim to know who all they are, are but I do know that one of them, Harish Salve, KC, of Blackstone Chambers, <coughs> brings to the task many years of experience in public international law and human rights. And I think from what uh, one can see from his description of his career on the website, one can have a good deal of confidence that he knows, knows what he's doing when he is asked to monitor what is going on there. The key function of the committee under Article 15 is to advise on all steps that that committee considers appropriate to ensure that the provisions of the treaty are adhered to in practice. And that's precisely the point on which we require reassurance. And the other committee is a joint committee whose role under Article 16 is to monitor and review the application and implementation of the treaty. And then there are the objectives of the treaty, which of course are set out in the treaty itself, listed in Article 2, together with the mechanisms that are needed to bring it about. So my amendment brings together these three points, the monitoring committee, the joint committee, and the objectives of the treaty itself. And it proposes that the treaty cannot be considered to have been fully implemented until the Secretary of State has obtained a declaration by the Joint Committee after consultation with the Monitoring Committee that the obje objectives have been secured by the creation of these mechanisms. And it goes on to say that the Secretary of State must consult the Monitoring Committee every three months 
and make a statement to Parliament if the advice of the monitoring committee is that this is not happening. I suggest that this provides a sufficiently reliable means of ensuring that what I have set, in, set out in my Amendment 6 has been and will continue to be achieved. It's relatively simple. I can't see that it delays anything because it's using the mechanisms in the treaty itself which we're being asked to uh, uh, accept and uh, uh, as reliable for the purpose for which it's designed. As I said at the beginning, my four amendments are all part of a package and they are designed to correct the wholly inaccurate and frankly sloppy use of the word is, which should never be in the, that clause in the first place if it's going to be a declaration of what our judgment is. I suggest that my words are far better suited to the judgment that the House is being asked to make and to put it into practice. I beg to move. Amendment proposed, clause one, page one, line 12. Leave right is, is a safe country and insert the words as printed on the marshal's list. My Lords, I cannot, of course, uh, surpass the noble and learned Lord Hope in terms of quality, um, but I can at least claim the advantage in terms of quantity. I have seven amendments in this group uh, to his four. We discussed in the first group of amendments why Parliament is ill-equipped to make the fact-specific and time-specific judgment asked of it by this bill uh, that Rwanda is a safe country. We will look, I suppose, on Wednesday at how this difficulty is compounded by restrictions on access to the courts, which is, for me, the most troublesome aspect of this bill. The amendments in this group do not provide answers to either of those concerns of constitutional principle. Instead, uh, and very much as a second best option, at least so far as I am concerned, they accept the proposition that Parliament should be the decision maker and seek to make something workable out of it. The past few hours have surely served as a warning following the similar warning delivered by the International Agreements Committee at the end of last year that this House could not, as the noble and learned Lord Hope put it, in all conscience sign off now or in the near future on the proposition that Rwanda is a safe country. The noble and learned minister came very close in the last debate uh, to admitting the obvious that this is at best a work in progress. He should, if he is as sensible as I think he is, be very grateful uh, for the olive branch that is the noble and learned Lord Hope's Amendment 6. So we turn to the question of what Parliament would need in order to make its judgment. The letter promised to the noble Lord Scriven uh, will be a welcome start, but could not, of course, be enough. And how to ensure that this judgment can be revisited over time? My own, my own amendments in this group, uh, 15, 16, 77, 83, 88, 89 and 92, on which I am grateful for the assistance of the Law Society of England and Wales, are put forward in that spirit of slightly grubby compromise. Amendment 15 provides for an independent reviewer to review the implementation and operation of the Rwanda Treaty and report on it, initially at three-month intervals and thereafter annually. The objective is to produce an impartial report which Parliament can use to come to its own view. I am indebted for that idea to the noble Lord Carlyle, a former independent reviewer himself, uh, who has signed the amendment but unfortunately cannot be here today. I accept that there are bodies other than an independent reviewer which could give us the expert advice that we need in order to make the judgment required of us uh, under Clause 1. It may not be realistic to expect the government to accept the UNHCR or indeed the Joint Committee on Human Rights for that purpose. The Noble and Learned Lord Hope suggests involving the Independent Monitoring Committee established under the UK-Rwanda Agreement. There is, if I may say so, a good deal of logic in that. And it might be a satisfactory solution, so long as its reports are published in full and without interference by the Joint Committee, the body made up of officials from the two governments, and hence anything but independent, to which the Monitoring Committee, under the scheme of the Treaty, reports. For that reason, I see attraction in the approach of the noble Lord Coker in his Amendments 64 and 65, uh, which cut out the middleman and require the Monitoring Committee to report directly to Parliament. My Amendment 16 provides for what should happen if the independent reviewer should report that Rwanda is not or has ceased to be safe. That report would not be binding on Parliament. Uh, we have suggested that the House of Commons should have 28 days to resolve that Rwanda is nonetheless a safe country 
failing which removals to Rwanda would have to stop immediately. I did wonder whether that was over generous, but it does at least preserve the accountability uh, of which the noble Lord Howard uh, spoke earlier. Amendments 83, 88 and 89 concern the commencement provision clause 9. They provide that the Act, with the exception of the proposed new clause creating an independent reviewer, would not come into force until the House of Commons is satisfied following a report from the independent reviewer that Rwanda is a safe country. Finally, Amendment 92 would ensure that the Act expires on the date on which the Rwanda Treaty is terminated, subject to any transitional mm -hmm. provisions. These amendments, or others like them, and there is a good menu of options in this group, uh, give Parliament the tools it needs to make a judgment that Rwanda is safe. They provide a mechanism for that judgment to be revisited without the need for primary legislation in the event that uh, independent observers find that the situation on the ground has deteriorated. And they provide for the Act to be sunsetted in circumstances where the treaty has been terminated. They do not cure the constitutional difficulties of this bill, uh, but they do enable the central decision to be made on the basis of evidence uh, rather than uh, dogma, fiction or fantasy. Uh, I hope the Minister might agree with me uh, that that would be a refreshing change. My Lord, My Lord um, I uh, stand to move uh, Amendment 8 and uh, associated Amendment 72 in my name, and I'm grateful to Lord Carr, uh, uh, Lord Kerr, and to the Bishops of Bristol and Endersbury and, and uh, Ipswich for their support. And I also add my name uh, to Amendment 64 in the name of my noble friend Lord Coker. Uh, I've got a number of reasons why I've moved Amendment 8 in relation to what happens to those who find themselves translated to Rwanda should this bill uh, become law and should there be time for the government to find the mechanisms and processes to actually make it work, which is in considerable doubt. Nothing I say this evening should be taken as any endorsement whatsoever for any part of this bill because I don't believe that it will work and I don't believe that it is uh, acceptable in terms of our international conventions. I, I take up the point made at the end of the last group by the uh, noble or the minister making uh, a gallant effort to try and defend the government that this is about deterrence and the deterrent is Rwanda. The deterrent is the refusal uh, through the Nationality and Borders Act and then the Illegal Migration Act to allow people to claim asylum when they reach our shores if they don't come with the appropriate accreditation and passport. And as there are outside the uh, particular routes for Ukraine and Hong Kong, no current resettlement routes that are properly working, that means that anyone outside those bespoke processes are denied asylum in the UK. In fact, the previous Home Secretary and, and her predecessor uh, both made it very clear that what they were doing here was to indicate that someone who came without those papers and processes was illegal. By being illegal, they became, in the words of Suella Braverman, a criminal. They therefore broke our values and therefore they shouldn't have the right to be processed here but be transferred to Rwanda. And my amendment and the associated uh, 72, Amendment 72 that deals with the treaty requirements is very, is very simple. That someone who is offshored and shows that they can justify their asylum claim, that they are a genuine refugee, should be allowed back in the country. That was true of the mention of the Australian scheme earlier, which incidentally was about picking people up in the uh, 1,000 nautical miles uh, of sea before people reached Australia and translating them uh, from picking them up by sea uh, back to the processing uh, company. The one thing it did have in com common with Rwanda was the cost. Uh, it ended up with a, a million pounds per individual, uh, which is what we're going to end up here with. So that did have something in common. Uh, what it doesn't have in common with the proposition from, and I repeat what I said uh, some weeks ago, the very far-right uh, Prime Minister of Italy, leader of the 
Brothers of Italy, and I don't know whether members tonight on the opposite benches uh, will accept that she is a genuine right winger, has a, a proposal for offshoring to Albania, but with the proposition that those who are uh, judged to be uh, asylum claimants who have shown that they have ref refugee status should be tran transported back to Italy, that they have the right to come back into the country that originally transported them out. And I, I, I just want to make this really clear tonight, although at this time of night the, the message probably won't get across, that I don't actually believe that members of the House of Commons understood what they were passing. And I don't mean to be patronising, I just think they didn't take account of the detail, never mind the public. I don't think they understood that it was a one-way ticket, that we weren't offshoring in any known uh, concept of, 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 the, of, of that uh, process, but actually showing Ro Rwanda, as I described a minute or two ago, as a threat. Well, if it's a threat, it's a threat. What is the threat about Rwanda? It is because it's Rwanda. And what we're dealing with with this bill is a one-way ticket where, bizarrely, you claim asylum or you don't. I'd be interested to know in the responses at the end, and I did sort of give notice of this on second reading, I really would like to know what happens if someone's not allowed to claim asylum in the UK, but when they're transported to Rwanda, choose not to claim asylum in Rwanda. It can't be presumed that they've claimed asylum because they tried to claim asylum in the UK and because they were criminalised, were denied it, that they would claim asylum in Rwanda. So perhaps we could park that and someone could give me an answer to it. But say they do claim asylum in Rwanda, they'll end up no different to those who don't claim asylum because they'll be in Rwanda. But sadly, those who do demonstrate their legitimate claim to asylum are therefore in every international convention uh, our refugees will actually be in exactly the same position as those who were adjudged not to be refugees but remain in asylum. The only two categories of those who can reach the UK from being in Rwanda are those who are claiming asylum as Rwandas, Rwandans in the United Kingdom or can't be transported from Rwanda to the country of their origin because it isn't safe and under this bill would be allowed back. Those are the only two categories. The, pers the, the category that will not be allowed back are those who actually have demonstrated their refugee status. This is Alice in Wonderland uh, stuff. This is absurd. And if it's all about sending signals to the traffickers that their business model is broken, we're really breaking the asylum seekers rather than the organised criminals. Because what they'll simply say to people is, if you're going to be transported to Rwanda, but you demonstrate your refugee status and you remain in Rwanda, just as those who don't will remain in Rwanda, they'll disappear into the ether. And the organised criminals, and it's dealt with in subsequent uh, groups in this uh, committee stage will find themselves refugees, genuine refugees will find themselves uh, in the hands of organised criminals uh, treating them through modern slavery uh, and we know that that will happen because that's what the organised traffickers will tell them. We'll give you a telephone number, ring it, we'll find you a job and we'll find you a bed and we'll own you. And it's, it, so if there's anything moral in relation to how we deal with issues of trying to, uh, to stop people coming across the channel in dangerous small boats, it isn't the morality of sending off the, the organised traffickers, it's actually the immorality of encouraging people to disappear into the hands of those same organised criminals. So, what I'm suggesting is, as with Georgia Maloney, and as far as I know, every other system in the world that's ever existed, 
that those who demonstrate their refugee status and have been transported from the country which they finally reached should be allowed to come back as refugees. It might not fit the threat of Rwanda, the threat that we've been talking about earlier this evening and we'll talk about in subsequent groups, but it would fit our commitment to our international obligations and the human rights of those individuals. And if we don't do that, then I think that we are developing a concept of the United Kingdom, not only as a country that will breach all international conventions to which we've signed, but our basic morality, and that would be demonstrably dangerous for this country as well as other parts of the world in years to come. My lords, the full incoherence and madness of this bill has just been uh, exemplified in the speech of uh, the noble Lord, Lord uh, Blunkett. Uh, the many possibilities here are, are really uh, incredible. Um, the idea that um, asylum seekers may well receive the advice, when you get to Rwanda, don't apply for asylum. Don't apply for asylum. Just arrive and don't apply for asylum. So what do the Rwandan people do then? Ask yourselves that question. Where do you send them back to? Back to Britain um, from whence they came? They're not applying for asylum here. They're not asylum seekers here. Or do you send them back to France, our great partner in trying to deal with the crime that is emanating across Europe, where we need to be collaborative and where we need to have intelligence and serious investigation into criminal gangs? I was rather attracted um, by the idea of uh, my noble friend, um, the, the noble lord, with his suggestion, um, Lord Hope, his suggestion that we changed the tense here and that we made it about the future, that if Rwanda did become this uh, safe country that we're being asked to vote it is, that if that stage did come and we felt that it did have a legal system that was capable of making these assessments, then, and it was properly monitored, and we received evidence, and I've mentioned evidence before, we have to be sure of that, and putting it into the future might be rather appealing. The one thing I had concern about was when Lord Hope said, and this wouldn't cause delay. Well, I'm, I'm hoping there will be delay. I don't want to see people being flown to a place in which this great project of modernizing and, uh, and uh, uh, improving upon the system in Rwanda is going to take place. I want it to have happened before we send anybody there, um, if it's going to happen at all. I happen to take the view, unpopular amongst many, but I happen to take the view that actually exporting uh, people in itself is, and sending them away um, is, the, is part of the problem. Um, we're not doing, as uh, Ms. Maloney, um, the ultra-radical, um, proto-fascist leader in Italy is doing, um, which is that she's asking the Albanians to do um, what Italians, the Italian system would be doing on their behalf. We're not asking for that. We're sending them there. We're exporting a problem. And I am concerned that, uh, about the issue of delay, and perhaps Lord Hope will respond at some stage, and I see him getting to his feet, and maybe he'll be able to help me. The point the noble baroness is making. Um, when I was talking about delay, it's the delay of implementing the bill, putting the, the, the various people in place for the, for the monitoring to take place. And the, the fact is that the committees that I mentioned already exist. And the distinction is between that situation and setting up a new independent monitoring thing, which will take time. That's my, that's it, my only point. But of course, I, I do appreciate that, that all the time that is necessary should be taken to be absolutely sure that implementation has been achieved. That's a different question. So the delay we were talking about is about delay in the implementation of this legislation. And I'd like to remind you of an example of that. The Human Rights Act was passed in 1998. And the point was made at the time that it would not come into uh, uh, operation until 2000. Why was that? And it was because it was accepted that there would have to be considerable training and there would have to be considerable learning before it could possibly take effect uh, in the courts in a sensible way. And that we had to make sure 
that decision making was going to be made in a way that was compliant with that Quite act and with the European Convention. Right. And so it was, it was recognising that if you want to create change of that sort, there has to be the concomitant uh, 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 changes in systems and changes in training, changes in lawyering, changes in judging. Mm -hmm. And so we would need to see evidence, I would certainly want to see evidence, of not just four-day trainings. Um, the International Bar Association is involved in training uh, lawyers, in training prosecutors, and in training people around the world. For example, in relation to uh, coercive interrogation, as we politely call it, to prevent torture of people who are arrested, and to make sure that in order to comply with the rule of law, that we do not, in our systems of law around the world, use those kinds of practices in order to extract confessions, because of course we've learned that confessions and so on, extracted in that way, are never reliable. And so training takes place, but we all recognize that a four-day training doesn't produce the goods. Two four-day trainings, as we have had so far uh, in Rwanda, doesn't create a change in the culture. And so what we're talking about is something much more substantial and meaningful in changing systems. And I remember, because I was in the radio studio with them at the time, that when the Supreme Court's judgment came out, and Lord Sumption and I were sitting there asked, being asked on the Today Programme's podcast about uh, the effects of this and the response of government that they were going to pass a bill in which they said that the country was safe, he was absolutely shocked and said it would be disreputable to do such a thing. And why did he say that? And he said himself on the program, because the systems are the things that are problematic here. It's the, the outcome of refoulement is a result of inadequate systems, and to change those would be a substantial challenge, and not one that can be completed in a matter of months. So this story that somehow the uh, evidence on which this was based was outdated, we have to have evidence of substantial change before we could possibly consider this bill an acceptable one to uh, put through this House. And so um, I certainly um, cheer on Lord Hope in his amendments and any other amendments that may come forth that will delay this. But what we really know in this House is that this is about an election coming up in which this has become a very heated issue. And there is a desire on the Prime Minister's part to fulfil the dream of Miss Braverman that she will see a flight go into the air, going to Rwanda, carrying on it some of these asylum seekers. That is the dream, that is the election flag that has to go up the flagpole. And all I can say is that it is unfitting, inappropriate and unworthy if this Parliament passes it for that reason. Um, I rise to speak um, because I suspect I'm um, in a minority, a very few members of this House, who has, direct con or has had direct contact with Rwanda, um, having had 10 years engagement uh, with the Diocese of Tregali, the capital city, and having had the um, uh, great joy of having visited the country um, and seeing life outside in the countryside. Uh, one of the most moving things, I think, of my in my nearly 40 years of ministry, was praying at the National Memorial for the Holocaust in Trigali with a local bishop who had lost so many members of his own family. Uh, he was still so distraught that I had to find the words uh, for our prayer together. And I'd like to put it on record that um, I've come across so many wonderful Rwandans who uh, would um, be hugely great examples to us individually of uh, the practice of forgiveness and of trying to uh, make life, life beautiful again after a terrible, terrible tragedy. I can think of one instance where I met someone, who, a priest, who uh, most of his family had been murdered and um, as, in an act of forgiveness, he took the murderer of, of his loved ones into what was left of his family because he felt this was a requirement upon him to demonstrate and show forgiveness in this, in this terrible situation. Um, it's also true, of course, that um, in my experience that uh, Rwanda has done a remarkable job in terms of um, developing its economy, 
I say, was going to say about a tiger economy, that's perhaps for the wrong fauna for, for uh, the Great Lakes um, region, but real strides forward in their economy. Um, and, of course, um, people have um, been very eager to support their president because he's delivered, largely delivered to them peace. But it's also my experience, my direct experience, um, relating to what uh, Baroness Kennedy has said, that um, the institutions of civil society remain substantially undeveloped. And it seems to me that um, although we may, uh, in, in agreeing with Lord Hope, that we might want to say that, you, that Rwanda could in the future be a third party partner in our dealing with um, these issues, I would strongly um, um, say that that day is not yet, uh, has not yet come. And that, um, and of course, I'm, I'm not in principle against the idea of, of third party partnerships. Um, it's very interesting um, we hear about, about Italy. It seems to me that what's required, though, is a real dedicated commitment to a partnership among, among Western nations in seeking to see how this could be done effectively and generously towards those whom we um, categorize as criminals, but who, many of whom have suffered dreadful trauma and suffered persecution in their homeland, which is the only reason why they've taken the risk and putting them hands in themselves in the hands of these dreadful criminal gangs. I think it's also very important that uh, we, we uh, take account of um, uh, the fact that if we are going to uh, even think about the prospect of sending people to a third, a third party country, there has to be a guarantee, as is evidenced in, uh, in the Amendment 8, that people have a right to return and to establish their claims here. If, that's, if this is not allowed, then it is simply a case of our throwing the problem away, and that simply seems to me to be immoral and not something that we as a nation should be contemplating. I think that we, what we need to, to do is to look very carefully again at putting this burden on the people of Rwanda um, and how we might think much better about working together with other nations in developing a pattern which is going to help us in the longer term cope with um, a huge access of further migration through climate change, which of course we've not even contemplated yet and which will affect us very deeply. Pleasure to follow the right Reverend Prelate with his uh, fascinating and personal knowledge Rwanda and the very useful advice, it seems to me, that he has given us this evening. I've put my name to the seven amendments set out by the noble Lord Anderson of Ipswich, and I don't intend to refer in great detail to any of them, particularly at this time, and because I would like to get home uh, before midnight, if that was possible, and I'm in the last group. But uh, shortly, the points I wanted to make are these. It's obvious that Clause 1, 2, B, is out of kilter with Clause 1, 3. You only have to read Clause 1, 3 to see that the government of the Republic of Rwanda has agreed to fulfil. That seems to me to be partly the present, but almost certainly partly the future. And in the treaty, which we poured over in the debate that I listened to and didn't speak, I thought enough people had spoken, uh, the discussion on the 10 requirements uh, are clearly not all fulfilled. And the right Reverend Prelate points out, and he knows, he's been there, uh, that the structures are not all yet in place. There was a brave effort uh, by the noble Lord, noble and learned Lord, the Minister, to talk about it was safe, it, discussions are safer. That's splendid wording, but it doesn't really work in this House when we look at the fact that the government wants this House to say, despite our vote at the treaty a debate, that Rwanda is safe when it patently isn't. And speaking as a former lawyer, as well as a 
fairly long-term member of this House, I cannot believe that any government is asking us to say that something is what it may well be, and for the sake of Rwanda, if they really want our refugees, I hope it will be. But quite simply, it isn't there yet. And right round the house, we're all saying it from the first few words. So how on earth can this government absolutely, this government expect this house to agree to a phrase that the act gives effect to the judgment of parliament, parliament including us, that Rwanda is safe. And I very strongly support what has been said by the, no the learned, uh, noble and learned Lord Hope of Craighead. It seems to me that to some extent, subject to issues of modern slavery, to which we will come uh, in another um, group, that the bill could be partially redeemed by two points. One set out by the noble and learned Lord in Amendment 6. And the second would be what is set out in the various amendments headed by uh, Lord Anderson of Ipswich of an independent reviewer. And if you had the twin of will be when it's ready and an independent reviewer to assist the government to say that at least the requirements in um, Clause 1.3 and in the treaty, the 10 requirements of the treaty have been met, then I have no doubt the government could say, now we can send people to Rwanda. But I plead with the government. I can't believe they are really expecting us to say that that which is not safe is safe at this stage. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that the noble and learned lady should call herself a, an ex-lawyer. That was very, <laughs> very good indeed. I said at second reading <coughs> that um, we lived in a constitution that was akin to a three-legged stool with Parliament and the government and the judiciary in a balance uh, between those legs. And I think it's very important to realise how key to our constitution that stool really is. And of course, uh, Clause 1-2-B uh, represents grit in the relationship between those legs. Uh, the, the requirement that um, this House enters into a judgment that many in the House feel is very wrong, a judgment which is everlasting, and we heard at second reading from the noble Lord, Lord Donald of Salford about the political risk within Rwanda at the moment very eloquently, is a, and, and a judgment that's largely in a vacuum because uh, a, a number of questions have been uh, fired at the noble and learned lords, the minister, about where we are with safety and things. That is, that is very difficult for a house to do and is grit. And that represents further grit because, of course, it will be something that the judiciary has to take account of uh, when it comes to determine anything as well under this bill. So that's why I find the amendment package that the Noble and Learned Lord, Lord Hope has put together so very attractive, and I do hope um, that the government will look at it for reasons of logic alone, but for a second reason, because the second half of uh, my submissions at second reading were to do with the Salisbury-Addison Convention. Now, that is a convention that's completely about creating relationships between the two of the legs of that stool and a smooth relationship. And indeed, we're here tonight because of that convention. We're working late, sitting extra late tonight in order to smooth things through because part of that convention deals with speed of consideration. But I do hope the government will think of the convention when it thinks to the, the way in which Lord Hope has expressed the provisions for the amendments and the, the amendments and, and the bits of the, of the draft bill which represents grit in relationship. To have a convention which is all about promoting a relationship, and then to have a bill before us which is all about putting grit in the relationship is something which is, has to be thought of in terms of the convention. My Lords, um, each and every amendment proposed to this bill just shows the sheer nonsense of it 
and uh, we are being forced by this government to deny reality. We are being forced to create an enduring piece of legislation that actually states a proposition that Rwanda is co conclusively safe, which cannot be rebutted by even conclusive proof to the contrary. I mean, this is Alice in Wonderland. It's complete and utter nonsense. Now, I've signed Amendments 6, 20 and 26 um, in the name of the Lawn, Le, uh, Noble and Lawn... I'm sorry, it's very late for me, you know. I mean, really, sitting this late. Um, in the name of the noble and learned Lord uh, Hope of Craig's Head, I, I'm, I've tucked myself onto his coattails because they are incredibly sensible amendments and that they at least require the Rwandan Treaty to be given effect and to remain fully implemented for this Act to have effect. But even with that, I'm not sure that we could legislate that conclusively Rwanda is safe. So my uh, Amendment 93 would go further. It would require this whole Act to be scrapped on the day that the Secretary of State is presented with evidence that Rwanda is not conclusively a safe country. Now, you might call this a wrecking amendment. I would call this um, a huge dollop of sanity in this, in this mad world of this particular Act. Uh, surely the Minister and all other noble lords would support this, because why else would anyone want a piece of legislation to exist on the statute book with a key provision that every decision maker must conclusively treat the Republic of Rwanda as a safe country, if Rwanda is not conclusively safe. Rwanda is either conclusively safe or it isn't. If it is conclusively safe, then why do we need legislation to force decision makers to treat it as such? And if it is not conclusively safe, then why would we force decision makers to treat it as though it is? This clause is either pointless or plainly false. Now, I, I, I struggle to see how this bill was ever written. Really? Lawyers wrote this bill? I cannot believe that anyone is going to defend it when it's so patently stupid. Can I just rise? So I, 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 so I entirely agree with those who have spoken and said that the direction of travel of the amendments the Noble Lord, uh, Lord, Lord Hope and Noble, uh, Lord, Lord Anderson suggested are ones we should both look ourselves at carefully and encourage the government. It seems to me that government has got itself in a pretty strange position. If it wants to proceed with what it wants to do, it's, it's, made it, it's given itself a binary choice. Either you legislate a fundamental untruth, or you've got to find a way of establishing a system which will bring about and give confidence about the safety of Rwanda. And if it doesn't want to do the former, which it shouldn't, it then should investigate ways of doing the latter. <coughs> My Lords, could I first of all address the remarks that the Right Reverend Prevalent, the Bishop of Lincoln, said? And speaking entirely for myself, nothing I say is intended to cast any aspersions on the state of Rwanda or the suffering they have gone through or the plight that they currently find themselves in. And his remarks, I thought, were incredibly moving. The Supreme Court made clear it was not a lack of good faith that had led Rwanda to be in the position that it was in. It was that they just did not have a system that could properly deal with an analysis of asylum claims in a way that would be acceptable to the commitments we, as a country, have made to asylum seekers. Could I also agree very, very strongly with what the noble and learned Lord, Lord Hope of Craig Head said and what the Baroness uh, Butler Sloss said, that Section 1, insofar as it says Rwanda is a safe country, is not right, and it is completely wrong for us as a parliament or us as the House of Lords to agree to that which we know is wrong. Could I address the four alternatives that are now before the House as a means of trying to deal with that? First of all, the noble Lord, the noble and learned Lord Lord Hope of Craig Head's proposal that one can only give effect to the provisions of the Act if the joint committee set up under Article 16 of the Rwanda-UK recent treaty says that the agreement is being complied with 
and they've got to act on the advice of the monitoring committee. In principle, that sounds quite a good idea. One should be, as the noble and learned Lord, Lord Hope of Craighead acknowledged, one should recognise that the joint committee is, and I don't say this in a disparaging way, it's just the two governments. So if it is the joint committee alone, that gives no additional assurance because the UK government wants to do this come what may. It's very hard to imagine that the Rwandan government is going to say that they are not complying with a treaty which they say they are complying with and which they've committed themselves to comply with. So if it was only the joint committee under Article 16, that wouldn't provide much protection, I say with, my, with some respect. The provision, that the amendment that the noble and learned Lord Lord Hope proposes says they, that is the joint committee, have got to act on the advice of the monitoring committee. So it's only if the monitoring committee positively advise that the agreement is not being complied with, that the joint committee of the two governments will be prevented from giving the advice that they want to give. I have no idea how this monitoring committee will work. It will presumably be 50-50 both sides. I don't know if it's paralysed, whether or not the requirements of what the noble and learned Lord Hope is saying would then be satisfied. The joint committee if it doesn't, wasn't getting positive advice one way or the other, would still be able to give the assurance that one gives. Could that be dealt with by a number of tweaks? It might well be. But subject to those points, I can see attraction in what the noble and learned Lord Lord Hope is saying. The only other point I have on his proposal is that the minister appears to escape any, any duty at all. And shouldn't we have a situation where the minister should be subject to judicial review in the decision that he takes about whether to implement the treaty. The Lord, I'm very grateful to the Noble Lord, Lord Falkland's um, comments on the significance of the Joint Committee. I only introduce it at the beginning. The, the, for the future, it's entirely a matter for the Monitoring Committee to advise us whether the, the system is being fully implemented as it has once has started up. So, but uh, and it could, one could actually, I think, remove the Joint Committee altogether and just have rest entirely on the Monitoring Committee, which would be very close to the Noble Lord Lord Anderson's position and indeed Lord Coker's. So I think we're working towards a solution of some kind, but uh, I, I welcome very much the helpful comments of the Noble and Lord Lord. Great. And, and just if one goes straight to the other proposal, which my, my noble friend Lord Coker has put his name to, as well as the noble and learned Lord, Lord Hope, which is to get the monitoring committee to decide, then the, only, the two wrinkles would be how does this monitoring committee work? And it requires a positive assertion by the monitoring committee that they're breaking the terms of the agreement. If they can't get it, for example, because they're deadlocked, then this act is given effect to as far as the, the, the third alternative, so that's the second alternative, the monitoring committee. The third alternative is the noble and learned Lord, Lord Anderson's proposal that there be an independent reviewer. If he says it's not safe, then this act is only given effect to, as I understand it, if there is a resolution of the House of Commons saying it is safe. Now, that has some attractions. I'm not attracted to it at the moment because. First, the House of Commons has shown its willingness already, not because they are dishonourable people, but because they are whipped by the government, who has a significant majority, to pass an Act of Parliament that uses the word is. And secondly, surely such a resolution has the same vice as this bill, which is that one is asking the House, one's asking Parliament to sit in judgment on the question of whether Rwanda is a safe country. And that is an inappropriate activity for Parliament. So I am in favour of one or other of the noble and learned Lord and Hope's proposal contained in uh, Amendments 15 and 16, or the Monitoring Committee, subject to my anxiety about how does the Monitoring Committee work, and subject to I strongly submit we shouldn't let the minister off the hook. He or she should be subject to judicial review. Of course, one has great sympathy 
with what Baroness Jones of Wolfscombe says, but the, our attitude, although it, is, it, it sticks in the gullet, we nevertheless have to try to make this bill work. My own view is, if you're going to do offshore processing or you're going to do deportations to save country, the one thing you've got to be sure is you're acting in accordance with the law. And what makes this bill so discreditable is not necessarily the policy which people can disagree with about offshore processing or third countries, but to try and do something like that in breach of the law. And we should be working to get to a point where we're acting in accordance with the law. Lord, but I'd like to say a word in defence of, uh, uh, of the... Uh, of the amendments in the name of the noble Lord, Lord Anderson of Ipswich. And, uh, mine is the louche, unlearned name on the uh, <laughs> otherwise very learned amendment with uh, Lady Butler Sloss and uh, Lord Carlyle. Um, we would be in a different situation if the independent reviewer, in a public document, a reasoned document, put forward the case that the country wasn't safe, that refoulement was going on or could go on, there weren't adequate systems to stop it. That would be different. Here we're talking about uh, the, the difficulty of working out what, what it will be like when the treaty is in operation. Then we would be in that situation and the review would be presenting the House of Commons with the presenting Secretary of State and the House of Commons, with a uh, report which, let's say, it was uh, uh, critical, a critical report. I think it would be rather more difficult for the House of Commons to conclude that it didn't care about the evidence. There now was evidence, unlike the present situation, they, it, it would have to say, we reject the evidence. So I, 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 I stick with uh, my uh, loose support for the Learned Amendment. As for the other Learned Amendment, um, the Noble Lord, Lord Hope of Craig Head's Amendment, of course, it, uh, I understand that, and it seems to me that that, that too has uh, much merit. It, it, it has two possible downsides. One, uh, the Monitoring Committee works for the Joint Committee which is strange when you think about it. You might think it should be the other way around. <coughs> but the, uh, it would therefore be very important, as Noble Lord, Lord Anderson said, that the monitoring committee's reports were published in full. There's a second um, possible downside, um, and that is the composition of the committee. The, uh, the Noble Lord, Lord Hopes, uh, spoke of one member of the committee. Another member of the committee is Alexander Downer. That seemed to me to be a bit of a downer. Uh, this is the man who is the uh, chairman of Policy Exchange. This is the man who invented the Australian scheme. This is the man who pressed hard for pushbacks, actually shoving the, the ships, the little ships, uh, off to Papua New Guinea, uh, something that our Royal Navy has always refused to contemplate. Uh, the, the committee has to be comprised of persons independent of both parties. I'm not quite sure, to be honest, how independent uh, Mr Downer is of the government. However, um, I... My name is also on the, um, I claim to, my name is on nine amendments, I have to tell the no law, law, Anderson. Sorry, Anderson. Uh, my name is on the amendments the name, uh, the, the, to which Lord Blunkett spoke. And uh, I do see some attraction in the, uh, the, the Blunkett scheme. If the government are convinced that the system in Rwanda is fair, if they are convinced that asylum seekers are given a fair hearing and a fair assessment, then why should we not accept that they're, if they are given asylum status, 
they should come here. The beauty of this is he is turning offloading into offshoring. Uh, the distinction is one that some of us in the House haven't always seemed quite to follow. What we are proposing with Rwanda is something that has never been done before. There is absolutely no precedent. Because we are telling these people, we are transporting you to Rwanda. You may, if you want to, seek asylum in Rwanda. You can never seek asylum in the United Kingdom. Indeed, you can never come to the United Kingdom. They may have decided to make for this country because they knew our language, because they had family here, because they uh, had connections here. There may be, in addition to their escaping from uh, uh, persecution, fear, war, famine, and they won't be given asylum status anywhere unless they are escaping from them. They may have chosen to come here because they have a reason for coming here. They probably don't have the same connections in uh, Rwanda. The largest number of asylum seekers come crossing in small boats at the moment come from Afghanistan and Syria, two countries which have quite close links to the United Kingdom and uh, not very close links to Rwanda. Uh, I think it is a... It, it, I'm against offshoring. I think offshoring is... Uh, it's unkind, it's cruel, it makes it more difficult to provide legal advice advice on age assessments, the making of age assessments, psychological support if it's necessary. These people may be fleeing from terrible persecution. I think, uh, so I'm against it. But I don't think it's illegal, and it certainly isn't unprecedented. What is unprecedented and illegal is uh, what we are proposing to do. So if we were to convert offloading <coughs> into offshoring, I still think it's, it's undesirable, but it's not illegal. And I see Lord Murray of uh, Blidworth is in his place. So I'd just like to explain why I say what we are proposing is illegal. Because Lord Murray said at second reading, he accused me of a, a misperception when I said that... Uh, offloading our asylum seekers to a third country would breach international law. Uh, I, I maintain that it does, and I cite UNHCR, who in their January memorandum say that the UK-Rwanda asylum partnership runs counter to fundamental principles of global solidarity and responsibility sharing that underpin the international refugee protection system. It shifts responsibility for identifying and meeting international protection needs from the UK to Rwanda. By entrenching responsibility shifting, the treaty remains at variance with the spirit and letter of the Refugee Convention. I, I give it. Thank you. Does, um, uh, I, th I thank the Noble Lord for giving way. Does the Noble Lord agree that uh, the divisional court in the Rwanda proceedings uh, upheld the principle of um, remote third country processing, that it was lawful in UK law, and that decision was upheld in the Court of Appeal, and it wasn't appealed further to the Supreme Court? So it is unquestionably the case, I think the Noble Lord will agree, that it is entirely lawful. It's a breach of international law. The, uh, the noble lord made the same point. We had the same debate at, uh, at second reading. But it, it is uh, at variance with the uh, Refugee Convention and with the European Convention on Human Rights, Articles 2, 3, and 13. Uh, it, it, it may be that in the UK domestic courts, 
uh, that is not seen as a problem. It certainly doesn't seem to be seen as a problem by the noble Lord, Lord, Lord Murray. For me, it is a problem. And I think for uh, a country that purports to support uh, the international legal system, it should be a problem. Um, I don't think that the committee needs to apologise for an element of repetition and even circularity in, um, in contributions in the various groups, because that is the nature of the, uh, of the bill before us, that it's a relatively short bill, but its provisions are interconnected, as are the different approaches that, that, that the members of the committee have taken to amendment. But just to take stock for a moment, because we have been on a bit of a um, stream of consciousness, uh, members of the committee have expressed different opinions about whether offshoring um, per se is acceptable. The exchange we've just heard, I, um, to my mind, reveals the fact we don't currently have, um, we don't currently have a legal authority in the UK that says that processing asylum claims in another country is unlawful. I, I, so I agree with the noble Lord, um, Lord Murray of Blidworth, on that, but I have to say that my instincts are with the noble Lord, Lord Kerr of Kinlockhart, on the fact that this is, a, this is going to be debated for many years to come, and we haven't had higher court determination of that, and it's a, it, it's a debated point internationally. That is one point that we can, we can put aside for the moment. There is another question in this bill about what is and what might be in the future, and I think most members of the committee have either agreed or even reluctantly conceded that what is is a little different from what we're working on and what, what might be in the future. Which, that, which then takes us to how we change the future and how we evaluate changed facts in the future. And then under the scheme of what is before us, there is first the question of the treaty and then the question of the bill before us that the government proposes to make an act. I think there is some considerable support for, um, for clause 14 that says that the treaty, which is currently a very important trigger in the government scheme because it's the treaty coming into a force that makes the, the, the bill, the, the act come into force. The treaty needs to have been effectively implemented so that facts change on the ground in Rwanda before even the treaty that is the current trigger for the act can come into force. And I certainly agree with that. There are different approaches in the amendments as to how that should be measured, but I think it, it, is, just in, it is just logical that until the treaty, as suggested by the Your Lordship's International Agreements Committee, until the treaty is effectively implemented, even under the scheme of, of the bill as drafted, the Act should not come into force. And then, my Lords, we have a, a range of amendments are offered in subsequent groups about what commencement should look like in this bill. And then later, we will have very important debates yet to come um, about judicial oversight and not ousting the jurisdiction of both domestic and international courts. Three points. First of all, to correct Lord Kerr, uh, that there is a precedent in the Australian situation in that uh, in the under the Australian rules, the government of Nauru makes the decisions with assistance and training and support from the Australian government. In, here, in a wonder situation, that would be the same we are trying to bring in training and support and assistance to the Rwandan government. So the, the two examples are exactly the same. Uh, and Australia, which has been working successfully for 10 years, has all party support and is hugely successful. If I may repeat the point that I made earlier in the day, there is a great prize here. If we can genuinely get an agreement uh, on this subject, there is a prize for having a proper whole immigration policy which the whole country can support, not just this Rwandan business. Do you want, do you want to give way? No. Uh, well, second of the point, may make a different point. You want to intervene? I, 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 I hate to cross swords with Lord Horan, but what he's saying is factually incorrect, I'm afraid. The Australian uh, hearings in uh, Nauru are for asylum in Australia. The, U the hearings that the Rwandans would carry out in Rwanda on people who came here would be for asylum in Rwanda. 
that the people who are being investigated in Nuraira, in Nuweru, are people who want to go to Australia. Similarly, the people who are investigating in Rwanda, people want to come here. The situation is exactly the same. But my second point would be that, and I think, no, certainly. The noble Lord, Lord Horam, I think there is, even within that whole processing offshoring debate, there is a question about if you succeed in your asylum claim yes. when you're processed over there, do you stay over there or do you come back to the, the country from which you're sent? And that is a crucial debate that, that I think is, 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 is being fudged here. Yeah, My point really is that the situation here is exactly analogous to the one in Australia and they've been working successfully for 10 years. But the other point which has come out of the whole debate is the importance, and I'm here to refer to Lord Hope's uh, amendment, which I think is very interesting. The, the important thing is the monitoring which goes on. And I do agree with Lord Anderson and Lord Hope that the more transparent and the more obvious that this is, the better from everyone's point of view. Because fundamentally, we can't expect the law to do everything. If we have a law, we all know there are many laws which are not actually adhered to in practice. It may go wrong on the ground floor in a way which lawyers, and for all that's been said in the treaty, uh, are not aware of until it's too late almost. And therefore, you do need a strong monitoring committee to which is the information to which is available to this House and to the public generally. And I think that because you can't do it any other way, the law cannot, compass, cannot encompass what may happen in the future. So I do think that is crucial, and it's one of the points which has come out. And I would have thought my noble friend could possibly accommodate the relative transparency of the monitoring committee, which is independent, has independent people on it. I mean, Lord Kerr may not like some of the people because they may disagree with him, but nonetheless, it is independent and will have no doubt people of differing views, precisely because it is independent. And I think that is something the government perhaps should look at in response to the sort of tone of the debate we've had this evening. Uh, my Lords, I wish to speak in favour of this group of amendments, particularly amendments 6, 14, and 20. But I do wish to avoid what Baroness Chakrabarti was saying, is a certain circularity which has been inevitable today and something that is so interconnected. So, on another point, the Home Secretary has said, and I quote, we will not operationalise this scheme until we are confident that the measures underpinning the treaty have been put in place. Otherwise, the treaty is not credible. This set of amendments enables this approach, I, I would like to contend. So I would ask the noble lord, the minister, to explain, if the government are not willing to accept these amendments, how will they ensure that the obligations of the treaty, and I quote the treaty here, can both in practice be complied with and are in fact complied with? This is an even more pertinent question, given any recommendations arising from the monitoring arrangements in the treaty are non-obligatory. My Lords, to take just one example from the government's own evidence pack, that a new asylum bill is required in Rwanda before an assessment of the implementation of the treaty can be made. May I ask the noble Lord the Minister when this legislation will be published and will it be, to use the official term, fully operationalised before any flights take off. Much wisdom, wisdom has been articulated in this chamber today. I urge the government to listen and act accordingly. Uh, my Lords, um, can, I, can I just uh, say, moving my own uh, amendments of 64 uh, and 65, which I seek to address the problem that uh, all noble lords have been seeking to address, which is the problem with clause two, uh, clause one two b. Um, in other words, the clause which, uh, the part of the clause which just basically says uh, that uh, Rwanda is a safe country. And Lord Hope was quite right in moving his amendment six to point out the word "is" is absolutely fundamental to the meaning uh, of this act and why there is such a debate and discussion amongst your lordships here because the government is stating that Rwanda is safe 
where all the evidence is that it may be safe in the future or will become uh, safe, uh, or in the uh, words of Lord Stewart, where the government are working towards, or Rwanda is working towards being safe. That is not the same as being is safe. And that is the fundamental dilemma. And let me just say to the government, if something is completely and utterly wrong, as is the use of the tense present when it should be a future tense, it doesn't matter what you do, you simply cannot answer the questions that are being put. Two and two has to make four. And the government is arguing that two and two is three. And it's ridiculous, it's a nonsense, and it won't stand up. Now, I don't mind whether my, my um, Amendment 64 and indeed 65 um, are not um, legally watertight. I accept that. I'm not sure, Lord Hope, I'm sure it'd be legally watertight, but may not be the best uh, amendment. Lord Anderson's proposed an independent reviewer. Um, and there can be a debate and a discussion between ourselves as to which is the best option, and there may be other options which are better. I uh, would prefer that the whole Act was opposed and defeated, but that is not going to... We've said we're not going to block it, we're not going to delay it. I know that's disappointing to some, but that's the reality of where we are. So what we seek to do with others is to mitigate the impact, to try and improve the bill. But what the government's response so far has been is to say all of the criticisms are not correct, that Rwanda is safe, because we are legislating to say it is. All the rest of the debate and discussion and points that are being put forward very reasonably are simply dismissed. I'm sure when Lord Sharp gets up uh, uh, and replies, um, he, unless I'm mistaken, will have a brief which will say the, there is no need for any of these amendments. The monitoring committee is established in the uh, treaty, uh, in Article 15. It's established in Article 15. There's no need for any of this to be included. And that way simply lies, uh, I think, a legislative impasse. Because the whole point of what we're saying uh, is to the government is to listen to what is being put. So the real question of the debate is actually not whether, with due respect, Amendment 6 or 15 or 64 is better, but is what is the government going to do in response to the legitimate criticisms that are being made here in your Lordship's House about the fact that what we want is some sort of mechanism by which we can understand how the government is going to ensure that, according to its own logic, that the, the treaty is going to be implemented uh, and is going to be successful in that implementation. And what happens if it's not? What happens if the obligations are put there and not achieved? And I have to say that the, 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 the very real question that, that Baroness Butler Schloss put is, that it, it is about if, if, two, sorry, if one, two, B is right, why do you need one, three? Uh, and the minister couldn't answer it. Because you know, one three sets out the obligations that Rwanda are required to do in the future, whereas one two B says, well, there isn't any need for those obligations because it already is safe. The bill itself contradicts itself, yeah. as Baroness Butler Schloss points out. But the government's point at the moment is, it's, it's almost like they, they've got a bit... The, the government says that you're all wrong and we're right, therefore we're going to carry on. And that's no way to legislate. That's no way to, to actually pass a law. The government wants its Rwanda bill, so it's going to get its Rwanda bill, but at least listen to what people are saying and make the bill that it wants make sense and actually do what it says. So, as I say, my Amendment 64, I'm perfectly willing to look and see whether other uh, amendments are better or there's a better way of, of, of doing this. But the real question is the government simply going to dig in, refuse any uh, amendment, uh, refuse any appeal to them to try and make the bill more logical than it currently is.
because I say to the minister, this will have to become, this will, we, we will have to come back to this at report. And it's clearly important for us in deciding how we do that to hear what the government has to say. My Lords, once again, um, can I thank all noble Lords um, for speaking in this particular group and in particular the noble and learned Lord, or Lord Hope for his um, introduction. <coughs> Um, my Lords, the UK and Rwanda entered into the Migration and Economic Development Partnership with a commitment to develop new ways of managing flows of irregular migration by promoting durable solutions and so breaking the existing incentives that make people embark on dangerous journeys to the UK. The UK and the Government of Rwanda have a shared vision regarding the necessity for the global community to enhance international protection for for asylum seekers and refugees, underlining the importance of effective and operational systems that provide protection to those most in need. Um, this partnership is a part of a suite of measures to tackle illegal migration and builds on wider collaboration with Rwanda on many shared issues. Now, as I've set out in, uh, previously, we have assurances from the Government of Rwanda that the implementation of all measures within the treaty will be expedited, and the treaty itself will follow the usual process with regards to scrutiny and ratification. And I'm afraid, to, I would say to the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Norwich, I can't improve on that, and I will continue to defer to the Home Secretary. I would like to provide reassurance to noble lords that the treaty enhances the role of the previously established independent monitoring committee, who will ensure obligations under the treaty are adhered to in practice and will be able to take steps to address any concerns at an early stage. Therefore, the Government argues that the amendments in the noble and learned Lord, Lord Hope of Craighead's name are not necessary, although of course I take his points about words, and would also say, um, as the noble and learned Lord said, that this bill reflects the strength of the Government of Rwanda's protections and commitments given in the treaty to people relocated to Rwanda in accordance with the treaty. So it addresses the point made by the Supreme Court that Rwanda's, Rwanda's systems could be strengthened on the basis of the facts before the Supreme Court at the time. My Lords, Amendment 14 in particular would impose a requirement for the Joint Committee for the Migration and Eco Economic Development Partnership to provide a declaration to the Secretary of State confirming that the mechanisms specified in Article 2 of the Treaty have been implemented. Without such a declaration, the effect of the amendment would be that the Treaty could not be regarded as fully implemented. This is unnecessary. We have assurances from the Government of Rwanda that the implementation of all measures within the Treaty will be expedited. My Lords, turning to Amendments 15, 16, 77, 83 and 88 in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord Anderson of Ipswich, and Amendments 64 and 65 in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord Coker. My Lords, the Monitoring Committee is independent of both the UK and Rwandan governments. It was established under the Memorandum of Understanding, which originally underpinned the partnership, um, and the Treaty enhances the Monitoring Committee's role. Article 15 of the Treaty provides that the UK and Rwanda must establish and maintain a monitoring committee for the duration of the term of the agreement. This means that both parties are obliged to ensure that the monitoring committee continues in operation for the life of the agreement, and this obligation is binding in international law. The Government has already established robust reporting mechanisms. The monitoring committee's terms of reference and enhanced monitoring plan are available publicly on gov.uk. And they set out that during the period of enhanced monitoring, the Monitoring Committee will report to the Joint Committee, which is made up of both UK and Rwandan officials, as set out in Article 15, 4B, in accordance with an agreed action plan, which will include weekly and bi-weekly reporting as um, required. My Lords, I think it would be helpful to go into a bit more detail on this. Um, the Treaty includes enhanced provisions to provide real-time independent scrutiny of Rwanda's asylum pro procedures aimed at preventing the risk of mistreatment contrary to Article 3 of the ECHR before it has the chance to occur. This addresses the findings in the Supreme Court proceedings that under the previous arrangements, as set out in the Memorandum of, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, the work of the Monitoring Committee would necessarily be retrospective. In addition, the new provision of the Monitoring Committee's own complaint system will allow relocated individuals and their legal advisor to make direct and confidential complaints regarding any alleged failure to comply with the obligations in the agreement. This enhanced phase will ensure that monitoring and reporting takes place in real time so that the Monitoring Committee can rapidly identify, address and respond to any shortcomings or failures to comply with the obligations in the agreement and identify areas for improvement or urgently um, to escalate issues prior to any shortcomings or breaches placing a relocated individual at risk of real harm. 
This will include reporting to the Joint Committee co-chairs within 24 hours in emergency or urgent situations. Um, my Lords, as per Article 15.4c of the Treaty, the Monitoring Committee will make any recommendations which it sees fit to do to the Joint Committee, and the Monitoring Committee will otherwise produce a formal written report for the Joint Committee on a quarterly basis over the first two years of the partnership setting out its findings and making any recommendations. So following notification to the Joint Committee, the Monitoring Committee may publish on, uh, reports on its findings as it sees fit. At least once a year, it will produce a summary report for publication. We consequently consider these arrangements, which have been carefully agreed with the Government of Rwanda and will be binding in international law, to be sufficient to ensure continued compliance with all the terms of the treaty. Finally, I'm grateful to the Noble Lord, Lord Blunkett, for his amendments 8 and 72. Clause 1 sets out the obligations that the Government of Rwanda has committed to under the new treaty. The proposal in this amendment does not reflect the arrangements under the treaty. Requiring persons whose claims are successful in Rwanda to be returned to the UK would be against the spirit and intention of the treaty and the partnership. Those relocated to Rwanda are not intended to be returned to the UK except in very limited circumstances. My Lords, if it is the Government of Rwanda who will be granting refugee status to those relocated to Rwanda through the treaty which will underpin the Migration and Economic Development Partnership, not the UK Government. The grant of refugee status in Rwanda does not confer upon that person any rights within the UK, as would be the case for any other person granted refugee status in Rwanda who had not been re relocated from the UK. Anyone who wishes to come to the UK in the future would have to apply through legal routes, through a work or a family route, and there would, however, be no guarantee they would be accepted. And my Lords, relocating asylum seekers to a safe third country, as my noble friend Lord Murray of Blidworth um, noted, to process their, uh, process their claim is compliant with the UK's obligations under the Refugee Convention, as confirmed by the High Court and the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court did not um, uh, disturb that particular finding. Mr. Noble Lord would answer two very simple questions. One is, where else in the world have people been offshored but actually offloaded as opposed to having the, <coughs> the process completed and their refugee status acknowledged in the country they reached? And secondly, what happens if people don't claim asylum in Rwanda? Well, my Lords, um, under the terms of the Bill, a person will be relocated if they have made a protection claim, i.e. an asylum claim, in the UK. Um, but we can also remove, remove those who don't, to be clear. Um, and as regards to the rest of the world, I think we've heard a very lively debate as to other uh, examples from around the world. I'm afraid I'm not an expert on those examples, so I'm not able to opine further. I was uh, living in hope that um, the noble Lord, the Minister, having declined to answer my questions at an earlier group about the compatibility of what is being proposed by the government with the criteria set out by this House with a majority of 43 some weeks ago as being necessary to have been operationalized and to be in effect before Rwanda could considered a safe place. Would he now like to take the opportunity to work his way through those 10 points? Because uh, I'm of infinite patience, but he did say that in a later group he would do so. So could he now do so, please? Uh, I won't at this precise moment, but I will again defer to the Home Secretary. He made his, his views very clear in terms of um, operationalising the bill. Um, uh, my Lords, as my noble friend Lord Stewart of Delton set out earlier in the debate, Rwanda does have a strong record of welcoming asylum seekers and looking after refugees and it has also been internationally recognised for its general safety and stability. Those relocated to Rwanda will be given safety and extensive support, as detailed in the treaty, and I'm grateful to the officials in the Government of Rwanda for all of their efforts, in particular with regards to the provisions for real-time and comprehensive monitoring of the end-to-end -end relocation and asylum process for individuals relocated under the partnership. So I hope I've at least been able to go some way to respond to the noble and learned Lord, Lord Hope's amendments and on that basis that he would be content to withdraw them. I'm grateful to all the noble lords who have spoken in this very interesting debate, um, and particularly grateful to those who have offered some support to my Amendment 6, which seeks to reword uh, clause, uh, the clause with the word is in it, 
and substituting words which are far more in keeping with the, the, certainly what I think the majority of the committee were discussing uh, throughout the proceedings this afternoon. I am very disappointed with the, uh, the noble Lord the Minister's reply because he simply brushes it aside as not necessary. But for anybody who would listen to the debate with care, they would see it is absolutely necessary to change the word yeah, in yeah. clause, and we will certainly have to come back to it on report. As for the various options, uh, we have a, a, a menu, uh, and I think those of us who have put in forward suggestions as to how the matter might be regulated will uh, think carefully as to where we go from here, but we will certainly come back to it on report. Uh, Lords, the only other point I would like to make is that I was very taken with the point made by the noble Lord Lord Blunkett about the, whether the House of Commons really appreciated the significance of uh, offloading uh, people to Rwanda, particularly those who, when they reach there, don't claim asylum. It, it's a horrifying situation, really. These people just cast adrift uh, to a country which, as the noble Lord Lord Kerr was making, is probably has had no connections with uh, what they were really looking for, and, and indeed they had probably good reasons for coming to the United Kingdom for a variety of reasons. It's a, a deeply disturbing situation, and I have no doubt Lord Blunkett will uh, pursue the matter a little further, because it's, it's, it really illustrates the harshness of the measure that we're being asked to consider. Having said all that, my Lord, I withdraw the amendment. Lordship's the amendment be withdrawn. Amendment by leave withdrawn. Amendment seven, Viscount Hailsham, not moved. Amendment eight, Lord Blunkett, not moved. And so we now come to Amendment nine, Viscount Hailsham. I uh, beg to move Amendment 9, standing in my name, and I will also speak to Amendment 13. I am going to be very brief, my Lord, because the hour is late. At this time, I am usually putting my dogs out, but um, <laughs> on this occasion, I have the pleasure of addressing your Lordship's house. The effect of Amendment 9 is to delete paragraph 1-4 of the bill, and the effect of Amendment 13 is to delete one sex of the bill. And it's worth just reminding your Lordships what these two clauses say. Clause 1 4 of the bill says this It is recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom is sovereign, and the validity of an act, any old act incidentally, is unaffected by international law. And you then go to clause 1 six to see what is meant by international law and that is everything to which we have ever put our name and it's detailed in very considerable detail so the first question that your lordship should ask yourself is why on earth is it there i have no doubt that as a matter of strict law the statements are correct but why are they there? They serve no legislative purpose whatsoever. I know, I think, why they are there. Uh, they are there to provide comfort to the Braverman wing of the Conservative Party. And I, for one, do not wish to provide comfort to the, uh, con that wing of the Conservative Party which I think has been bringing disrepute on the party which I have served for 40 years. So we then go on to consider, um, does it serve a purpose? But it clearly doesn't serve a purpose. But what it does do is to damage our reputation for probity. Because any bystander reading this bill will come to the conclusion that the given word of the United Kingdom, expressed in treaties and in international law, is not worth credit. And I do not wish to give people that interpretation. And nor, for that matter, does a select committee on the Constitution of your Lordship's House, published on the 9th of February. And I commend to your Lordships Paragraphs 54, 56, and 57. Paragraph 54 acknowledges that it is true that the validity of an Act of Parliament in domestic law 
is not affected by international law. <coughs> Nevertheless, the United Kingdom is still subject to the provisions of international law. Paragraph 55 says, we agree with Lord Bingham that respect for the rule of law requires respect for international law. Paragraph 56 says, legislation which puts the United Kingdom in breach of international law undermines the rule of law and trust in the United Kingdom in fulfilling future treaty commitments. And the summary section, paragraph 57, we reiterate that respect for the rule of law requires respect for international law. Legislation that undermines the United Kingdom international law obligations threatens the rule of law. Conclusion. We invite the House to consider the consequences should the enactment of this bill in its current form breach United Kingdom's international obligations. This is an unnecessary two clauses. It is damaging to our reputation. It serves absolutely no legislative purpose, and in my view, it should be removed from the bill. Just one moment. Amendment proposed, because I presume that Viscount would like to move his amendment. That's all right. No problem. Uh, amendment proposed, clause one, page two, line four, leave out subsection four. And, um, my Lords, I'm very proud to, to have signed uh, the noble Viscount, Viscount Hailsham's um, two, two amendments. When I first looked at them, I thought, given the scale of obscenity that this bill <laughs> perpetrates, maybe this is flotsam, maybe this is just you know, stating the obvious that for, for, for many years we've passed Acts of Parliament and sometimes... Um, aspects of those um, of that domestic legislation has has subsequently been found to to be in breach of international law and as a matter of domestic law um, a statute is not automatically um, invalid because it breaches international law without incorporation of the kind that we had with with the EU and with um, the Human Rights Act. However, I thought again, having spoken to the noble Viscount and, and, and having thought again about the contemporary implications of a provision like this, and that's the, the provisions that we find in clause in clause one four and clause one uh, one six, uh, I felt compelled to agree with him and to sign up to his amendment because it's the signal that we are sending, my lords. It is a signal that we're sending initially to domestic civil servants and diplomats and ministers, including in the context of the ministerial code, that we don't think our international obligations matter. And that's a very, very significant cultural concern. And I think, I think it was perhaps the noble Viscount who made the point in relation to the Rwanda Treaty earlier that we are, in the context of this bill as a whole, saying it's going to be all right. Rwanda isn't just going to be safe in the future. We can just assume it's safe now because of this treaty, because of this international binding agreement that Rwanda will, of course, respect because it's binding in international law, while simultaneously saying that international law does not affect the validity of UK yes. law. So that's an extraordinary position, and it's an extraordinary um, position to put UK civil servants, whether in the border force, whether in the home office, whether, uh, whether diplomats, um, um, anywhere in the world. But it's also, I, I, think, I think the Constitution Committee and perhaps my noble friend Lord Faulkner of Thoroton may comment on this as a member of the committee in a while. It, th there are real tensions for ministers um, and, and, and their duty to comply with the rule of law to, um, to put a provision like this on the face on the face of primary legislation, notwithstanding the traditional point about the delicate relationship between, between the validity of domestic law um, and international law. And then, of course, there is the bigger question. There is the existential question. At this particular moment in the world, 
and the state of insecurity in the world and where the United Kingdom is, is, is putting itself right now in relation to Russia and Ukraine, events in the Middle East, Houthis, you know, we are, we are China, we are saying, you know, we are saying on the one hand, international law matters. Uh, uh, frankly, Mr. Trump across the Atlantic with the remarkable comments that he's made about his NATO allies, we're saying one thing, including with arms, with military support, with, with rhetoric um, about, about the importance of international law and, 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 and do not breach it, because if you breach it, you will, you will find us standing in your way. And then at the same time, we're going to pass a provision like this. So I, I have to apologise to the noble Viscount for not seeing the vital importance of his amendments to begin with, but I certainly see them now. And we cannot continue in your Lordship's house in this committee, in this chamber, week after week after week, to have noble lords and ministers come before us, come before us one minute to talk about the situation in various parts of the world, to talk about you know, the importance of the UK as a, as a permanent member of the Security Council and everything it will do, including by military force, to uphold the international rules-based order as it has attempted to do over decades over many decades. We cannot have that going on one minute and then there's a dinner break or a change of, you know, a, a change of personnel and then we have the Home Office back here saying uh, we're going to pass legislation saying international law doesn't matter. So for those reasons I am very proud to support the noble Viscount, Viscount Hailsham. Lord Viscount Hailsham mentioned the Constitution Committee and I have Amendment 10 in my name which also seeks to, enforce, uh, to reinforce the position of the Constitution Committee's report to this House. Uh, and the amendment is that the simply, and, and it comes to something when we have to try and define the purpose of this House, but the amendment is that the primary responsibility of Parliament and the Courts is to uphold the Constitution of the UK, including that Constitution's fundamental commitment to the rule of law. And the bit, of course, that we're talking about here is the separation of the two legs of the stool, which uh, the noble Lord Kinnell was talking about, between Parliament and the courts. It is the role of Parliament to enact legislation, and it's the role of courts to apply legislation to the facts. Clause 1-2-B breaches that separation of powers between Parliament and the courts. And further to this, Parliament is overriding the rule of the courts by replacing a factual assessment of the court with a deemed factual assessment by Parliament. The courts have procedures to evaluate evidence and determine the facts. In asylum cases, they are daily making assessments of safety and risk. Parliament exists to legislate rather than making these assessments based on the valuation of evidence. And although the sovereignty of the UK Parliament is an established principle of the UK Constitution, there are huge consequences when legislation is enacted which significantly impacts that separation of powers. So this bill is a dangerous precedent in which legislation could be used to reverse factual conclusions, jeopardising the rule of law as well as the separation of powers. My Lords, we may think this legislation is for other people in our society, for people not like us, but the precedent this sets can be taken and applied wider and wider to achieve a political aim. We need to be live to how marginalised people in our society are being treated. And this is a marker of the values and priorities of our government who make decisions which affect us all. And I, my Lords, I believe that it's clear from the debates that we've had in this House today that members of this House are not comfortable with what the government is trying to do with this legislation, to replace the findings of fact of the highest court of the land with its own assessment of fact based on the evidence yet to exist in practice. My Lords, we would mock other countries for trying to do that, and that's why this amendment is so important, just to lay down what Parliament and the courts are for. Support to the two amendments by the noble Viscount, Viscount Hailsham, uh, which I think are entirely valid. Uh, it does strike me as a bit odd 
that the government assures us again and again that nothing in this bill is in breach of our obligations under international law. They say that with great determination, uh, and I'm not suggesting that they don't believe it. Uh, but in that case, these clauses are completely unnecessary, totally and utterly unnecessary. On the other hand, if the government has doubts about it, and certainly uh, the warning that uh, the Home Secretary was bound to give, that he wasn't absolutely quite sure that this would pass muster uh, under our international obligations, then, of course, you want to put clauses like this in. Then that totally invalidates the claim that you're not breaching international law. So a, a very simple question I would ask the Minister to reply to. I know there's a reluctance to reply to questions, but let's have a try on this one. For a very long time, for a very long time, this government, this country, worked to the principle of my word is my deed. Is that still so, yes or no? I, support, I welcome the government's determination to stop the boats and and I commend the provisions to disapply six sections of the Human Rights Act 1998 and to leave open to a Minister yeah. of the Crown whether to comply with an interim remedy from a court or tribunal that prevents or delays removal. I wish the Government every success and I hope the Bill will succeed. But the Bill needs further tightening to avoid potential legal challenges that would prevent it from achieving its aims. My Amendment 32, therefore, is to disapply, for the purposes of this Act, the re relevant international arrangements and other law that prevents the UK from controlling its borders. The first reason, then, for this amendment is a practical one. It is pointless to make a law that is unlikely to work, and that, sadly, seems to be the case for the present Bill unless it is amended. The second reason is a deeper one. There is no doubt that there is a popular wish for the small boats to be stopped, and that one of the reasons why the government was elected was to control our borders. Unless it makes a law strong enough to withstand whatever challenge might be brought to it through national or international law, the government will be failing the people on whose support the laws made to govern Britain should be grounded, and trust in the democratic system with its political parties, parliament and go government and the judiciary will be lost. I do not accept the narrowness of contemporary theory about the dominant position that international treaty law should command. The apparent demand that international law should trump UK law is a form of legal and ideological utopian internationalism. By con sorry, please, of course. Is it therefore the noble baroness's position that if indeed there would be extensive refoulement by Rwanda, that would not be a reason for not having this bill? Uh, I thank the noble lord, and I, that is not my view. My view is, nonetheless, given the ingenuity of many learned lords in this House and, out, uh, uh, and the judiciary members of the bar barristers and solicitors outside this chamber, there will definitely, I would say, there will, may very well be um, in, intelligent and ingenious challenges which will hold up the operation of this bill, and that is why. I want to bring my amendment. By contrast, there are treaties that govern trade, diplomatic or military alliances, and they deal with national interests of a state, and at one remove its people. Many who advocate the preeminence of international law base themselves on theories of universal rights formulated in the heady days of treaty making in the decades after World War II, for a European world by and large, and circumstances very different to our own. These arrangements 
have provided a quasi-legal framework for demanding that the wishes of potentially, potentially I say, unlimited numbers of people from outside the UK should Thank the noble lady for giving way. I'm sorry. The phrase for a European world uh, does make me wonder whether the, the noble lady believes that uh, internationally agreed human rights apply around the world and should not just apply in Europe. The noble baroness for her interjection, but I am referring to the treaties emerging from the post-war Second World War world, which was to very much a European world at that time to deal with circumstances which had been left over and had arisen, such as the Holocaust and other such circumstances arising from the Second World War. I do agree that uh, there have been um, constant movement in this area, and for instance, the, the European Court at Strasbourg continues to make judicial interventions, sometimes trying to push the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, much further than it was initially drafted to, to cover. However, if I may just continue, I do think then they were conceived for a European world by and large, and circumstances very different to our own. These arrangements, as I've said, provide for potentially unlimited numbers of people from outside this country to command priority over the express and explicit wishes of the citizens of this country. Today, my lords, mass immigration threatens the democratic arrangements of Western countries, the political systems on which they rest, and the stability on which societies and their economies depend. The threat does not stand over Britain alone. The failure of governments all over Europe to stop clandestine or illegal immigration is destabilizing their governments. Um, it's also destabilizing their political arrangements. The difficulty of controlling long land borders all over Europe, the difficulties thrown up by the Schengen rules, now, I fear, ignored in many cases, has brought instability and undermined the democratic order. So too have international obligations embedded in domestic law and constitutions. The Swedish Democrats, who advocate tight controls on immigration, have shocked to being the largest party in the centre-right governing bloc. For Denmark's left and its social democratic prime minister, Mette Frederiksen, Denmark's um, uh, greatest challenge, he says, is non-Western immigration. Italy can no longer process the volumes of asylum seekers arriving in small boats in Lampedusa and has called on the EU to help. France passed a measure on immigration only to have the very amendments that had allowed it to pass after 18 months or two years of wrangling struck down by the Constitutional Court. The UK is in a more fortunate position than these countries, since it is subject neither to Schengen nor to the constraints of EU membership. This country and its people have the power to make its own laws. Their legitimacy derives not from arrangements made for times and circumstances different from our own, for a Eurocentric world to be interpreted by internationalist institutions at a remove from democratic accountability. And I refer to uh, my noble friend, Lord Howard, who isn't in his place, but I think the question of democratic accountability must be central to any debate on controlling the UK's borders. It is often uh, un un unaccountable to the for the consequences of the rules they liberally apply. So our government has indeed recognised in drawing up the present bill, but it has held back from the final measure needed to make it effective. My amendment, like the same one proposed in the other place, will ensure that the bill is fit for purpose, a purpose fervently desired by the people of this country. My Lords, uh, I rise to uh, support the um, amendment in the name of my noble friend Baroness Lawler.
And uh, I'm going to speak generally about the bill very briefly and then the amendment, and also to uh, say why I very strongly oppose the amendments in the name of my noble friend Viscount Hailsham and uh, Lady Chakrabarti, which I think are pernicious and dangerous. Um, I, I can't believe that when uh, my noble friend uh, Viscount Hailsham sought election in the county constituency of Sleaford North Highcombe in 2010, he would have told his constituents that he would seek to uh, disregard the rights and privileges of Parliament in favour of supranational legal entities and international treaties, because I suspect that would not have been a very popular point of view to take. But that seems to be uh, the logical inference from the uh, amendment that he has uh, put forward today. Uh, the bill does contain some important statements of principle in that it reasserts the sovereignty of Parliament and its right to legislate to cut through the morass of alleged international norms which currently frustrate the ability of the United Kingdom to control its own borders under Clause 1.4. The partial disapplication of aspects of the Human uh, Rights Act. Uh, I, I thank you very much. Could I just ask the noble Lord, um, does he realise that the government and um, previous governments have signed and ratified the international um, agreements and treaties about which we are talking. Well, I will develop my argument about the uh, tension between domestic legislation, parliamentary sovereignty and the rights and privileges of Parliament, and the international obligations and a universalist human, re human rights regime, which uh, many uh, noble lords seem very content to support in preference to the former. Um, I, uh, the noble lord, whose, whose complaint appears to be about supranational bodies. I don't know if the, he's aware, or well, I'm sure he's aware, that his own amendment disapplies any provision made by or under the Immigration Acts, that's domestic law, the Human Rights Act 1998, that's domestic law, any other provision of, or rule of domestic law, including any common law. So why is he complaining only about supranational bodies when his amendment seeks to disapply great tranches of domestic law? Well, uh, the, the noble and learned Lord will be well aware that the Human Rights Act 1998, for instance, uh, arose from the European Convention on Human Rights and the obligations in domestic legislation uh, to that particular uh, convention. So, but there are other examples. I'm sure the, the, the hour is late, so if, if the noble... And learned Lord will permit me, perhaps I might. Well, I would, I'd be grateful for an to the question of what he says about any other provision or rule of domestic law, including common law, nobody could suggest that was derived from abroad. The, the wording of the amendment is such, uh, as he will know, uh, that, that it is there is a declaratory and, and unambiguous amendment, and uh, I'm glad he's allowed me to make that point that the amendment. Uh, our amendment, the amendment Baroness Lawler and I put down, is explicit and unambiguous for the reason that it cannot be misinterpreted uh, further down the line in, outside this chamber uh, in the judicial setting. So that is why it's copper bottomed. It may not be quite to his liking, but it's there for a reason and the wording is there for a specific purpose. If I, can make, if I may continue as the hour is late, Your Lordships. Um, as I've explained, the amendment aims to disapply for the purposes of this Act the relevant international arrangements and other law which prevents the UK from controlling its borders as the people of this country have elected their government and their members of Parliament to make happen. To that end, the laws we pass in this Parliament must be clear and unambiguous. Lord Reid, the President of the Supreme Court, in dismissing one claim on the 15th of November judgment, uh, that of ASM and Iraqi, was that a court may not disregard an unambiguous expression of Parliament's intentions. And like Baroness uh, Lula, I agree with the, with the concept, the narrowness of contemporary theory uh, and a universalist view, which a logical corollary of which leads to a belief in open borders because it's practically impossible in any other way in the current regime for us to control our borders whilst we remain uh, encumbered by international <coughs> obligations 
which seek to subvert and, and undermine uh, this, the sovereignty in this parliament. And I do think it's worth making the point again that, and it's not a noble point to make, that both the 1951 Convention and the European Convention on Human Rights need to be updated in a geo geopolitical regime where there are mass movements of people and even people who would not take the view of supporting this particular bill or this government's wider policy on immigration understand. And, and I have to say for uh, a former esteemed member of the previous Labour government, this will be an issue for any future Labour government. It is not, it's very easy in opposition to strike poses uh, like Baroness Chakrabarty and say we've got to signal what we think and what we do on this really pressing issue but we're not here to signal we're here as legislators to to pass legislation to have oversight and scrutiny not to virtue signal to the world and undermine the uh, and uh, if I may and undermine uh, the sovereignty of this parliament with the noble Lord, Lord uh, Jackson of Peterborough, that we do indeed need to address the immigration problem, but surely it would be better to address it in accordance with the law than in breach of the law. Well, um, my uh, point, um, which I hope will address uh, the noble Lord Faulkner, um, yesterday I was in uh, Huntingdon Town Hall uh, watching a, a, um, a play, a recreation uh, which was the, child, the trial of Charles I, which took place from the 20th to the 30th of January 1649. And obviously it didn't end well for Charles I, who was uh, arraigned on a charge of treason for making war against his own people. What he really did, though, of course, is usurp Parliament. And uh, he grabbed for himself the privileges, the age-old privileges that Parliament then said... Uh, uh, it bestowed upon itself uh, of a sovereign parliament and it was the ultimate demonstration of the rights and privileges of that parliament to put to death for, uh, in, for the first time in history their own king the point being that the sovereignty of this place is a precious thing and I do think that the amendment uh, put forward by uh, Viscount Halsham, my, my noble friend Viscount Halsham does really unbalance the three-legged stool that the noble Lord Kinnell, who's no longer in his place, uh, made reference to uh, in his earlier uh, comments. I draw the attention specifically on that issue to, uh, and, and uh, noble and learned lords will no doubt be aware of this reference, A.V. Dicey's Doctrine of the Supremacy of Parliament. Uh, the eighth edition uh, of the... Uh, the book, the textbook, An Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution was published in 1915 and it um, outlined what the concept of parliamentary sovereignty and the supremacy of parliament was. And if I may read it uh, to noble lords, the three key points of parliamentary supremacy were that, one, parliament can make any laws, it cannot be overridden by any body, and that parliament cannot bind its successors nor can it be bound by its predecessors. And the fact is, the wider point is, of course, that we are a dualist parliament. We do not cut and paste international treaties uh, into law without proper scrutiny and oversight. And obviously, that involves primary legislation and secondary legislation going through the proper procedures uh, in this parliament. And that's been upheld by the appellate committee of the Lords in its time and of course the Supreme Court. And treaty obligations have effect in domestic law only so far as they are expressly incorporated into domestic law. And the sovereignty of Parliament is fundamental to our rule of law and cannot be circumscribed by uh, international law, opinions or even conventions. Lord Hoffman in Regina versus Lyons of 2002 said and uh, noble lords will forgive me, it's a very important point, so I read it in full. It is firmly established that international treaties do not form, in, form part of English law and that English courts have no jurisdiction to interpret or apply them. It is not the treaty, but the statute which forms part of English law. And English courts will not, unless the statute 
expressly provides, be bound to give effect to interpretations of the treaty by an international court, even though the United Kingdom is bound by international law to do so. The sovereign legislator in the United Kingdom is Parliament. If Parliament has plainly down, uh, laid down the law, it is the duty of the courts to apply it, whether that would involve the Crown in breach of an international treaty or not. And in Bradley and Ewing's authoritative book, Constitutional and Administrative Law, it is clearly stated that the legislative supremacy of Parliament is not limited by international law. The courts may not hold an act void on the grounds that it contravenes general principles of international law. Indeed, the Labour government, and the noble Lord Faulkner will be aware of this, in 1998 specifically reaffirmed the sovereignty of Parliament in relation to the Human Rights Act. So the amendment we put down specifically makes that point. And as I finish, I'd just like to say to noble lords, that convention and, and even law itself or international treaty obligations can be circumscribed and undermined to an extent by this government. And I would draw Noble Lord's attention, for instance, to the prisoner vote issue of 2005. Uh, when I served in the other place, it was very much the settled view across the parties, including the Labour opposition, uh, the Labour government rather, and the leader of the opposition, uh, that uh, we would not accept. Uh, prisoners who had been incarcerated, custodial sentences over a certain period, receiving the vote. Uh, and that was anathema to the then Prime Minister uh, David Cameron, the case being Hurst ver versus the UK number two, ECHR 681 in 2005. <coughs> and there was no up outcry, there was no uproar then, there was a settled consensus in this sovereign parliament that the British people were not prepared to subsume their views and, and attitudes and opinions on uh, uh, prisoners sentenced to life imprisonment, having the vote, having those civil and human rights uh, that other people did. And this issue will come up again, of course, when we debate later in this committee the issue of marriage of whole life tariff prisoners. And, and one other example, of course, uh, Madame Merkel uh, uh, disregarded the Dublin Convention in 2015 in uh, allowing uh, over a million Syrian refugees to come to the country, which was in breach of Germany's obligations under various uh, treaties. So in conclusion, my Lords, this bill is imperfect, of course, and it is flawed. Uh, I may not have even voted for it were I still in the other place, but that's another issue. But noble Lords, some noble Lords clearly want to hobble this bill, make it inoperable, and kill it with multiple amendments. We know that, and it's only honest <coughs> to say so. But the amendment moved by Viscount Halsham uh, moves the dial far too much towards judicial activism and away from parliamentary sovereignty, and for that I must ask noble lords to resist it. And I say finally to uh, particularly those assuming a ministerial responsibility potentially later this year, potentially on the other side of this chamber, be careful what you wish for. Because you will have eventually to put in, if you're elected to government, if Labour are elected to government, to put into place an election manifesto because the people have given you the faith and trust so to do. And to undermine that uh, by subjugating parliamentary sovereignty to international treaty obligations which may change against the interests of a Labour government and the British people is a hostage to fortune. Parliamentary sovereignty and undermining it may seem a prudent thing to do in opposition, but the burdens of high office mean that one day the boot may very well be on the other foot. And for those reasons, uh, I very strongly support my noble friend Baroness Lawler's amendment and resist the amendments moved by Viscount Helsham and Baroness Chakrabarty. My lords, my lords. I, rise to, um, I, I rise to move the amendment. Standing in my name and in the name of my noble friend Lord Morrow, um, and this amendment uh, relates to the uh, application of the uh, bill across all parts of the United Kingdom. And I want to explore with the government, and I'd be interested in hearing their response, as to whether or not, in fact, despite Clause 81 stating that it extends to England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, whether, in fact, 
um, that is the case, uh, given the uh, effects of Section 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, which is, of course, the conduit by which EU law flows into Northern Ireland um, under the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, also known as the uh, Windsor Framework. Uh, so whatever one's view of the merits of the bill, um, it appears to apply across the UK according to this bill with equal effect. And of course, that, that should be the case. Uh, immigration law has always been uh, something that applies uh, with equal effect right across the United Kingdom. Otherwise, the danger is that one part of, of the country will be operating different rules with all the attendant consequential problems that will arise from that. So, so what is the position then as a, 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 that this bill would have? What is the effect that this bill would have uh, in North, on Northern Ireland? Um, as uh, we know, um, under Article 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which still remains fully in place um, uh, today, despite the, uh, the recent command paper which the government has published, um, under Article 2, there is no diminution of rights uh, uh, for Northern Ireland compared to what previously existed under the Belfast uh, Agreement. And the government argues that um, the uh, issues of immigration um, have, are not captured uh, under that uh, provision uh, and that therefore the bill uh, it, it can proceed and that Article 2 uh, does not uh, have any effect. However, my Lords, in my view, um, there is no doubt that Article 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 allows for the continuing application to Northern Ireland uniquely within the United Kingdom of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and EU General Principles. And I would refer the, uh, Your Lordships and the Minister to the recent High Court case in Belfast, uh, uh, the judgment in the Armin Anderson case, uh, 18th of October 2023, a case of judicial review. And at paragraph 94 of the judgment, uh, it was stated, uh, and I quote, the combined effect of Art Section 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 and Article 4 of the Protocol limits the effects of Section 5.4 and Section 5.5 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in Schedule 1, Paragraph 3 of the same Act, which restrict the use to which the Charter of Fundamental Rights and EU general principles may be relied on after the UK's exit from the European Union. Thus, the Charter of Fundamental Rights remains enforceable in Northern Ireland and falls within the ambit of Article 2.1 of the Protocol. And within the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, of course, is Article 18, which has rights of asylum. So is it not the case that despite its stating on the face of this bill and in Clause 8, one that it extends to Northern Ireland, that in fact, because we do not have a notwithstanding clause in relation to Section 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, that in fact Northern Ireland is not now in the same position or would not be in the same position as the rest of the United Kingdom um, were this bill to proceed on amend. Um, and if it is the case that that is so, then the government needs to be totally transparent and open about it. We have had examples recently of legislation coming to this House, and we had a debate recently on, on, on a matter to do with trade, in which um, amendments were brought to illustrate the fact that despite the bill being silent on the matter, major provisions of that bill could not apply to Northern Ireland because of the effects of the protocol stroke Windsor framework. So I would ask the Minister, if there is no uh, problem, then they should have no difficulty in accepting the amendment in my name, which will clarify beyond any shadow of a doubt that the, uh, this bill, and as I say, whatever the merits of it, and that, uh, but, but the, the principle should be that it should apply across the board, across, across the United Kingdom, because otherwise what we will find is that uh, Northern Ireland will become a magnet 
for <coughs> asylum seekers and others who will say that the, the, the less rigorous application of procedures and, and, and sanctions uh, will not apply in Northern Ireland and therefore people will want to move there. And of course people then who do come into Northern Ireland will wish to move to the perhaps to the rest of the United Kingdom and not only will we have a trade border but potentially a people border at some point in the future uh, as well. So I want the, the Minister to look very, very carefully at that judgment uh, which I have referred to in the High Court in Belfast uh, to explain why he believes that the uh, amendment therefore is not relevant. Uh, in terms of the one that I have put down along with my noble friend, and to explain if it is the case that uh, we are curtailed in Northern Ireland or subject to, I should say, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, how asylum cases will be processed and dealt with in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. What we have in effect here is another example of how Northern Ireland, whatever your views on a particular issue may be, doesn't have the right to decide, or even people in this Mother of Parliaments, either in the other place or in your Lordship's House, or in the Northern Ireland Assembly, do not have the right to decide these things for themselves, whatever side of the argument they may come down on. But these are matters that are decided now for them as a result of the application of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the direct application of EU law uniquely, uniquely within this United Kingdom to one part of it. And I think that that raises very, very serious constitutional issues and very, very serious issues about democracy itself. All right. My Lords, I rise to speak against Amendments 9 and 10 and possibly 13. Uh, the first thing I need to declare is that I'm a member of the Joint Committee of Human Rights, but that personally I did not agree to the full report. Uh, like Baroness Jones, who is not in her seat, I will have to say that I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a woman and therefore I'm a pragmatic person. And the one thing about this bill is that everybody criticizes it but basically, nobody gives us an answer about how to deal with what is actually a huge problem. And I very much, seeing it as a pragmatic person from the outside, I see it as a totally political discussion, rather than people getting together to try and find a solution. And the problem is that there is no silver, silver bullet solution to regaining control of our borders and dealing with the immigration, how to deal with all those people dying coming into the United Kingdom. But as far as I see it, the Strasbourg Court does state that members have an obligation to comply with interim measures, but it does not say anywhere that they are compelled to do so. Therefore, the argument that Parliament will undermine the rule of law by authorising ministers to decide whether or not to comply with Rule 39 interim measurements, measure, measures is incorrect. The other argument that is advanced by people who are opposing this bill is that our reputation across the world will be damaged. But this is not a proven belief. It is unsubstantiated. The reality is that the whole international migration system has got totally out of control. And our government is taking decisive actions to protect our country's border, strengthen our national security, stop their appalling trade and ultimately save many unnecessary deaths. But isn't people keeping its citizens safe and the country secure the primary duty of any government? 
British citizens generally welcome migrants and value the importance of migra migration, but they are becoming more and more reticent at the idea of footing the bill, seeing the pressures on our NHS, schools and housing. This bill is not anti-immigration, but a pragmatic response to the urgent crisis. One cannot compare previous waves of immigration, such as Jews and others, who were forced to leave their country and were limited in their numbers. Faced with the scale and cost of the current migration into the United Kingdom, doing nothing is not an answer. I realize that this bill is not perfect, but it is a first step. It will, if we do nothing, there will be political consequences, as the noble baroness pointed earlier, and we can see that in the rise of popularism and anti-immigration movements in the rest of Europe. So this is why I object to these am amendments, because they will strip away parliamentary authority to decide not to comply with the Rule 39 interim measures, and therefore go against the whole idea of this bill. I'm prompted to intervene by Amendment 80, um, which has been so uh, ably introduced by uh, Noble Lord Dodds. Although I don't support that amendment, I think he has uh, raised a very significant issue. He referred to Article 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, as amended by the Windsor Framework, and to the principle of non-diminution of rights. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, as he knows, has a statutory duty under the Northern Ireland Act 1998 to monitor the implementation of Article 2 to ensure that there is no diminution of rights. As the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission explains in its advice on the Rwanda Bill, which was referred to in the Constitution Committee's um, report of last week, and I declare an interest as a member of that committee, the rights not to be diminished include the EU Procedures Directive, this requires, among other things, by Article 27, that a third country can be considered safe only where the authorities are satisfied that key human rights principles will be respected. Uh, the uh, Procedures Directive cannot be satisfied by a deeming provision. That is not the way EU law works. It requires decision makers to be untrammeled by legal fictions and it requires convincing evidence that third countries are safe in practice. So there would appear to be a clear mismatch uh, between uh, what the bill says and what the procedures directive preserved in Northern Ireland says. And my understanding is, although I'd, I'd um, uh, submit to uh, noble lords from Northern Ireland on the detail of this, is that this is by no means a theoretical question. Official statistics do not provide an accurate picture of the extent of human trafficking on the island of Ireland, but the Northern Ireland refugee statistics for December 2023 record that there were 3,220 people receiving asylum support in Northern Ireland. They were eligible for that um, because they were destitute on arrival. So echoing uh, the Noble Lord Dodds's call for transparency and openness uh, in this matter, my questions to the Minister are as follows. First, does he agree with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission report, and in particular its conclusion that clauses one and two of the bill are contrary to the principle of non-diminution of rights under Article 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol? And when he responds to the Noble Lord uh, Dodds on his Amendment 80, would he also explain how, uh, consistently with the Northern Ireland Protocol, this bill can apply in Northern Ireland at all? I rise to speak to amendments 9 and 13. I uh, obviously have the greatest of respect for uh, my um, noble friend uh, Viscount Hailsham and uh, the noble uh, Lady Baroness Chakrabarti. But if one looks at the two sub clauses which uh, they spoke uh, at the beginning of the debate in favour of the removal, so sub clause 1 4, which says it is recognised that. that 
the Parliament of the United Kingdom is sovereign and the validity of an act is unaffected by international law. And then at subclause 6, uh, it defines what the term international law means. My Lords, there is nothing at all controversial uh, in either of these clauses. Indeed, uh, subsection 1.4 is a classic statement uh, of the legal position. And I'm afraid, my Lords, that I find it frankly bizarre for uh, uh, speeches to be made in this House expressing outrage at the temerity of the fact that they've been put by the Government into Section 1 uh, of this Bill, uh, as though they are some dark secret only to be discussed amongst lawyers in quiet corners of the Inns of Court. My Lords, it's simply uh, a, a frank statement, and it has every place appearing in Clause 1 of this Bill, where it will help the courts interpret the provisions of this bill. And indeed, you can see in the interpretation provision uh, at the end of this bill that it refers back to clause 1.6. And for those reasons, I oppose the amendments proposed by the noble Viscount. Yeah. I will acutely aware of the hour. I will be extremely brief uh, and restrain myself. Um, I'm going to rise to offer green support for amendments 9 and 10 and 13. And I'm simply going to say, in terms of amendment 9, um, uh, and I declare my position as co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group in Hong Kong, uh, I'd invite um, noble lords who are opposing these amendments to turn this around and say how we would feel when the Chinese government says, well, we're just going to ignore the Sino-British Joint Declaration, as indeed the Chinese government does, and we rightly condemn that behaviour, and we hope we'll continue to do so. And on the second point, I have to commend the noble lord, Lord German, for, um, I think, really trying to fix the British constitution. Um, uh, which, is, which is a brave attempt, particularly at this hour of the evening. Um, but um, I was reminded, looking at the Noble Lord's Amendment, of the um, conclusion of the historian Peter Hennessy, that we suffer from the fact we have a constitution, our uncodified or unwritten, whichever you prefer, constitution, that relies on the theory of people being good chaps. And good chaps will just follow along and do the right thing. And we are well past the point. It is very, very clear that we can rely on the government being good chaps. Uh, my Lords, can I uh, just to make a couple of brief uh, comments? Um, but just to say, I think Viscount Hailsham, um, uh, in his amendments 9 and 13, actually makes uh, a hugely uh, important point. And just say to, to Lord Jackson, I'm quite happy um, if I were to be able to stand again or indeed vote uh, at the next uh, general election. But I'm very happy for my own party to stand um, on the principle that it will abide by international law. Uh, and I think that that is um, something on which the Labour Party will be proud to stand. It's clear with respect to his own party that there's a division, frankly, between the position that Viscount Hailsham had, where he espoused what was the traditional, and in, in, in my view, the well-respected view of the Conservative Party, um, the view of the Conservative front bench, uh, which is to uh, the right um, of uh, Viscount Hailsham, but to the left of, uh, of, of the noble Lord, Lord Jackson. I'm afraid Lord Stewart has got it from, not just from, from his, the, his Majesty's opposition, he's got it from the right and left of the Tory party. Um, so we'll be interested to see how he uh, responds to that. But can I, can I just say on, on, on the issue, uh, the validity of an act is unaffected by international law. Uh, and then I, I, I think Lord Murray mentioned um, Clause 1.6, uh, where it details the international law that can be ignored or is irrelevant under this act. It is quite astonishing uh, and I would say to noble lords, if they haven't read 1.6 or they haven't got it in front of them, it is worth looking at virtually every single international treaty or convention which this country has been a proud member of, often for decades, is simply to be ignored or irrelevant with respect to um, uh, uh, validity under this Act. Human Rights Convention, Refugee Convention, 
International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1966, the United Nations Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, inhuma, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment of 1984. Uh, my Lords, the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, done at Warsaw on the 16th of May 2005, customary international law and any other international law or convention or rule of international law whatsoever, including any order, judgment, decision or measure of the European Court of Human Rights. Of course. Um, maybe I'm preempting uh, the noble lord and incidentally I very much hope that if there is a Labour government he's a senior figure in it because he was a had exemplary service in the other place. But uh, that, that being said, um, what is his answer when there are a material change of circumstances from the time of the 51 Convention and the European Court of Human Rights? Big geopolitical changes. Um, and there is an inco incompatibility between the weapons uh, that are available in current domestic law and the uh, stresses from international treaty obligations. What will his party do to square the circle? Unilateral action. What we will do is to seek to work within the international framework to bring about the changes or to bring about um, any refinement that needs to be made. Indeed, many other countries across the world do that in the, in the light of the particular circumstances that they have. What I would say to the, uh, to the noble lord and indeed to his colleague Baroness Law is uh, a question that Baroness Jones just posed. Um, what, what, why are we taking action in the Red Sea? What, what, why, why are we able to do that? Because we're conforming to international law. Why can we say what we are saying towards China and their attitude towards Taiwan, their attitude, their appalling attitude to Hong Kong? We can say that because of their... If, 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 allow me to finish, and of course. Uh, the, it, because, of their, uh, because of international law. Why are we able to support Ukraine in the way that we're doing? Because of our, uh, 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 our adherence to international law. Those things are not just done in the past, as the noble Lord, Lord Jackson will know. There have been very serious questions that have been raised that when people have been said to have acted not in a way which is consistent with international law. That is the importance of it. The, the anarchy that will ri arise across the world if simply everyone abandons that and pursues what they consider to be their own interests. That way lies disaster. On all I'm saying, in a small way, um, but in a very important way, us saying that we don't believe that this, uh, the, 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 the act with respect to Rwanda should simply be able to ignore international law is not the right approach for His Majesty's Government, of course. Uh, the Noble Lord will uh, just make me clarify. I did specifically mention international diplomatic, military and trade treaties which are in the interests of a country and its people. And the contrast was with international treaties made some years ago um, for different circumstances. Now, it may well be in the future we can make international treaties to deal with global problems, but the international treaties which we, you, to which the Noble Lord referred, they, are in, they govern maritime trade, they govern other matters, security alliances and so on, and they are direct and immediate in terms of the impact on the people of this country. And my point is to defend the interests of people and parliament and democracy because we can't have laws that aren't grounded in trust. It's an interesting debate, but my argument would be that you can't pick and choose. That you can't simply decide that something is not uh, something you agree with at a particular time, therefore you abandon it. Um, as I say, if, if that were the case, then we have no case with respect to n numerous countries across the world who suddenly decide at a particular moment in time, because a new government has been elected which has a particular political ideology, oh, well, we'll abandon that, cons that treaty we've had with X, that treaty we've had with Y. The new Chinese government has abandoned all, with respect to, we heard from her no no noble friend, um, Lord Patton, uh, when he spoke of the, the way in which the new Chinese government simply abandoned everything that it negotiated with respect to the withdrawal from Hong Kong. That, that, that's a new circumstance, but it's not right in any sense of the word by simply just them unilaterally abandoning an, in, abandoning an international treaty. And that is the fundamental point that, that goes to the heart of what Viscount Hailsham is saying. He's saying the proud tradition of this country 
not just, if I might say so, his party. The proud tradition of this country is to adhere to the international agreements, to be able to walk into a room full of diplomats, and for those diplomats, those people, to know that when we say something, we mean it. And when we say something, it will be adhered to. Sometimes it is actually on the basis of trust, but that trust has been built up over decades and is something we play with at our peril. Uh, to the noble lord. We heard him a moment ago read out the list of the uh, international conventions uh, set out in subclause 1.6, as though in some way this provision was a, a clause which would have the effect of disapplying those domestically. That is clearly not the effect of the drafting. All clause 1.6 does is define what the term international law means in other places in this statute. So all it is is a definition clause. Uh, so I'm unsure why the noble lord felt obliged to read it out as though it was of great importance uh, on the basis that we were resiling from these conventions. As is clear from my noble friend's speech, uh, we are not uh, in any way resiling from these obligations. Well, they've put 1.6 in the bill if it's completely purposeless and meaningless. Uh, I mean, it's obviously got to mean something for it to be included in the bill. And all I'm doing is saying that the validity of the Act uh, reading from the Act says the validity of an Act is unaffected by international law and then it defines what international law is. And I'm simply pointing out that there's a big list of uh, international conventions, international legal treaties that we've been members of in many cases for decades, which we are now saying unilaterally doesn't apply with respect to this Act. I think that's a very significant constitutional change and something is to be regretted and therefore that's why I welcome the fact that Viscount uh, Halsham has brought forward his amendments 9 and 13. And why I say to, to Lord uh, Jackson, and I can thank him for his nice remarks about myself, but just to say to him that I'm quite proud of the fact that, as the, that I expect and believe uh, and will demand of the Labour Party that when it stands for election at the next general election, one of the ways that we can win, in my view, is to say that we're proud to stand up for the international law on which this country has, based its, uh, has, has traditionally been adhered to and actually been a propounder of across the world. And that is why in many cases we take action in many areas of the world to, uh, to reinforce those rules. And that international rules-based order is something, as I say, of which we can be proud. And the Labour Party will stand, or indeed fall, uh, on the basis of being proud to stand for that. Or that was devised in the 50s when the circumstances were quite different, more important than actually taking care of the citizens of this country? Of course, of course taking care of the citizens of this country is a really important thing to do and a really uh, necessary thing to do. There's no, no debate in, in the chamber about, uh, about that. Viscount Helsham again started the debate right at the beginning of the debate, saying all of us want to stop the boats, all of us believe that illegal migration is harmful to the country, and indeed I would say, and I think many, uh, I think my party also says, that the, the levels of legal migration are too high and something needs to be done with, with that in a controlled and managed way. The debate is how you do that. The debate is in, in, in what is the correct policy response to that. That's where the division is. It's not a division between there or there as to whether we, uh, whether we need to stop the boats. Of course we do. Uh, and, and of course we need to do something about levels of migration. But to do it in a way which undermines the standing that this country has in the world is not the way to do it. That we need to stop the boats and we need to reduce the illegal and legal migration because it's unsustainable. But who has come with a better solution? I mean, those are just steps towards a solution. Again, we, we <laughs> strain a little bit, but I hope noble laws won't mind. But we have, we, I know, but we, we, we have. The, the, noble, the noble baroness may disagree with this, but we've put forward a number of proposals about tough, tougher action to tackle criminal gangs, more cooperation uh, with our European uh, partners, particularly uh, with France, tackling the problem uh, at, at, uh, at source, and that would be through the re-establishment, I might say, if we want to get political for a moment, of the aid budget, which her party cut, but anyway, I won't get political uh, about, uh, about these things. But those are the sorts of things that we've suggested. The noble lord uh, next to her is shaking his head, will disagree with those. But that's not to say that they're, they're actually 
um, uh, uh, actually we haven't got a plan, it's just the noble baroness and the noble doesn't agree with them. But that's the nature of political debate. In this, with respect to these amendments, what I'm saying is that as Viscount, in supporting Viscount Halsham's amendments, to undermine international law is not the way to tackle a problem that we all agree with, all agree needs to be sorted. <clears throat> My Lords, I'm grateful to um, all noble lords who have participated in this debate, which has been uh, a far-ranging one, given the nature of the amendments uh, which have been placed before the committee uh, for the discussion. Uh, My Lords, Clause 1-4 of the Bill at A and B uh, recognises that, or states that it is recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom is sovereign and that the validity of an Act is unaffected by international law. That, my lords, is a statement in conventional terms of constitutional reality. My noble friend, Lord Murray of Blidworth, expressed it with his characteristic clarity and concision. And we have heard nothing in the course of this debate, my lords, not from my noble friend, Viscount Hailsham, not from the noble lady, Baroness Chakrabarty, not from the noble Lord, Lord German, on the Liberal Democrat benches, to disturb that reality. Moving on to, and I'll take matters, if I may, my lords, out of the order in which they were presented, just to deal with them conveniently. Um, the noble Lord Lord Coker replying uh, a moment ago uh, from uh, the opposition uh, front bench uh, asked for the, a word about the status of uh, the instruments in, uh, which are enumerated in Clause 1, Subclause 6. And following on from what I said, my lords, um, it is not the case that this bill jettisons those commitments. What it does is say, as I think, again, my Lord, noble friend, Lord Murray of Blidworth said, is that these, this provision exemplifies what is meant by international law. And when it says that, um, when it lists these provisions, it does so for the purpose of stating what is, again, the constitutional reality that a validity of an act is unaffected by international law, and that includes those provisions. And that is the case, and that always has been the case. Now, I appreciate that not all members um, of the committee think that that should be the case, and we've heard cogent submissions um, from members of the committee to that effect. But the point is that it is the case until such time as Parliament decides otherwise. My Lords, this you Yes. Why, why did you put it on the face of the bill when I, I think all the lawyers in the committee agree that as a matter of domestic law, unless a, a treaty is incorporated directly, it's not justiciable in the UK courts. But nonetheless, as a matter of international law, our word is binding. And my noble friend, Lord Coker, made very clear why it is so important in this dangerous world that our word should be binding. So if this is just a statement of domestic law, why was there the need why was there the need to put it on the face of the bill? Is it that the noble and learned Lord wants to show a bit of ankle to, um, to his, uh, his, his friends who were pushing even further to the right uh, with, with, with their amendment? What on, earth, what on earth is the government trying to signal with this kind of statement on the face of primary legislation? Uh, there are a number of points that I could address there. Um, the matter of me uh, as a minister showing ankle uh, noble lady, of course, speaks metaphorically, but um, I found it as difficult to comprehend uh, as I found the uh, references to a braverman wing of the Conservative Party. That's My lords, um, I go back to uh, so I, I go back to the submission of the noble lady earlier on. International law, as she is well aware, operates on the international plane, not on the domestic plane. And my lords there could be no greater restraint on state action than a treaty. And that is what the government proposes to deliver. To, to reassure the noble lady Baroness Chakrabarty in her uh, submission earlier on about the implications for uh, ministers and indeed for civil servants, uh, it does not bear upon the actings of civil servants uh, fulfilling their duties uh, to assist the government. My noble friend, Lord Hanny, uh, I <clears throat> beg the committee's pardon, uh, the noble Lord, Lord Hanny of Chiswick, referred to uh, section 191b um, of the 
uh, Human Rights Act and was, I think, disparaging uh, about the use of that provision as opposed to Section 191A, uh, which more familiarly is a statement given uh, by uh, the promoter of a bill to state that, uh, in his view or her view, it, uh, it is lawful. Of course, there is nothing unusual about the use of Section 191B in these circumstances. It is entirely appropriate, and that is why it appears on the face of the bill. Uh, and it was used, uh, for example, by the last Labour government in, I think, uh, the Communications Act of 2005. I'll be corrected on that, but it has been used uh, by Labour when in government in those circumstances. The Noble Lord asked... Yes, of course. I don't, through the Noble Lord, will not be surprised to hear, have the figure to hand, but it's readily available from West Law, I would imagine. Uh, the Noble Lord, Lord Hanney, posed the question, uh, <coughs> answer yes or no, um, is does our word continue to be our bond, or words to that effect? Well, it continues to be our bond within the circumstances uh, of the incontrovertible constitutional position uh, set out at subclause 4b of Clause 1. My Lords, the United Kingdom takes, and this government takes, its obligations. I wonder if I could uh, encourage the Noble Lord to try that one out on uh, some uh, foreigner with whose country we are signing a binding agreement uh, and telling him that uh, we'll shake hands on that. But by the way, uh, we can do what we like afterwards. He, he ought to try it. He'd find it quite an interesting experience a treaty commitment uh, of the sort which we've been uh, reminding the House, reminding the committee, is the strongest bond which two countries can enter into. Uh, my Lords, the conventional statement of constitutional reality, uh, as I described it, as uh, my noble friend Lord Jackson of Peterborough described it in his submission, um, was uh, citing A.V. Dicey, uh, was little more uh, than a reassertion uh, of the position, the position which applies in law and which always has. My Lords, the bill as currently worded enables Parliament to come to the same conclusion and provides a statutory finding that decision makers, including courts or tribunals, will conclusively treat Rwanda as a safe country. Amendments 9 and 13, in the name of my noble friend Viscount Hailsham, uh, seek to remove the provision that recognises the sovereignty of Parliament and the provision uh, that confirms the validity of an act is unaffected by a domestic court or tribunal's view that there is a conflict with international law. Now that, my Lords, is at the core of the bill, and many of its other provisions are designed to ensure that Parliament's conclusion on the safety of Rwanda is accepted by the domestic court. The treaty, alongside the evidence of changes in Rwanda since summer 2022, to which we've referred, will enable Parliament to conclude that Rwanda is safe and the new bill provides Parliament with the opportunity so to do. My Lords, I note that Amendment 10, in the name of the Noble Lord, Lord German, is a probing amendment um, which uh, makes it clear that the primary responsibility and the courts is to uphold the Constitution of the United Kingdom, including that Constitution's fundamental commitment to the rule of law. Uh, my Lords, uh, that amendment again sets out the status quo, but the rule of law is, uh, as a concept, uh, difficult to tie down in a series of short statements. And I fear that the Noble Lord's Amendment would be productive of debate in the abstract, producing perhaps more heat than light. I reassure again the uh, committee that the United Kingdom continues to be bound by and respects its legal and international obligations. The bill is predicated on both Rwanda and the United Kingdom's compliance with international law in the form of the treaty, which itself reflects the international legal obligations of the United Kingdom and Rwanda. It does not legislate away our international obligations. The purpose of the bill is to say that, on the basis of the treaty and the evidence before it, Parliament believes those obligations to have been met, not that we do not care whether they have been or not. My Lords, I repeat, the Government takes its international obligations, including under the ECHR, very seriously, and there is nothing in the Bill that requires the United Kingdom uh, to breach its international obligations. As Noble Lords will know, states take different approaches 
to their different international law obligations. Some states treat international law as automatically forming part of their domestic law, but the United Kingdom and other countries with a similar background, including many Commonwealth countries of co with whom we share so much, uh, has a dualist system in which a treaty ratified by the government does not alter the laws of the state unless and until it is incorporated into national law by domestic legislation. My Lords, I turn to the amendment tabled by my noble friend Lady Lauder, Lady Lawler, I beg noble lady's pardon, uh, Amendment 32. Uh, this legislation provides that a court may only grant interim relief which prevents removal to Rwanda where it is satisfied that there is a real, imminent and foreseeable risk of serious and irreversible harm. As the noble lady put it in her submission, uh, the bill needs tightening. Uh, my Lords, we do not accept the amendment put forward uh, by the noble lady and by my learned friend, uh, <coughs> beg the committee's uh, pardon, by my noble friend, uh, Lord Jackson of Peterborough. But nonetheless, I do invite the committee to consider that in the course of the discussion, the interventions which were made uh, to my noble friends, uh, matters of interest and importance emerged. My Lords, we do hold that law has to command public support, but it should emerge from public consideration, whether through a common law, which does uh, no more than evolve uh, to meet certain essential propositions that bargains should be sustained, that harm should be punished that, uh, and compensated for, or whether it emerges from uh, a representative parliament. Nonetheless, law dare not risk moving too far from the confidence of the public. My Lords, the risk to the maintenance of institutions and public peace uh, of judicial activism and overreach, moving too far away from what the public is prepared to commit, uh, the public is prepared to appreciate, is, I think, the point that my noble friends took. And Baroness Mayer, my noble friend, uh, added to the discussion by uh, stating that while the bill was, in her words, not perfect, I think, and um, that has been something of a late motif running through the uh, submissions which we've heard today and indeed at second reading. Uh, nonetheless, she points out that it is not holding itself out as a silver bullet. It is not perfect because in, <clears throat> if I may quote uh, my noble friend Lord Hannon of Kingsclear, in a dull and sublunary world, very few things are capable uh, of perfection. But it is rather, as the noble lady pointed out, a pragmatic response to an urgent crisis. And I commend uh, my noble friends for their thoughtful analysis uh, of the problems facing other countries uh, grappling with the impact of mass migration and the risks to their own domestic systems uh, which have been identified as flowing therefrom. I do um, say to the House and we'll, uh, say to the committee and we'll say again that, as I think we heard earlier from my, learned, um, my noble friend Lord Sharp of Epsom, other countries are watching keenly the experience uh, of this country in moving legislation of this sort. It is clear that this is a huge problem. I readily accept everything, everything that, my noble, uh, that the noble Lord Lord Coker said from the uh, opposition front bench um, as the last submission uh, to this group uh, about the need to work with our, uh, work with our partners abroad to devote resources to smashing uh, the pernicious grip of criminal gangs on people's lives. But all that, my lords, we are doing now, as I said at second reading. But there is no simple answer to the problem, and that is why this bill is being advanced. Uh, my lords, uh, reverting to um, Amendment 32, um, as I said, the legislation provides that a court may only grant interim relief preventing removal to Rwanda where it is satisfied that there is a real imminent and foreseeable risk of serious and irreversible harm. 
Now, my lords, that is the same threshold which can lead to a temporary suspension of the duty to remove under the Illegal Migration Act. <coughs> These measures, my lords, are necessary to ensure compatibility with the European Convention of Human Rights on Human Rights and to ensure that the grounds by which people can challenge removal are appropriately narrow. This amendment also undermines the safeguards uh, that we see as being necessary to ensure that this bill and the Illegal Migration Act are compatible with the United Kingdom's international obligations. The Illegal Migration Act and this bill include provision for a person subject to removal to a safe third country to make a limited class of suspensive claim on the ground that they would face a real risk of, of serious and irreversible harm were they to be removed. Now, the, serious, uh, the uh, threshold for serious and irreversible harm is a high one, and the harm in question must be both imminent and permanent. This reflects the test applied by the European Court of Human Rights when considering whether to indicate an interim measure under Rule 39, meaning that the United Kingdom courts will have to consider these questions before they progress to Strasbourg, and further under in undermining the case for Strasbourg to intervene. My Lords, I turn to Amendment 80, uh, tabled by the noble Lord, Lord Dodds of Duncairn. Uh, the Northern Ireland position, I think, was also adverted to uh, in the debate on Group 1 by um, the noble lady Baroness Ritchie of Downpatrick. Uh, she's not with us at the moment, but um, I apply my remarks uh, across the House, of course. My Lords, um, the bill will apply in full in Northern Ireland in the same way as it will across the whole United Kingdom. And nothing uh, in the Windsor framework or the Belfast uh, Good Friday Agreement changes that. My Lords, I, I seek to provide uh, reassurance um, to the committee in relation to the constitutionally vital point which the noble Lord Dodds of Dunkirk raises. The government's position is clear that the bill's provisions relate to administrative matters of asylum procedure and as such do not engage Article 2. This is because the bill does not relate to the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union. Rights given effect in domestic law in Northern Ireland and underpinned by EU law before the end of the transition period, or the specific rights contained within the Belfast Good Friday Agreement which concern Northern Ireland's particular circumstances. Any suggestion that the relevant chapter of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement should impinge on this bill implies that the rights in the Belfast Agreement are far more expansive than is the case. The Government will continue to defend the application of this bill on a United Kingdom-wide basis. I offer further reassurance to the Noble Lord uh, and to his colleagues on those benches uh, by the letter uh, written um, by my learned colleague in the other place, uh, the Minister for Immigration, Michael Tomlinson, KC, uh, to Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, uh, of the DUP, dated the 19th of January of 2024, uh, and I quote, as I set out in the debate and at second reading, which was 12th December, the bill applies across the entire United Kingdom, and reading short, neither the withdrawal agreement nor the Windsor framework do anything to cut across that position. I do recognise, however, that concerns raised by your colleagues in Parliament as to whether the bill may have specific interactions in that regard. My Lords, nothing in the Bill affects the required incorporation into the domestic law of the, uh, uh, ECA, EA, uh, the European Convention as required in the agreement, or the ability of domestic courts to consider issues of compatibility. Nor does the Bill alter the capacity of the domestic courts to overrule incompatible legislation of the Northern Ireland Assembly with Convention rights. The Noble Lord referred the Committee's attention to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Government has uh, underlined consistently that the Charter of Fundamental Rights does not form part of the domestic law anywhere in the UK, including in Northern Ireland. It's a matter of fact that the 2005 procedures... Do and very grateful to the Minister. Um, just so that I can be clear, I referred to the provision of the Procedures Directive which requires a case-by-case -case, uh, decision as to whether a third country is safe. And I contrasted that with Section 2.1 of the Bill, Clause 2.1 of the Bill, which says every decision-maker must conclusively treat the Republic of Rwanda as a safe country. Just so that I can be clear, is um, the Minister saying 
uh, that there is no difference between those provisions, or is he accepting that there has been a diminution of rights, rights under the procedures directive, and saying that it doesn't matter? And if that's the case, could he just explain why it doesn't matter? I don't wish to um, enter into a matter which lies out with my own department uh, and my own sphere of responsibility uh, at this hour, and with the noble Lord's permission, uh, we shall write. My Lords, having offered those reassurances to the um, Unionist benches, uh, I offer this conclusion. We have devised a solution that is innovative, is within the framework of international law. It is a long-term solution that addresses the concerns set out in the Supreme Court judgment and ensures that this policy can go ahead, paving the way, as I said earlier, for other countries to look at similar solutions. And I would invite my noble friend to withdraw his amendment. My Lords, just two points. Firstly, I'm extremely grateful to the support that I've received from Lord, noble Lord, Lord Coker, but most especially from the Baroness Cherokee We do, in fact, share many of the concerns about this bill. Secondly, I think I said enough for tonight, and I beg leave to withdraw. Is your Lordship's pleasure that Amendment 9 be withdrawn? Amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendments 10, 11 and 12, Lord German, Lord Scriven, not moved. Amendment 13, Viscount Hailsham, not moved. Amendment 14, not moved. The question is, Clause 1, stand part of the Bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Content. Or to not content for contents, have it. After Clause 1, Amendment 15, Lord Anderson of Ipswich, not moved. And Amendment 16, not moved. In Clause 2, Amendment 17, Lord Scriven, not moved. My Lords, I beg to move that the House be resumed. The question is that the House be resumed. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Content. Contrary, not content, for contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. That the House do now adjourn. House of Lords sound. 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 House of Lords sound.